Hey everyone. Welcome back to another video. Here's part 2 of what if Naruto was Madara's grandson. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons. I really wouldn't be able to make any of these videos without your immense support. As always, the full story is already out over on Patreon for you guys along with a couple other stories as well. Anyways, enjoy the video. Chapter 7, Love and War. Team 7 calmly proceed through the academy halls at a sedate pace with Sasuke at the lead. Being told by their sensei that they'd need to hold themselves back and help out the weaker Janan in their age group put a bit of a dampener on their spirits. Sakura felt internally disappointed as well. Sakura had grown increasingly confident since being taken under Kakashi's wing, and she hadn't hesitated to join her teammates in participating in the exam. When Naruto had suggested that they set some new records, she was in full agreement and ready for any opportunity that might come their way. Their sensei had been sympathetic. He ultimately spent a good amount of time explaining that the majority of Janan from their graduating class were clan heirs with little ambition for growing stronger at present, but are still important to the village as a whole due to their significant potential in clan-related haidenjutsu. The more people performing haidenjutsu, the more effective their teams would be in the grand scheme of the village. Weak they may be, but still stronger than the average Janan team, and that made all the difference. Sasuke had rightly been of the mind that the Chonin exams are a competition. A crucible to determine who is fit to become a Chonin and that the other teams should damn well earn their right to compete instead of expecting assistance from those who put the hard work in to succeed. Naruto is a bit more in tune with the big picture, and cools Sasuke off with an acknowledgement that Team 7 are freaks of nature and clearly more powerful than anyone else Konoha has to offer in the way of Janan. He follows it up with an agreement that the clan heir should not be competing if they require help, but doesn't reiterate Kakashi's point of them having strong potential. He instead insists that maybe they didn't have all the information, and perhaps their parents were pushing for them to compete in order to wise them up to the brutal reality of Shinobi that they hadn't seen in an entire six months of being Janan. The pink-haired girl had been thoughtful at that. Maybe it isn't the fault of the clans or even the Janan, but of their teachers instead. Sakura didn't know where they would be without Kakashi-sensei, but maybe she would see if they met their fellow graduates. Who else could claim having the legendary copy Nin as their teacher, after all? You there. Please wait. A boyish voice speaks to Sasuke as they pass more and more loitering Janan. Sakura snaps out of her thoughts and sees another Konoha team. One of the boys wore a green jumpsuit and had the thickest eyebrows she'd ever seen. The boy next to him looked comparatively less eccentric but held the characteristic pale eyes of the Hyuga clan. An exasperated looking girl stood behind them. She nearly grins when Sasuke starts to walk slightly faster. He is clearly trying to ignore the weird green guy and is seemingly giving the impression that the stranger must be talking to someone else. After six months, she has developed an understanding that there are very few people that Sasuke is willing to stop for in the street and it's obvious that he's tired of sycophants talking him up and bullies attempting to establish a misplaced and unearned sense of superiority. Bowl cut frowns and steps in front of Sasuke. Sasuke-san. I the boy is cut off when Naruto steps up and lightly pushes him out of the way. Uchiha-sama will not be taking questions at this time. You may direct inquiries to his agent, Hatake Kakashi. Move along, young man. Sakura can't help the snicker that escapes her. Just leave them alone, Lee. The girl with her hair done in buns says with a sigh. Don't bait, Naruto. Let's just get on with it. Sasuke is in no mood to play around with strangers. The Hayuga boy steps in this time. He seems to be more mild-mannered than Lee. My apologies for my teammate, he can be quite eccentric. I am Hayuga Neji. The one in green is Rock Lee, and she's Ten Ten. Yo. Ten Ten gives a jaunty wave. Nice to meet you. Sakura's eyes flitter to Naruto, and she sees a frown under his bangs at the presence of the Hayuga. Neji continues like he hasn't noticed. What Lee was trying to get at is, as fellow Konoha Janan, it would be nice to watch each other's backs throughout the exam. There are more participants than ever from other nations, and it would be wise to ally in case they attempt to team up against us as they have done in the past. Sakura and Sasuke immediately turn to Naruto, whose serious gaze is unsettling to the other Janan. His clan is scared that the Kumagakura Janan are going to make another attempt on the Byakugan. Naruto translates stoically. And he seems clued in as to why I might want to team up as well. Neji looks slightly sheepish at the accurate guess. Well, that's one way to put it. But yes, the Hyuga clan has expressed concern that unscrupulous factions that are competing this time won't be able to behave themselves. I was also told of the extensive criminal history of those nations against the Uzumaki clan. Uzumaki clan? 
Sakura mouthed to Sasuke, who seemed equally unsure. You don't seem as stuck up as the other Hayuga. Sasuke comments instead. Sakura feels that this particular assessment is true, there are too many snobby Hayuga in the village. Hinata not included. The influence of my father, I assure you. Neji's smile is kind and disarming. It clearly takes no effect on Naruto. He remains stern and focused. Well. I don't see why not? Sakura looks up at Naruto, deferring to him as the de facto leader of the team. No. Naruto refuses. Neji, Lee and Tenten all blink. As do Sakura and Sasuke. No? Naruto turns on his foot and heads in the direction they're meant to meet Kakashi. His teammates are puzzled but make no fuss for now. Lee springs in front of Naruto, stopping him from walking again. I dislike it when geniuses underestimate others. Lee states fiercely. Presumptuous of you to believe that we are underestimating you. Naruto looks down at Lee, who is a bit shorter than he is. Then why do you protest an alliance? Do you somehow believe that we would hold you back? Naruto remains cool-headed as usual when dealing with people like this. Don't put words in my mouth. We aren't obligated to give you an answer, either. Sakura admires Naruto's confidence. This Lee is huge for a Janan, and the green spandex makes his muscles stand out even more. But Naruto is brave and decisive, and it doesn't hurt that Naruto is taller and just as built under the loose shirts he usually wears. She knows that Naruto would probably be more cooperative if Lee hadn't annoyed him, but giving the situation even a second thought made her understand that their secondary task in the exam should be kept on the down low. If more people know, it's more likely that the information would spread around. And information being passed around in a village full of foreign diplomats and competing shinobi about the weakness of the current generation of valued clan heirs would be very, very bad. Let's just go. Sasuke suggests tactfully, but the annoyance at the current situation combined with their orders had bled into his voice. Lee scowls at him, and Sakura's shoulders stiffen. From experience, that look meant impending attack. Without warning, Lee drops low to the floor and sends a blurring kick at Sasuke's stomach. Before it connects, another figure in green catches the kick in his hand and punches Lee hard enough to send him tumbling down the hallway. Lee. The newcomer thunders at the nuisance Janan. Guy sensei Ten Ten looks rather relieved. Guy turns to Team 7 and in great contrast to his demeanor when stopping Lee, smiles brightly and offers them a thumbs up. Kakashi's Janan. Guy booms in joy, making Sakura reel back at the volume. It's wonderful to know that my eternal rival has taught such disciplined students. Hi. Sakura replies weakly, weirded out by how similar the sensei is to his student, along with the creepy eyebrows. Guy doesn't notice and instead hurries them along. I must exercise my own discipline on my misbehaving Janan. You must hurry along. Kakashi is waiting for you. And without another word, he storms down the hall and picks up Lee. Neji and Tenten chase after without a glance back at Team 7. What the hell? Is all Sakura can say. They meet with Kakashi but a minute later, who gives them the spiel about being unable to compete if even one of them didn't show. He gives them unwanted pats on their heads and reminds them of their standing orders to help the other Janan. They each receive a slip of paper with which seat they'll be required to sit in and sends them on their way. He just smiles when Naruto asks if they could sabotage the clan heirs to prevent them from competing at all. Naruto leads his team into the examination room. He can feel several powerful chakra sources inside. It makes him glad to know that his holding out on revealing his abilities would be rewarded with strong opponents going forward. No Chaonin exam is complete without some international competition. He opens the door and as he expected, there are dozens upon dozens of Janan, ages varying greatly though most of them appear to be barely older than he is. They enter and take in their surroundings. Naruto spots the Konoha Janan their age loitering at the back of the room with the Hokaye's assistant. Slowly, all eyes in the room turn towards Team 7. Naruto takes note of the recognition on their faces, as if somehow these people that he'd never seen before knew of not only him, but Sasuke and Sakura too. Their killing intent rolls in on them. Predictably, it takes no effect on him. It is tremendous in only how pathetic their combined effort to intimidate them is. But Sakura trembles beside him. Her chakra is disturbed and she is frightened by the psychological assault. Sasuke is unnerved but handles it better than their teammate does. Killing intent is essentially a jutsu. It affects humans on the base level of fear. It is an animalistic technique to weaken the prey of its user. By expressing their chakra into the environment or directly at a person instead of using it to take control and place them in genjutsu, it affects its victim by overloading their senses. 
Just as one might see a dangerous beast or hear its roar, killing intent abuses its victim's desire for survival. If they cannot conquer their fear, they will remain rooted and vulnerable. If they overcome their fear, they live on stronger than ever. But being the victim of the combined killing intent of many more experienced Janan is not fair play, and it makes Naruto angry that Sakura is the undeserving victim of an attack like this. She hasn't done anything that might warrant a cowardly assault. One or two teams she could probably handle, being around a walking pool of unnaturally strong chakra like him would probably desensitize her to it over time, but this many is clearly too much for her. Kakashi, genius that he is, can do the opposite of killing intent and inspire the people around him with bravery or other positive emotions. He sees their gleeful faces. He feels rage at the joy they have at making his team suffer. Naruto doesn't know how to do what Kakashi can do but he doesn't need to. These children have clearly never met an animal with teeth sharper than all of theirs united. Yugito sees the pink-haired girl crack first and joins in the group project with a bit of her own killing intent. This is not a good idea. Do not provoke that boy. Chunin exams our team missions, if one of them leaves then we won't have to deal with the other two. Yugito tries to reason with her by Juu. It scares her that this Uzumaki Naruto is completely unaffected by all of it. But if they can make the girl back out. Naruto narrows his eyes at all of them. Yugito sees the floorboards beneath his feet crack first. A near invisible explosion of chakra blasts out of him and washes over the entirety of the room. She swallows thickly when she realizes that the floor broke from just releasing his chakra and that the retaliation hasn't actually hit her senses yet. Then. She feels fear. She feels her eyes strain and blur. She feels raw hatred rake across her skin. She feels her lungs seize and fail to take in air. Yugito breaks out in a cold sweat and any effort she was using to expel the killing intent instead goes instead to regaining control over her body. I warned you, Yugito. Karen doesn't even know how to use killing intent, but sure can sure as hell sense it being used. She doesn't even attempt to resonate her chakra with the vile attempt at getting this team to quit. The monster Janan gives back far more than everyone else gives him. She feels the chakra wash over her, but it is careful around her. Cautious, and prodding her skin tentatively as if to test that she's real. She raises her head when she realizes that she alone is unaffected by the display of intimidating power. Looking around, she sees that every other person in the room save for the creep imposter from Otto and the gourd guy from Suna are being affected intensely. The Otto hag pokes her tongue out and gives a shiver-inducing flick, and gourd guy looks about ready to froth at the mouth. Figures that two unstable freaks wouldn't sense imminent danger. Many of them are shaking violently. Some even have tears streaming out of clenched eyes and though the room is mostly silent, there are noises of strain coming from throats as they clearly struggle to breath. Why aren't you hurting me? Karen wants to ask when she looks at the monster. She sees him staring back at her. Oh dear. Before she can hyperventilate at the thought of catching his attention, a huge plume of smoke erupts at the front of the room. A giant scarred guy and a number of other ranked Konoha shinobi stand at the ready behind him. The scarred guy puts a hand on Naruto's shoulder and in an instant, the killing intent vanishes. Karen breathes a sigh of relief. Naruto smirks openly when he feels the proctor reach out to him. He cuts the stream of the most vile emotions he can muster and turns to the man. Funny how you step in now. Where were you a moment ago when my teammate was being assaulted by this foreign trash? The proctor looks down at him unnamest. I don't want my exam ruined before it even starts. Now find your seat. He gives a weak explanation for his choice. HMN. I don't see how that's my problem. Maybe I'll give them a little more? Thin out the weakling so that you don't have to. Naruto's voice carries through the silence and he is happy to note that every other Janan in the room recoils at the suggestion. If you do, I will disqualify you. Now take your seat Janan. Come on, Naruto. Sakura tugs him arm nervously, and at least leads him into the gap between desks before he can indulge in another psychotic urge. You're gonna rip my arm off. Naruto lies in an almost playful way. Sakura shakes her head at him and whispers before they part ways. Thanks, Naruto. See you when we finish this stage. Naruto gives her a nod. Sasuke looks like he wants to say something to him, and the muscles around his eyes give away that he isn't going to take no for an answer if he does ask. But since they're short on time, Sasuke just swallows the bitter pill and looks as though he has resolved to ask later. Sasuke gives him a reluctant nod and separates as well. Naruto passes aisle after aisle and feels several peculiar chakra types on the way to his seat. Their chakra is so wildly different from normal humans that it is practically a broadcast to say look at me. 
the two that stand out the most must be Jinchuriki. How exciting! It's almost enough to get his blood pumping at the thought of fighting and defeating a Jinchuriki for the first public display of his true power. They would be useful tools in springing him up into the role of international deterrent. But even more interesting to him are the two seemingly human sources of immensely strong chakra in the room. One of them is unlike any other human being. It pings at him as though it is normal, but normal chakra doesn't grow that powerful without extreme effort or tampering of the body. This Kuzi Janan has a foul tinge to her chakra, and it is a messy conglomerate of several weaker chakra types that seem to serve symbiotically to the host chakra, so his bet is on the latter reason. And of course. The girl with red hair. He knows that kind of chakra from Madara's memories. She is Uzumaki. His family. Naruto resolves to poach her at the first possible opportunity. He'll take on all of Kuzo alone if he has to. They will not keep you from me. Naruto is rather proud of his solution to the don't get caught cheating exam. He does eventually realize that the exam can be beaten without so much as answering a single question but that felt. Weak. Escaping from participating due to a technicality didn't seem like it was in the spirit of the exam. True, this stage isn't about cheating or espionage. It is about nerve and how well the Janan could perform under pressure. The fact of the matter is, Team 7 would not break from an exam like this, and it wouldn't be rewarding to him if he just sat still for an hour waiting to win. But Naruto didn't have access to the tool that he would normally use, the Sharingan. He fully acknowledges that he isn't a reconnaissance-type shinobi. What would happen the day that he does need to pull some sly trick that the Sharingan couldn't do? Unlikely, but Naruto feels that the challenge of cheating without getting caught might give him a moment of inspiration that could help him in the future. He invents a ninjutsu on the spot. He fails several times trying to get it to work, but he isn't caught doing it once. Sogo Kawarimi no Jutsu Mutual Substitution Technique The act of replacing an object with another in an altered form of the academy taught Kawarimi no Jutsu. Instead of using himself as the replacer, he would use two separate objects. After training in the use of his Kongo Fusa, he has gained better chakra control. The increased control allows him to reach out to another object and imprint it with his chakra, the same way one would to a log to substitute themselves with. The chakra is very thin and invisible to non-dojutsu wielders, and it is functionally the same as using genjutsu. He imprints his own paper and tries to swap it with another piece. Small as the paper is, the jutsu is significantly harder to use than the academy jutsu for the fact alone that he only just made it and has never practiced with it. Naruto does get it down eventually and swaps his paper with an indignant Rock Lee, who is seated several rows in front of him. The look on the annoying Janan's face when he sees the blank paper with only a poorly drawn rendition of Naruto's face on it, truly made his day. An explosive introduction from the next proctor sends all of the remaining Janan to the next stage of the exam. And so Team 7 finds itself waiting at the sign-in area for access to the 44th training ground, the Forest of Death. It's truly a sight to see. The entire forest is dark, blanketed with the foliage of massive trees. Wild birds sat on the surrounding chain-link fence, and the distinct noise of predatory animals from within could occasionally be heard. Pathetic. Naruto states openly but simply when all of the other Janan give his team a wide berth. Naruto, Sasuke starts, and Naruto tries not to sigh at an impending interrogation. He instead goes for his immediate tactic when Sasuke is being annoying by being equally annoying. Wondering how I beat that test? Naruto's lips curl into a mocking rendition of smugness, as though he is some manga villain ready to spill the beans on his master plan. No. Sasuke shuts it down and looks too focused to jest with him. Rather boring to Naruto, who wants to maintain the good mood he's in for finally getting closer to a stage where he'd be able to use his Keke Genkai. Plus the happy feeling he had at inventing and using his own ninjutsu to beat the written test. Naruto just raises his brow and waves his hand in a get on with it gesture. I want to know about the Uzumaki clan. Damn it. Naruto curses that idiot Hayuga for giving everyone a clue to chase about him. Sakura is clearly interested too after being reminded of it but saving him from the trouble is the unusual Janan from Kusagakur. Not his Uzumaki, but the one with the messy chakra. He can't tell it's a male or a female. Oh my! The Uzumaki clan? The mystery Janan asks in a rhetorical way. It approaches them fearlessly, which alone is enough to make Naruto suspicious. Don't butt in. Sasuke dismisses the wanderer. Kukaku, so cold Konoha-kun. Kuza Nin chuckles sickly. I am something of a historian, I cannot help but feel attracted to discussing a clan as legendary as the Uzumaki. It's rude to intrude, especially when you haven't introduced yourself. 
maybe this Kuzan Nin would be useful in distracting Sasuke long enough until the exam started. Oh, I'm sure that won't matter in the forest. The perpetual smile doesn't fade from, his, face. HN. Sasuke grunts with a sneer. If you don't have anything useful to say, then leave. The Kuzan Nin chuckles again, completely ignoring the rude tone Sasuke had taken. I am rather surprised that you need to ask about the Uzumaki. After all, they were a key component in the creation of Konoha. It is said that their strength was matched only by the Uchiha and Senju in that time. The Uzumaki pioneered Fuenjutsu as a shinobi art. Even your Yondaime Hokage used Uzumaki knowledge, and became feared as the yellow flash all across the world. A most valuable ally. But even they were not immune to tragedy. All of their mythical strong chakra was not enough to stop them from being slaughtered. Naruto narrows his eyes at the wording used. It made that long week of fighting that the Uzumaki went through sound like a quiet death in the night. A kunai is slung through the air and slices the tag off the Kuzan Nin sacked. The Kuzan Nin doesn't so much as flinch, and instead smiles a little wider. Mitarashi Anko, the proctor for this stage of the exam, looks none too pleased with being ignored in spite of the grin on her face. I think you'd better go back to your team, Kuzachan. Anko's smile is disturbingly similar to the subject of her torment. Kukaku, of course Proctor San. The Janan gives her an unsatisfactory response and leaves as requested. What a creep. Sakura shivers when the Kuzan Nin is out of hearing range. Naruto nods and his stony expression doesn't change. Gather round, idiot Janan. Anko summons them with the same fantastic attitude she had while introducing herself. Team 7 does so while huddling closely giving the illusion that they're the kind of team that keeps things to themselves. Mysterious enemies are more dangerous opponents when fighting at this level, so it is a tactical deterrent they use pre-exam stage that might come in useful if they come across other Konoha teams in need of assistance. After Naruto's display in the previous stage, enemy teams may be convinced to leave by their presence alone. Anko explains the rules briefly, and several people seem upset with the idea that they could be in there for five days. Line up. Each team will enter the tent and be given a scroll and a number for which gate they're starting at. Naruto leads his team into the tent and they are given the heaven scroll. You're making us run a marathon to get to our gate? Naruto's lip twitches irritably. Punishment for nearly spoiling my senpai's test two hours ago. Anko doesn't even hide her glee at Janan's suffrage. Anything else, stupid Janan? Does your mother let you go out dressed like that? Not that I'm complaining. Team 7 is forced to flee from a hailstorm of kunai and sprint to their gate. The opening of the gates is synchronized via stopwatch. As soon as the padlock dropped, they dashed into the darkness of the forest. One day passes and Team 7 is taking a leisurely approach to this stage. They encounter some of the weaker teams, but they make no effort to kill them. Naruto demands only their scrolls in exchange for their lives. So they had obtained three heaven scrolls. The one they started with and the two they'd collected within the first day. We're developing quite the collection. Sasuke wears a sardonic smile. I sure hope we only get more heaven scrolls. Don't jinx us. Knowing our luck, that might just be what we get. Sakura doesn't like the idea of an impending procrastination to obtain their required scroll. But if we did get all of the heaven scrolls. A might of mischief in Naruto's voice told Sakura that in any other occasion, he'd be glad to completely ruin the exam. Then no one would pass. Anyway, listen. Naruto's voice changes to something more serious, and it gains the interest of his teammates. There's this girl, a redhead who's wearing glasses. She's part of the other Kusagakar team. I'm abducting her. A few seconds of confused silence passes. What? Sakura shrieks at him. What the hell would you need to abduct someone for? She's an Uzumaki. I'm certain of it. Naruto appears dead serious. I'll grab her and keep her from Kusagakor by any means necessary. You know damn well it's not that easy. Sasuke retorts sharply. You can't just take a foreign kunoichi. Look what happened with Kumo the last time they tried, it'll be an international disaster for Konoha. Family or not, you can't just make rogue efforts for the sake of bolstering your clan. You could be arrested for sabotaging Konoha, or worse. Naruto is inwardly disturbed about Sasuke's outlook on the situation. Surely he of all people would understand his desire to unite with his clanmate, and protect her from these scum foreigners? I damn well can take her when she's my family. Naruto's brow furrows deeply in anger, and it makes Sakura visibly nervous. Sasuke glares right back at Naruto. Do you even understand what you're saying, you imbecile? I understand perfectly. 
Konoha has a duty and obligation to save Uzumaki refugees, and I'm going to make sure that agreement and alliance is still being honored. We could go to war with Kusagakur. Innocence Konoha Shinobi could die at the hands of Kuza for just one girl. Naruto's chakra explodes out of him and cracks the branch they're standing on, making Sakura reel back in fright at his anger. Then I will slaughter those pigs myself. I'll kill anyone who dares to defy me. Sasuke grabs Naruto's shirt aggressively and looks him in the eyes. My brother murdered my clan to get what he wanted. An action like this will put innocent people on the line, are you willing to have that on your conscience Urk? Sasuke is cut off by Naruto picking him up by his neck in one hand, strangling Sasuke. Do not compare me to a traitor that murdered his family and betrayed his village. Naruto snarls viciously. My decision to save that girl does not just satisfy my desire to protect her, but it fulfills the agreement between the Uzumaki clan and Konoha, and strengthens Konoha by increasing the population of one its premier clans and bloodlines. Her home is with her family, not in an enemy nation where she will be only of use in aiding the destruction of Konoha Shinobi. Naruto throws Sasuke backhandedly into the trunk of the giant tree, right next to Sakura. Konoha has an obligation. What makes you think Sasuke coughs weakly? That she even wants to be saved? What makes you think Konoha won't just cut you loose? You might be strong Naruto, but you overestimate your value to this village. If the higher-ups think you're not worth the trouble, then you'll be all alone against the whole village. Sometimes people don't know what's best for them, and as the strongest it is my right to decide it. I am selfish enough to pursue my desires, and I will take on the whole world if I have to in order to get what I want. You're mad. Sasuke says in utter disbelief, while Sakura tends to him at his side. They're both wide-eyed at the sheer selfishness and arrogance Naruto is displaying. Only from the perspective of a weakling, Naruto spat out. You disappoint me. You of all people should understand me right now. Sasuke Sharingan whirls and his face shows hatred at Naruto. Naruto takes a few deep breaths while Sasuke isn't speaking and tries to calm down. Then, he senses a huge influx of futon chakra. He turns to see branches and the canopy of trees part rapidly by near invisible force, but they are blasted apart and the moss growing on the tree bark rips off, signifying the approach of a jutsu too fast and powerful to conventionally counter. Get down! The jutsu slams directly onto their branch and shakes it so violently that it cracks and falls. Team 7 regain their senses and leap from the falling branch to the next. Naruto looks in the direction the jutsu came from and sees only the controlled path of destruction. He uses his mind's eye of the Kagura to sense the impending arrival of the Kuzijinan that spoke to them yesterday. He then senses the arrival of several more chakra types, distinctly non-human. His sharp eyes detect plumes of smoke revealed by the light from the shaking leaf canopy. Summon animals. Naruto realizes, a bit stunned. How could this person have something as rare as a summon contract? These creatures are far too quick. He needed to act fast. This Kuza Nin is clearly not a Janan, but an imposter. Naruto focuses as much chakra into his lungs as possible and weaves as few signs as possible to get the job done quickly. Katen, Goka Mesitsu. A violent flamethrower is breathed out of his mouth. The jutsu is designed to expand on impact, and travels an extraordinary distance to the trees he felt the summons nearing. It crashes into a massive trunk and burns away at its middle so quickly that it falls not long after. The burning tree dives and lands on the ground with a deafening crack, and falling from the tree is a half-cremated snake so massive that Naruto realizes that they are dealing with someone even he cannot defeat right now without attracting the attention of a traitor more foul than any other. We have to run. Naruto orders quickly, before half a dozen more snakes wrap around and climb the tree that they're standing on. Sakura flurries through signs to try and distract the snakes, but they are massive enough to be confident that any object she tries to redirect them with would just be smashed through. Naruto curses and directs chakra to his back and lungs simultaneously. Two dense light blue chains sprout from under his hair. They are gilded with a thin veneer of gold chakra, and their tips sported pointed dragon heads with glowing gold eyes. They spear into the head of a snake each. The snakes are effectively nailed to the tree before they can strike. The adamantine sealing chains function as negation or conduit of fuinjutsu instead of ninjutsu, so it dispels the two summons without more effort required. Sasuke wildly fires off his Hosenka no Jutsu and Naruto tries Ryu and Hoka. The cunning snakes learn from the failure of the previous two and travel on the underside of the branch using chakra, not unlike the tree walking exercise. Naruto recalls his chains back into his body. Go. Now. They leap from branch to branch with as much speed as they can. 
the tree they leap to already has a snake climbing up it and meets them before they can run again. Naruto sends another chain with blinding speed at the head of the snake from his palm, but just as it is about to connect, a human hand reaches out of the snake's mouth and grabs the chain behind its dragon head. A familiar figure climbs out of the mouth of the snake, covered in slime. There is only one shinobi with that kind of affinity to snakes. Kukaku, Naruto-kun. I see that your Uzumaki blood runs true. The Kuzan Nin flicks its long tongue in disgusting pleasure. Orochimaru. Naruto tries to retract his chain back into his body. The snake Sanin whips the chain and yanks Naruto off the edge of the tree branch. He then lets go of it before Naruto is pulled towards him. Futan, Daitapa. Orochimaru seal Leslie blasts Naruto with wine the same strength as the first assault. Naruto barely has a second to breath before it slams into him, and his chains aren't quick enough to latch onto something. With no solid ground to stick to, Naruto is sent flying away and deep into the darkness of the forest. Now Orochimaru tastes the fear exuded by Sasuke and Sakura on his tongue. They are rooted to the spot in terror. Where was I? Kukaku. Naruto lands too far from the battle to be effective. He slams into a tree with such velocity that he can't help but wheeze in pain. Nothing is broken but his whole back is going to be bruised. He shakes it off as best he can and deftly drops to the forest floor. He tries his best to conceal his chakra signature to attempt a surprise rescue of his teammates. Six giant snakes have caught his scent however, and are completely unaware of his disguised chakra. I can't beat these without more power. Naruto feels disgusted in himself for his inability to combat these summons. He has no choice. He can't save Sasuke and Sakura in an acceptable time frame if he doesn't use his full power. Any delay will jeopardize their lives. Naruto activates his Sharingan and activates a jutsu with his left eye. Amaterasu. He lets the black flames disintegrate their target, and controls another snake to eat the other. Naruto frees his chakra from the stranglehold he has kept on it and unleashes it in full force. Orochimaru retracts his fangs from the screaming Uchiha. A parting gift. He smiles evilly at the quivering pink-haired girl. Sasuke grips his neck helplessly and cries out in agony. Sakura sobs and throws anything sharp in her pouch. Leave us alone. Of course, my dear. Orochimaru soothes. He will seek me out of his own accord. Now, I really must be going. Do take care of Sasuke-kun for me, won't you? If you don't, well. Things may end badly for you. As he gave his message, a hideous snake that exceeded the size of all the others before it appeared around the tree. It has zipped up with terrifying speed and left Sakura believing her end is imminent. The monstrous snake opened its maw, and it looked to Sakura that it is about to strike. But there is no snapping motion to end her life. Inside the mouth of the summon. Is Naruto. What? Orochimaru is uncharacteristically stunned. Naruto is on a tiger sign when he is revealed. Katan, Goryuka no Jutsu. A massive dragon head erupts from Naruto's mouth. It rapidly expands and hits the branch Orochimaru is on with such concussive, burning force that it virtually disintegrates. Orochimaru is quick enough to leap away with unnatural agility, but the surprise attack has forced him to abandon his taunting. The remains of the branch fall far to the forest floor and landed with a deafening thump. A child using another jutsu like that? Orochimaru narrows his eyes. That jutsu was near the size of the head of that snake by the time it hit its mark. And he could sense a genjutsu on the snake, keeping it in line. The boy's eyes were shut, possible from the strain of controlling such a creature. Cat and Naruto's chakra is already set, it needs no further seals to send another jutsu. Goryuka no jutsu. Again? Orochimaru was intrigued. Placing a summon animal under genjutsu and then firing another B-rank jutsu was far too unusual for a young boy. Perhaps this boy's strength would be enough to make Sasuke crave more power. Perhaps his manipulation needed less effort than he thought. Orochimaru leaps to a higher branch before the Katan can turn him into ashes. Most impressive, Naruto-kun, Orochimaru hissed, mouth forming a sick smile around his long tongue. I see that Sasuke-kun has much to live up to if he wants to use you as his stepping stone. Perhaps I'll test you a little more, hmm? I am always in need of strong disciples. Die, filth. A light blue ribcage manifests around Naruto and he leaps out of the snake's mouth. He sends the snake to devour Orochimaru while large skeletal hands pick up Sasuke and Sakura in each. Naruto leaps away and focuses his real hands into a ram sign. An intriguing jutsu. Orochimaru is forced to tend to his wayward summon and defeats it with an adjustable length sword from his mouth. 
he chases Naruto and swings his elongated blade at the skeletal construct. Sogo Kawarimi no Jutsu. Kim 7 vanishes, and is replaced by a single cage bunshine of Naruto. The sword of Kusanagi bisects the clone and it dispels instantly. Orochimaru smiles. A most interesting child you are, Naruto-kun. Naruto cuts all flow to the Sharingan and as Susano fades away. He instead throws up a sphere of chains around the team. A thin translucent barrier forms between them. The chains and barrier take on the flow of what chakra is he currently emitting, and so the sphere hides their chakra signatures from enemy teams and more importantly, Orochimaru. The Sanin is out of sensory range, meaning that they're safe for now. But the noise coming from Sasuke escapes his rudimentary barrier. He wraps a kunai hilt with the sleeve of his shirt and puts it into Sasuke's mouth to try and muffle the noise. Sasuke bites down on it and after a few minutes, passes out. Sakura is barely lucid and sobbing loudly. Sakura, listen to me. Naruto puts his hands on the sides of her face and makes her look at him through her hyperventilating. She can't even respond verbally but her weak and shaky nod gives Naruto hope that he'll be able to get her to focus. I need you to diagnose Sasuke with medical ninjutsu. Figure out why he's hurt. Focus on him. With a weak nod, she shakily weaves slow signs and sprouts misty green chakra in her palms. He hands roll over Sasuke's head, bite wound and some kind of junjutsu on his shoulder. I don't know. She is breathing heavily and starting to panic. I don't know what's wrong with him. Naruto tries to calm her down, but she drops her head into the crook of his shoulder and cries silently into it. That's a start at least. Naruto maintains the barrier for a full day. But even his monstrous reserves began to wane. Damn it. Naruto curses as the barrier begins to fizzle. He retracts the chains to conserve what remains of his chakra. The mutual substitution he'd performed with his clone had chewed up a massive amount of his stamina and chakra. The range at which he'd done it did not make it easier. The Mengekyu Sharingan had strained him more, and the adamantine sealing chains are not some passive pretty light show either. Every link is a jutsu that consumes chakra to maintain. The gel food rations he'd been eating weren't enough to help him regain chakra at the same rate he was using it. At least Sasuke, in his unconscious state, is still instinctively able to swallow them when placed in his mouth. Naruto hoped the gel mixture would help to hydrate Sasuke but he knew they'd need to find water soon. The fever he is developing can only be staved off briefly by Sakura, and she doesn't have anywhere near the amount of chakra needed to prevent Sasuke from falling ill. He hadn't slept since the attack. But Sakura has recovered mentally and offers to keep watch. Sleep, Naruto. Sakura asks of him. Naruto gazes into her green eyes with his own grayish ones. He's liking the idea of sleep more than ever. Wake me when you need me. Naruto's head drops into her lap. Sakura brushes his bangs out of his face and places him down gently with a fond promise on her lips. I will. Naruto wakes to the sound of pain screaming. He jolts up and sees Sasuke pulling on the arms of an auto Janan. Sakura is trying to convince him to calm down. No wonder she hadn't tried to wake him up. She's asking about what the hell these guys have to do with Orochimaru. A connection? Sasuke is clearly delirious. There is a black flame pattern on Sasuke's body. And his chakra is far stronger than before. Did that joie increase his strength? Sasuke pulls the auto Janan's arms out of their shoulder sockets, leading to more helpless screaming. We give up. The other male Janan on their team surrenders. Please, take our scroll and we'll leave in peace. It's an earth scroll, which is nice. Sasuke only lost one of their heaven scrolls trying to get Orochimaru off their back. Naruto kept the other two in his pouch, so they have at least one complete set. The auto Janan all flee and Naruto swipes the scroll up off the dirt. Guess we can count ourselves lucky with this one. Naruto says mostly to himself, appreciating the karma at being put against someone like Orochimaru and being rewarded with what they needed to advance. Sakura, are you alright? Naruto looks at the disturbed and tired girl. He can sense some vulture Janan around them, although they appear to be refraining from interacting with them. Before Sakura can answer him, Sasuke glares him down with his Sharingan. The black pattern on his skin whirls and covers more of his body and then Sasuke attacks him. Naruto is forced to cartwheel backwards to avoid a furious flurry of kicks and punches at a speed that Sasuke had never been capable of previously. He is surprised, but his Uzumaki blood has helped him recover enough to avoid even these enhanced strikes. What the hell is wrong with you? Naruto begins to meet each rough blow. You are what's wrong with me. Sasuke's bitterness is evident in his violent effort to beat him. 
You hide your strength from us, your teammates, and then you admit that you're willing to destroy innocent lives just to get what you want. Your entire existence is a lie, just like my fucking brother. It takes some more agile dodging to get Sasuke at a distance that he might be able to reason with him. Now is not the time for an argument like this. Look what just happened with Orochimaru. We are surrounded by enemies in this forest, if you have something to say then save it for later when we're safe. Sasuke-kun, please listen to him. Sakura pleads fearfully. But Sasuke doesn't listen and continues his assault. That mark, it's not just increasing his power. It must be affecting his mind. Naruto assesses Sasuke's behavior. The other boy is usually just willing to let it go, but that buried frustration is bubbling out with this dark chakra. Naruto uses all of his speed to vanish from Sasuke's Sharingan enhanced vision and appear behind him. He creates a chain, and its head opens up and grabs Sasuke's shoulder from behind. The curse pattern visibly falters when the chain comes into contact with his skin. One clearly isn't enough but now that he knows the chain works on the Junjutsu, he sends more spike chains that wrap around Sasuke from head to toe. Sasuke struggles, but his Sharingan fades into the normal coal black of his eyes and the curse mark recedes entirely back into the source point. He passes out, and Naruto keeps the first chain locked onto the curse mark just in case while he returns the remainder back into his body. What a mess. Naruto puts Sasuke down under the branch they'd hidden in. Sakura, get some sleep. K. Okay. Sakura agrees and collapses immediately, trusting in Naruto more than in herself. You lot hiding in the bushes. If you're not here to give me help, then leave. Naruto calls out teams 9 and 10. More chains spike out of him and create a barrier sphere around team 7. Rock Lee jumps down from the branch he'd been spying on. Neji and Ten Ten follow behind him. Team 10 approaches much more cautiously and maintains a firm distance between them and everyone else. Despite Ino's worry for the condition of Sasuke, she makes no move to get closer and instead quivers pathetically on the spot. What is this? Neji looks at the barrier using his Byakugan. A keke genkai. Naruto gets straight to the point. One that channels the properties of Fuinjutsu? That's unheard of. Neji seems fascinated while his female teammate looked envious. You could say that the Uzumaki clan were capable of many unusual things. He makes no effort to explain further. Not capable of staying uninjured clearly. Lee taunts, still sore about Naruto's switcheroo during the written portion. Don't be rude. Lee. Neji hisses at him. Naruto looks irritated. I wonder if you'd be so cocky when forced to face Orochimaru, one of the most legendary shinobi to be produced by Konoha in recent history. He went easy on us and we still ended up like this. He could have killed us if he wanted to. The traitor? Neji looks stunned and disbelieving. You can't be serious, what would he be doing here of all places? You can ask the Hokage. She'll know better than anyone at this point. Naruto doesn't much feel like explaining the possible connection between the intel they gathered on Odogakur and Orochimaru's appearance, especially when he doesn't know all of the facts. Nara. Naruto barks loudly at the Shire group. Why yeah? Shikamaru asks back hesitantly. What scroll do you have? And do not lie to me. Earth. Shikamaru replies guilelessly. Naruto throws one of his heaven scrolls out of the barrier, which flickers off for a split second to let it pass through. Pick it up and go to the tower. Don't trip and fall on something sharp on your way there. Team 10 gulp at Naruto's annoyed voice. Thank you. And then they run away. He then turns to Neji. I take it that you don't need a scroll seeing as you didn't just steal that one. We have both. Then you shouldn't delay. What about you? Neji appears to be more at ease around Naruto now that he's witnessed him being nice to another team. What Sasuke and Sakura need right now is rest and some quiet. I'll get them to the tower before the time limit is up. Lee looks like he has more to say, but Neji is the de facto leader of their team and he calls the shots. Good luck, Uzumaki-san. I hope to see you at the tower. Naruto gives the politest wave he can manage. A gift to Neji for being the least insufferable person they've met in this exam so far. He looks up at the darkening sky through the dense foliage of the forest and sighs. How troublesome. It's noon on day 4, and Team 7 is slowly approaching the tower. Sasuke fades in and out of consciousness, forcing Naruto to carry him around. The curse mark victim doesn't speak to Naruto while he's awake. He just ignores the Uzumaki before conking out repeatedly. But he's willing to bear the burden of lugging around this useless sack of meat, because he has been given the opportunity to achieve his own goal in this exam. He has sensed the presence of a strong chakra and he knows exactly who it is.
it is giving a signal of distress, so he has to act quickly. Let's go, Sakura. Naruto starts to run in the direction he senses it coming from. Give me a break. Sakura groans but chases after him. Naruto dashes nimbly over roots and rocks and he finds his quarry being attacked by a gigantic bear. Blue chains shoot out of his palm and arm, which bury deeply into the tough skin of the bear. The last chain hits its head when the bear is immobilized, killing it before it can suffer for too long. He uses the control he has gathered to sever the tips of the chains off and retract them so he wouldn't get covered in blood. He lands in front of his Uzumaki. I've been looking for you. Naruto's grin scares her. She is stuck to the spot in pure fear. Please don't kill me. I won't kill you, or hurt you. What's your name? Naruto soothes gently. Karen. She cries quietly while introducing herself. Naruto, your ugly face is scaring her. Get out of the way. Sakura figures that she wouldn't be able to convince Naruto to stray from his plan, so she'd just indulge him until someone more qualified could talk him down. Hey, I'm Sakura. Look, we're not gonna hurt you. Naruto wants to protect you, that's why we're here. Sakura puts on the best smile she can after her own horrifying adventure in this damn forest. Karen nods silently. Let me do a checkup. Sakura's hands glow brighter now that her chakra has mostly restored. The redhead watches careful and her eyes dart nervously to the tall Janan holding his unconscious teammate. How long have you been sick? Sakura asks, looking mystified from the feeling result after using her diagnosis jutsu. I'm always sick. Karen answers honestly. Naruto activates the Sharingan hidden under his hair. He sees messy, swirling chakra clashing with Karen's in her arms. It warps and slaps the insides of her coils and is stopping correct chakra flow. Check her arms. Naruto orders stoically. Sakura first asks permission, like a normal person. Can I roll up your sleeves? Oh okay. Karen makes the first weak tug before Sakura's confident medic mentality lets her take professional control. Oh my god. Sakura can't help but stare. Karen shuts her eyes in shame. Hundreds of bite marks, leaving horrid red scars all over her skin, are plainly visible. The sizes range wildly, making it clear that this is the work of a great many people. Why? Sakura's horror is evident. Karen sniffles. My chakra heals people. Kuza makes its shinobi bite me to get better quickly. They used up my ka-chan and they're doing the same to me. Sakura looks up at Naruto. His face is blank as stone. Now she's on board to liberate this girl from Kusagakur. I can stop the infections. I'll purge the foreign chakra slipping into your system every time you've been, er, bitten. You just need to never let anyone bite you again. Sakura gives her a standing order. I don't have a choice. Bitter tears steam from her eyes. You do now. Naruto insists. Karen looks up at him this time. The reason that your chakra has potent healing properties is because you possess the blood of the same clan that I hail from. You are an Uzumaki, and so was your mother by the sounds of it. You belong here, with me. Your family. Uzumaki? Karen's unsure repeat of the word sounds lost, as if she is trying to remember something. How can you be so sure? Naruto frowns deeply. You really don't know? The redhead shakes her head. Our chakra is. Similar. I used a sensory jutsu that is exclusive to our clan to determine that you are an Uzumaki. It's called Mind's Eye of the Kagura. My Ka-chan told me that. Karen's back straightens, memory coming to the forefront of her mind. My Ka-chan taught me that. Naruto smiles brightly, seeing that his wayward clan member is starting to see things his way. The Uzumaki clan also had a reputation for having vibrant red hair. Something that skipped a generation in me, but it looks like you inherited the same beautiful hair that my mother had. Karen grabs a fistful of said vibrant hair, looking between him and the ugly hair that she'd never been complimented for in her life. She bites her bottom lip. Naruto puts Sasuke down gently with Sakura's assistance. Uzumaki Karen. Naruto kneels and puts his arms out. The name is oh so right. Naruto's chakra unseals slowly, letting Karen feel up close just how similar their chakra is. She crawls to him, hoping it's all not some cruel dream or illusion. Naruto lets her feel his arms and the chakra that exudes from it. Her own chakra resonates with it, making splashes of light blue chakra flick off their skin joyously. Welcome home. She throws her arms around him and sobs into his chest. I swear I will protect you. Karen remains glued to Naruto for their short journey to the forest tower. 
Sakura tries not to be bitter at all the positive attention the girl was getting from a handsome guy like Naruto, while she is stuck with the Moody Uchiha. Sasuke doesn't so much as speak to Naruto or even her, and she just silently keeps one of his arms over her shoulder while they walk at a sedate pace up the short flight of steps to a door. What if they say no? Then I'll find somewhere else that we can be together. Karen melts at Naruto's words. She quickly discards the Kuza forehead protector and leaves it littered on the cold ground. Sasuke's fist clenches. But he still refrains from speaking. They make their way in through one of the many surrounding doors and come across a riddle written on the wall. It's quickly figured out that they need to open the scrolls in order to progress. Umino Iruka appears from their scroll to congratulate them for completing the stage. He sasses Naruto on his abduction of an enemy shinobi, and Naruto is tired of people giving him the good argument when he has definitely decided to be bad. Killing intent erupts from him and silences Iruka, who is forced to let them pass and run off to tell someone stronger than him. And unfortunately, he had time to go and find the Hokage herself who is present to watch the next part of the exams. You and I will speak. Now. Naruto tugs Karen along with him, and Tsunade leads them to a private basement floor. Tsunade however, is disturbingly agreeable to letting Naruto do as he pleases. But she has conditions. And an explanation. Given the fact Sasuke was whining about these Uzumaki going to war, I take it you know a bit about the Uzumaki clan. Probably as much as you do. I'm willing to honor the alliance. Tsunade's words are a weight of Karen's shoulder. However, you will tell me how you know these things. I will, once you give me a public space to flaunt my power at the enemy publicly. Tsunade smiles at his stubbornness and manipulative nature. It reminds her of. Herself, actually. A little conflict will do this village some good. Especially the younger ones. Naruto looks confused. But you're the one who ordered us to help the weaklings? She looks at him with a raised, delicate brow for an explanation to his reaction. You had us help them. You weakened them by taking that conflict away from them in the first place. She actually smiles. I knew that letting you learn without the academy influence was a good idea. It's true. I did order such a thing, but these are promotion exams. Even when lives are on the line, it doesn't seem to come across that way to the younger generations. Real war is a better wake-up call than nearly dying in the Chunin exams. Better that they learn the real lesson sooner, and let Konoha remain on its pedestal of high morality by honoring a long-standing tradition with the Uzumaki clan. Naruto carefully takes in her words. You are already expecting war with someone. Even without my decision to take Karen. Karen looks completely lost. She doesn't appear to be capable of understanding the nature of growth in conflict like Naruto and Tsunade. The Hokage looks at him with an almost affectionate gaze. Yes. A good friend of mine has discovered that there is an organization currently scouting for Baiju and Jinchuriki. Kumagakur is extremely weak right now, so it would be essentially effortless for a number of s rank criminals to take their Baiju away from them. The more they collect, the easier it becomes to get more, and the less of a chance we have at survival. Naruto sees the hidden message. He looks unsurely between Tsunade and Karen. I'll need a month. He decides. A month for what? Karen tugs on his remaining sleeve nervously. To prove that the Uzumaki clan is worth war with another nation. I'll leave you two alone. You're going to be expected in the upper level exam room shortly, however. She pets the top of Naruto's head. I'll make sure you have your month. She leaves them alone and Naruto is left to explain what needs to happen from this point on. You know that you're safe now, right? Regardless if I fail, you'll still be welcome in Konoha. Naruto looks unsure of how to proceed. What does she mean by all that? She means that Kumagakur has sent a Jinchuriki into these exams. And that she wants me to obtain its by Juu. By sealing it into you. Me? Karen squeaks. Yes. But what does that mean? Karen looks confused and scared. Functionally, not a whole lot. I will need to learn how to seal the Baijuu inside of you safely, and you'll get a significant extra pool of chakra to draw from in the best case scenario. Worst case, your chakra reserves will be limited. But even then, you'll still obtain emergency access chakra that is stronger than your own. I'm scared. I don't understand. Naruto wraps his arms around her. Don't worry. My mother was the Jinchuriki of the QB, and she was completely fine. I'll have more time to explain once we get out of this forest. I'll take you home and we can learn about the few injutsu I'll need. No matter what, everything's going to be okay. Tori. An onbu drops down in front of Tsunade. Gather your squad and head to Kusagakur. 
recover everything related to this Karen girl. Medical records, personal belongings, family members' corpses. Everything, and bring them back to Konoha. Understood. Tori nods and vanishes. Every successful team is gathered before the Hokage and Jounin Sensei in rows. Naruto's team, plus another four teams from Konoha are in attendance. Kumo, Otto and Suna have one team each, and Karen waits on one of the balconies already. Her former Jounin Sensei is nowhere to be found, so Naruto figures that Tsunade must have already acted on his behalf before he could cause more trouble than strictly necessary. Thankfully, Naruto gets to watch Sakura completely destroy Yamanaka Ino before his match starts. He isn't planning on spending a single second longer here than he needs to when he has study and practice he needs to urgently get to. He is the second match, and he suspects that Tsunade may have had some hand in getting him out early. Uzumaki Naruto and Rock Lee, please step into the arena. The proctor summons them, coughing a bit as he finishes. But with clear intent on revenge for making her expend more effort. Send you bitch. So he meanders his way down the stairs and stands in opposition to a Janan that clearly has something against him. It is time to show you what hard work can do in the face of genius talent. Lee looks all too pumped. Do you think you have a monopoly on hard work? Give me a break. Naruto rolls his eyes at the pre-match trash talk. Lee narrows his eyes. I am tired of prodigies disrespecting the efforts of those born without Talon. I don't care. Naruto interrupts with a voice that matches his words. Your juvenile outlook proves that even you don't value the hard work that those prodigies put in to achieve their goals. I don't care about what makes you think you're better. I don't care about your history that has made you this way. You clearly exist in your own, tiny bubble that is free from understanding that every single living soul in this world has their own struggles. Even talented geniuses suffer from loss and have to learn painful lessons to become stronger. So shut your trap, and hope that you're a better fighter than you are a speaker or a thinker. The proctor doesn't need to say start. Lee has already launched into a taijutsu flurry that Naruto matches with some effort. He's as fast as Naruto. Sakura looks amazed. She'd never seen anyone besides Kakashi match Naruto in taijutsu. Kick his ass. Karen cheers for her clanmate. His youthful vigor will allow him to win. Even against your student, Kakashi. Guy's proud face sports a glorious grin. There is a moment of silence. Hmm? Did you say something? Guy's grin turns upside down and he grabs his head dramatically. Damn you, Kakashi. Naruto skids back. Not bad, but at this rate I'm going to outlast you. Naruto knows that his stamina and healing rate will settle a stalemate. Then I'll have to up the ante. Lee leaps deftly onto the statue at the forefront of the room. Do it Lee. Show everyone what you can do. Protect your beliefs and your pride. Leg weights? That's it? Sure, Naruto is having trouble with Lee's taijutsu prowess, but a bit of weight wouldn't make much difference. The weights hit the floor with an explosion of dust, and Naruto quickly realizes how wrong he is. Lee vanishes from the statue and reappears behind Naruto. He kicks Naruto in the side which sends him flying. Naruto lets out a pain noise and writes himself in the air. Before his feet hit the ground, he immediately needs to block a punch to his side. His sensory capability allows him to tell which direction he's going to be attacked from but he's unable to make definitive damage while Lee is moving this quickly. He has to rely on defense. He's a glass cannon. He's going to tire, I just need to survive until he does so I can end it. Naruto focuses his senses and takes calming breath. He puts his hands in a tiger sign. No you don't. Lee shouts and unleashes a durious barrage. But Naruto manages to avoid each. He makes blurring flips and weaves through the relentless assault at his highest speed and leaves the spectators amazed. Katan, Kajingakura no Jutsu. His mouth bursts out an enormous cloud of black smog, completely blanketing the arena. Only Hinata and Neji are able to see through it, but it is not a jutsu designed to last. It's a quick escape, and only Karen can sense why Naruto did it instead of something more damaging. She's not spilling the beans on the trick, however. While hidden in the smoke, Naruto weaves several more hand signs into a variant of one of his own unique jutsu. Futon, Shinku Tabaikamu. Wind release, vacuum dive. The same jutsu he'd used in Nami to save Sasuke, only this time it's a sustained version. The wind swirling around his form will boost each movement he makes with speed, and can be thrown off of his body in a last-ditch blast for the sake of making distance between him and Lee. When the ashes of his technique settle, Lee catches sight of him on the same statue he'd released the weights on. Guy's student makes no hesitation in attacking again, but with Naruto's now enhanced speed, 
he's too hard to catch. His evasiveness will eventually wear Lee down if he doesn't try something else. I will not lose here. Especially not to you. He takes an unfamiliar stance. And unknown to everyone but him in the room, the chakra-disguised ornamental statue with glowing red eyes in the corner is copying every move. Lee continues his grating monologue. The lotus will bloom, and I shall be the victor. Kaimon, Kumon. Kai. Hachimon? Naruto is amazed, but knows that his life is on the line if he doesn't act fast. Katen, Ryuen Hoka no Jutsu. Five dense flames take the form of dragon heads. Lee dodges effortlessly with his dramatically enhanced speed. The jutsu leaves huge craters from their concussive and burning force in the arena flooring. Not yet. Lee stands still for a moment. Simon. Shoman. Taman. Kai. Five gates. If he gets me, he'll damage me too much for me to heal it off. I'll die. Lee vanishes. Naruto can't keep up at present. He gets bounced around the room like a rubber ball before he realizes what's happening. His insides are being brutalized without a moment's rest to heal them. Naruto launches as many chains as possible out of his body in order to suspend himself in the air. He manages to form a weak and choppy barrier around himself and launches into a flurry of hand signs. Lee destroys the barrier with a punch and wraps his wrist bandages around Naruto's waist. Now, there is nothing between them. Even his chains are too slow to stop the impending assault. I need to time this perfectly. Uro Renge. Lee's final move connects, sending Naruto into the ground and causing a devastating explosion of dust. For a moment, no one can see anything. Until Lee comes tumbling out of the cloud at the far end of the room. Looking scorched. His muscles are visible on one side of his body. His skin looks like it has been blasted off, and only his face is unharmed. It looks like he was the victim of an overpowered exploding tag, but the lack of a body in the crater left in the wake of his attack has made it all clear. Bunshine Daibakua. This fight is over. The statue in the corner of the room dispels its transformation, revealing an extremely injured Naruto who's substituted with the transformed cage Bunshine. He he, ha 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 ha. Naruto's exhilarated laughter is the only noise that is heard in the silent aftermath. Naruto vomits up blood and crawls on his knees for a moment, but even his injuries are incomparable to Lee's. The winner is, Uzumaki Naruto. The coughing proctor announces. A trio of medics run to Naruto and the remainder to Lee. But Naruto is already standing up. His grazes and cuts from slamming into the stone floor are steaming and closing themselves. His face develops bruises and swelling before they shrink and return to his normal light skin tone. Lee has been removed from the room. In the 10 minutes it took to prepare him for transport and for Naruto to walk back up the balcony to his Uzumaki, he had nearly healed from his fight with Guy's protege. You're unreal. I was scared. Karen throws her arms around him. Naruto's ribs are broken and he lets out a guttural noise of pain from his throat. The medics take him away to tend to his broken bones and Karen follows. Neither see the following fights. Every Janan in the room looks like they don't understand what just happened. Kurenai and Asuma are becoming increasingly unsure about having their teams participate. As do their students. Kakashi doesn't feel any closer to unraveling the mystery of his sensei's son. And the Hokage simply smiles. Chapter 8, To Be Different. Jiraiya straightens his back and shuffles with only a hint of nervousness when he approaches his godson's apartment. He has never met Naruto before. Some godfather he is. But Konoha had been suffering under the weight of the Kyuubi attack, and as a strong proponent of the continued existence of his home, he had taken upon himself to expand his network of spies in order to protect Konoha from the kinds of threats that it is facing right now. So his visit serves a dual purpose. Try and connect with Naruto, and also obtain any intel possible from him and the Uzumaki girl he'd stolen. What a good lad he sounds like. Making an effort to rescue his family. It's hard to find conviction in younger generations. Jiraiya knocks on the door. One of the only times he actually uses one instead of coming through the window. Coming. A much younger female voice calls out, and Jiraiya hears the pitter-patter of a child's feet run to the door. It opens, and instead of a redhead or even Naruto as he had been expecting, there's a silver-haired four- or five-year-old with calligraphy ink all over her face in ridiculous patterns. Hi. She chirps up at him. Hello, young lady. Jiraiya can't help but smile. I wanted to see if this is where Naruto lives? I'll get him. She slams the door in his face and the familiar pitter-patter comes back. Soon enough, the door opens and this time it's a redhead girl instead of Naruto. Her face is also covered in black ink with patterns that cannot possibly be construed as a sealed template. 
Naruto's kinda busy. What do you want? What a delightfully polite girl. Jiraiya's grin doesn't stray from his face. It's almost. Heartening, being treated like a normal man instead of a legendary shinobi. Hey kid, I'm here to talk to you and Naruto about the Kusagakur spy. Tsunade gave me your address. As if he needed the address with Naruto's chakra screaming to everyone in the village I'm right here. Naruto. Some weird old man is asking for you. The words are a lance through his heart and pride. Figures Minato's brat would collect a girl just like Kushina. Let him in. The only male voice in the house calls out. Jiraiya steps in and respectfully shakes off his geta at the door. He is witness to innumerable pieces of paper and scrolls pinned up to the walls. All of them are clearly for learning purposes and practicing finding the perfect seal that he wants to use. Not unlike his father's apartment, even after he'd met Kushina. He could even see the beginnings of an 8 trigram seal on one above a bedroll. The apartment is clearly only one bedroom, so he guessed Naruto would have to sleep somewhere until they got a bigger place. And then. He finally catches sight of his godson. A mane of black hair, dark eyes, and fair skin. He has a strong jawline and is tall for his age. Just as Tsunade said, he really doesn't look anything at all like Minato. Or Kushina for that matter. But blood doesn't lie, and Naruto's hospital record confirms his genetic relationship to his parents. Any other relative he has is too far removed to correctly determine with current methods. His face however, is also completely covered in black ink. Done extremely poorly in comparison to the girls. And the silver-haired one sitting in his lap is not letting up on her artistic expression. The ink does well to hide the dark bags under his eyes but not well enough to hide them from his keen eyes. Looks like the kid has been up for much longer than he should be trying to research the correct seal to use in the creation of a Jinchuriki. Naruto for his part seems to be ignoring the efforts of the girl, and is instead devouring anything he can from the scrolls on the wall. Now or never. Naruto? The kid looks his way. Rather dully. Who are you? Jiraiya grins. Name's Jiraiya. Naruto looks more interested now. The Sanin? One of them. Jiraiya affirms, but his grin gets weaker. I heard you had a bit of trouble the last time you met one. It's over now, and we're no worse for wear anymore. Naruto gives a dismissive wave of his hand. Good to know you're in high spirits. What's all this for, then? Jiraiya gestures to the scrolls hanging up. Tsunade probably already told you. Naruto's reply is prompt, making it clear he has more on the mind than reiterating a known task. True, but this seems a bit unnecessary if you've already uncovered the 8 trigram sealing style. That seal will be more than enough to put the Nibi inside your little girlfriend. Karen turns red and looks about ready to steam from the ears. I don't know how to use it. Naruto's eyes droop even more. I haven't discovered the hand signs needed to use it. It's too complicated for me to figure it out and I won't have time to create a sealing ceremony. Jiraiya nods at that logic. Chakra placed into sealing ink would quickly dissipate if not used within a very short time frame. It would likely vanish before Naruto even finishes his first match. Using hand signs is the workaround, but a fuinjutsu powerful enough to seal a baijuu would take dozens of signs. Deciphering fuinjutsu to determine what signs were needed is an advanced art. Good thing Jiraiya has been witness to it dozens of times. The sealing ceremony being a pre-established area in which the seal had been written in its unraveled state using blood or ink. Using hand signs wouldn't be required if the seal just pieced itself together in one quick flourish. Of course, the 8 trigram seal is in reality two of the same seal put together to make a stronger one, so it becomes immediately more complicated than most seals entirely and the time required to set it up in a potentially dangerous situation would be too short. Here, kiddo. Jiraiya takes one of the blank scrolls without permission but Naruto doesn't seem to care. I know a thing or two about fuinjutsu, I'll show you this one for free. Jiraiya saturates a pot of ink with his chakra and draws the diagram for the 8 trigram seal. This is the most time-consuming way of deciphering a seal, but the most effective. What you want to do is find how each sign resonates with the seal you're trying to create. Jiraiya puts his hands into a ram sign, then a bird sign, and then a snake sign. Naruto watches as this generates no reaction from the seal diagram, until Jiraiya puts his hands into a clap hands. The seal lights up blue, before the light dies down and returns to normal ink. The pattern has dismantled very slightly. Jiraiya does the same thing again, finding another seal to dismantle the 8 trigrams. He uses ox, which unravels it even more. Naruto leans over the scroll in fascination, watching as Jiraiya unbakes the seal and steadily fills the entire scroll.
It looks to Jiraiya that the kid has figured out it's a game of elimination. Any sign that does not garner a reaction at whichever stage the seal is on, is not the correct sign. Soon enough, the complete formula for the Haki Fun Shiki is revealed in its entirety. It's nearly 20 minutes after he started but Naruto didn't look away once. He completely misses the pouting girl climbing out of his lap to receive attention from Karen instead. And that's how you find out what seals to use. You start from the finish line and make your way back. The first sign I used is the final one, and the last sign I used is what you start it with. Jiraiya had gone right up to 100 hand signs. What about the key? Does the key have seals too? Jiraiya shakes his head. Nope. That's the beauty of the seal. The key is grafted automatically to the body of the person using it. Using the same signs or sealing ceremony again won't create another haki fun shiki, but instead prepare the key for transfer to another holder. The key holder can be the same person who the seal is grafted to, or it can be another creature. I can use my toad summons to be a key holder in the event that I'd need to use the seal again. And how would I use the key if it's grafted to me? Curious kid. That'd serve him well going forward. Grafting the key to your body essentially makes you the key. Any time you would interact with the seal, your chakra will automatically bring it out. Jiraiya can see the cogs in Naruto's head turning. The way he's heard it, Naruto has a habit of interpreting information and jutsu use in creative ways. You've got a familiar look on that face of yours. Reminds me of someone else I taught. Jiraiya comments nostalgically. Naruto looks him dead in the eyes. It surprises Jiraiya that the kid can look so calm and serious despite being covered in ink. My father? Jiraiya blinks. His face then settles into something more akin to exasperation. A light. Tsunade told me you knew more than you let on. Why let me know now that you're aware? How do you even know anyways? You'll find out how I know during the final stage of the exams. Probably. Naruto's lips twitch in a way that makes it clear he's having fun leading everyone along. But as to why, I think it'd be the best way to keep you here, helping me. To know what you think I can teach you besides this, brat. Jiraiya plays dumb and petulant. Oh, but I think you do. Naruto insists, his own grin widening. I'm sure there's something of the Yondaime that can be of particular use to me. An inheritance, almost. You want his money? His house? I ain't an estate holder, kiddo. I don't want his belongings. There's not much value in the half-empty box of condoms with holes evidently poked through them found in his bedside drawer. Jiraiya gives him an unimpressed look to disguise his amusement. You're gonna need to be specific then. I want to learn the Rasengan. Oh, well. I suppose I can help you out a little. I'll come back tomorrow, same time. Who knows, maybe I can tell you the story about how your parents met. I'd like that. What is she planning? Donzo has needed to act with extreme caution for the last five years. Itachi had been all too keen to tell Tsunade of his involvement in the culling of the Uchiha clan. There are only four people alive with knowledge about that incident. Himself, Itachi, Tsunade, Koharu, and Homura. And the ghost of an Uchiha. He has been denied the ability to provide counsel to the Hokage, and publicly had his Anbu faction dismantled. But shadows would never disappear from Konoha. He reached out to another victim of Konoha's all-encompassing light, Orochimaru. In exchange for genetically enhanced children to bolster his private faction, Danzo would in turn provide Orochimaru with the means of obtaining one Uchiha Sasuke. Having Sasuke removed from the picture subtly, would turn Itachi's fearsome eyes away from him and onto Orochimaru instead. But Kakashi has proven to be an effective teacher for Sasuke. Every day the Uchiha boy becomes more zealous in the protection of Konoha and its people. Under normal circumstances, Danzo would consider this conditioning to be exemplary on the part of Kakashi. Unfortunately, Orochimaru would not be satisfied with only an opportunity to send Sasuke into his den. The deal is for him to obtain the Uchiha boy, and in exchange, Orochimaru would kill Tsunade and free the seat of Hokage. Konoha shinobi respect power, but openly challenging a Hokage whose rule has proven extremely satisfactory to nearly the entire population of the village, would put him in the bad books of their public scrutiny. The results of an assault at this level would remove Tsunade from the equation, which would take the most likely of people who knew the truth out of the equation to contest his impending rule. It would be hard to find someone living besides Kakashi or Jiraiya that can fill the chair in Tsunade's wake, seeing that Koharu and Homura do not possess the strength required. And that is why Shisui's Mangekyu would prove the most effective. To convince either person who would be elected that their efforts are better spent elsewhere. Kakashi is an active and dedicated father, but he may very well step up to the occasion for the sake of Konoha. 
Jiraiya would be easier to deter but on the off chance that he did become Hokage, any hope that Danzo would have at obtaining that seat would be forever lost. Jiraiya is a menace to society but has a well-earned reputation. Public favor would be towards him instead of an aging relic of a Konoha long past, especially one that has been kept out of public affairs for quite some time. With Danzo as Hokage, he could contain Kakashi's influence over Sasuke and soon have him shipped and packed off to Orochimaru with a sweet promise of power to obtain vengeance or as Kakashi had conditioned him, protection of Konoha. If he is convinced that the shinobi system of Konoha is broken, then he would seek out the power to obtain it from someone who had already provided him with it. A well-laid trap to allow Orochimaru to obtain his long-sought-after Uchiha body, and then the boy's motive for leaving would be irrelevant. Itachi would then likely kill Orochimaru, and then one traitor that could cause him problems going forward would be eliminated. But Tsunade knows more than she is letting on. All reports following the preliminary stages have not been written, and instead are likely exclusive to word of mouth. Every shinobi she converses with knows something but not the whole picture, making it impossible to know what she plans to do. She is clearly aware of Orochimaru's temporary village planning an attack due to a resource grab, but that mission to arm Otto Shinobi served its purpose of providing false intel that it would only be one village participating in Konoha's destruction. Jiraiya has seemingly uncovered the leak Danzo had been using to get information to Orochimaru, but the purpose of it remained elusive. It meant no more intel would be making its way to other nations, but now it's too late. Tsunade is an effective Hokage but Konoha can always have more. Konoha can have a better Hokage than any who had come previously. Konoha may fall. But its tree would grow back with deeper roots than ever before. He is the only option for Hokage. He would achieve his dream. No matter the cost. Naruto vs. Sasuke. Yugito vs. Neji. Shino vs. Sakura. Karu vs. Konkuro. Dosu vs. Gara. Tamari vs. Amoi. Abarame Shibi puts down Konoha's newspaper and a thrum of pride runs through him. It pleases him to no end that his boy has made it this far in what is probably the most difficult Chonin exam held in Konoha since its inception. Genius prodigies and Jinchuriki, and the Kazekage's own children. If he were being honest with himself, he hadn't expected Shino to make it this far. His insect hive inside of him buzzes in response to the positive hormones running in his body. Unfortunately, the other parents of participating Konoha Janan are not so pleased. They were gathered at a tea stall not too far from where his clan compound is. A very rare occurrence that their schedules aligned enough to have a meetup. Not present is one Hayuga Hyashi. He never deigned to just chat. He hoped his daughter wasn't going to be on the receiving end of some negative treatment, but even he should understand that Neji is not just a Hayuga, but a talented and hardworking boy on his own. Hyashi could take some lessons from his brother about positive reinforcement, in Shibi's humble opinion. And Hizashi generally spent most of his spare time with his son, not often making it to their little functions. We were right. Sume holds her forehead between her thumb and finger in frustration. Shino was the only one out of all our kids to get through. He supposes he can understand. He'd watched the tapes given by Inoki's friend. Kiba had been completely destroyed by Yugito. It hadn't even been a contest. The Inuzuka hadn't stood a chance against that level of speed and agility. Precise strikes between Kiba's attacks had him and Akamaru down for the count. Shino had fought strategically against this Zaku from Otto, only sustaining some minor bruises from the concussive energy of sound waves. The Akimichi boy had been beaten soundly by another Otto Janan. No surprises there. Ino had been thoroughly decimated by Kakashi's Janan, something that seemed rile Inoki up to no end. A civilian girl. Beating my Ino. Inoki slaps his forehead and bemoans. One taught by Hitake Kakashi. Shikaku points out, but that is their whole reason for pushing the nomination, wasn't it? They'd slowly collected bits and pieces of information from their kids about what they were being taught by their Jounin sensei and had been left wanting. They had hoped that the Chonin exams would be an appropriate wake-up call to make the sensei start to take their responsibilities as teachers seriously, seeing as they seem content on raising a new generation of friends instead of Shinobi. Shikaku's boy probably had the best chance along with Shino, but he'd gotten the misfortune of being pitted against Uchiha Sasuke. That might have a chance turned to no chance very quickly. Shino understands the risks better now. He has already approached me for additional tutelage. Shibi states, reveling in the fact that his reserved son at least trusts him enough to seek help from him instead of struggling on his own. Ino is sulking. I'll see what happens when she gets over it. But I'm still going to have words with Asuma about this. Inoki does not seem pleased with the lack of progress over six months. 
Sume stands up and throws down some change for her share of the tea at the stall. And I'm going to beat some skill into my boy. Later. Sume stops before leaving. Tell Shino good luck for me, won't you? I think he already knows. She behides a smile. Shino walks around the corner after basically being called out by his father. He'd clearly been waiting patiently for him so they could continue training. Thank you, Sume-san. Sume ruffles his hair fondly before she and Kuromaru run off. The Ino Shikacho trio stands and makes their way to pay. Shibi puts his money down and turns to his son. Shall we go, then? Shino nods as eagerly as he is willing to express. Sasuke grips his shoulder in discomfort as he leaves his apartment. That seal will only be as strong as your own desire to refuse it. Kakashi gives him the rundown on the evil sealing method. For as long as you contain your own desperation, that mark will remain suppressed. It brought up the value of having strength, so that he wouldn't be in that situation. He'd gotten packed the night before and is setting out to meet Kakashi for some private training. If he is strong enough on his own, then he won't need to resort to the tainted power of Orochimaru's curse mark. Especially against Naruto, who is yet to reveal his full strength to anyone. Sasuke? Are you alright? The woman from the young couple who owns his favorite bakery asks him in concern. Himari, he remembers her name as if it were written on his hand. I'll be fine. Sasuke follows up his half-truth with a deflection. Just a bit beaten up after the exams. That's right. I saw in the paper that you made it to the final stages. Congratulations. She reaches over to tussle his hair. Sasuke manages a smile. This makes her immediately pull on his cheeks. He bats her hands away and huffs. She doesn't take it personally, one of the many things he likes about her and her husband. They'd been there for him for a long time now. Even after they'd just gotten married and were in the process of opening their bakery, they would often see him pass on his lonesome and invite him over. Very slowly, they earned his trust enough for him to give them his keys whenever he left the village for extended periods. It was them who taught him how to live on his own, seeing as he didn't have anyone left to do it. And out of the kindness of their own hearts, never expecting a single Rio in exchange. How could you be willing to put people like this at risk? Sasuke wonders, asking Naruto in his mind regarding the selfish words he'd heard in the forest. Civilians are always the easiest targets in shinobi warfare. It's a disgusting practice, taking out suppliers of food and tools so that shinobi would be less prepared for battle. Innocents should be left out of the affairs of killers. Is that Sasuke I hear? The lesser half of the couple walks through the door flaps to the bakery. Look Yuido, Sasuke made it to the finals of the Chonin exams. Himari gushes again, pulling Sasuke closer and embarrassing him. Himari-san. He most certainly does not whine. Ha ha ha. I knew you'd do it. Yuido claps a hand on Sasuke's other shoulder. All those nights of staying up past your bedtime have paid off. We'll be rooting for you in the finals. Sasuke's unintentional smile falters a bit. Yuido and Himari notice immediately. Sasuke? Ah it's nothing, just my first match is against Naruto. Naruto? Himari taps her chin and thought. Your teammate? Not just my teammate. He's probably the strongest out of every single Janan and Chonin in the village. And he hasn't even shown his full capabilities yet. Even stronger than you? But weren't you the highest graded in your class? Yuido's brow furrows. Sasuke wishes his outlook was still as simple as that of the civilians. Naruto is on a whole different level. But. Don't worry about me. My sensei is training me personally for the next stage. He said that he's arranged trainers for Naruto and Sakura, but there's something only he can train me in right now. I have faith. Yuido closes his eyes and nods determinately. You'll damn well give him a run for his money, even if you don't win. That's right. Himari adopts the same look. Sasuke is overwhelmed by their open support of him. He would often receive of course he can do it, he's an Uchiha. But no one besides Kakashi and his teammates would ever think he could do something of his own merits. Naruto, if you ever put these people at risk. I will do everything to end you. The couple tactfully pick up on Sasuke's struggling expression. You know, Sasuke. We've got some pretty important news too. Yuito starts off slyly. Sasuke looks up at them curiously. Himari cannot contain the bursting emotion. We're having a baby. The Janan looks gobsmacked. I Sasuke shakes his head. That is the last thing I expected to hear today. Um. Congratulations? Yuido laughs and Himari pulls him into another hug. Himari has deigned to let me name it if it's a boy, but I can't think of anything that I like enough. 
What about a girl? Sasuke asks, not really sure what else to say. Well. We were thinking Tsukimi. After my grandmother. Himari instinctively rubs her belly with a sheepish expression. That's a good name. Sasuke approves genuinely. Yuido grins, but pauses a second later. Wait, before you go. He rushes back into the empty bakery and comes out with a brown paper bag with a couple of buns in it. Here, for your training. He puts the bag in Sasuke's hand. Sasuke admires their generosity. Thank you. Good luck again, Sasuke. We'll be cheering you on. Sasuke turns and waves them goodbye. You disgust me, weakling filth. Jiraiya watches with wide eyes as the fiery redhead from Uzu knocks the teeth out of a Janan boy. Apparently, the girl was being targeted by bullies and took matters into her own hands. When one of the bullies went crying to his niece San, the girl put him and his friends in their place too. The girl hasn't even graduated from the academy yet. She's amazing. Minato, his little protege and all-around skilled brat, looks down at the violent girl dreamily. I hope you don't get that from me, kid. Jiraiya thinks to himself with a sweat drop. Oh? Is she your girlfriend? Jiraiya asks teasingly instead. Minato goes red and sputters out a no. Maybe you should go introduce yourself then. Jiraiya pushes him over the guardrail. Sensei. His student crashes into some bushes right next to the redhead. That's cruel, Jiraiya. Tsunade shakes her head, who is tagged along with him on a not date. Hmm. Nah. Kid's got guts. I don't mean getting him to ask out a girl he likes. I mean putting him in Kushina's way. What? The redhead Kushina, turns to the bushes and invites out its occupant with a menacing aura. More trash? Come out and face me. I am not here to fight. Minato stumbles clumsily out of the bush, white jacket covered in leaves. What do you want then? Kushina's gaze is unrelenting. Even Jiraiya almost feels nervous looking at those scary violet eyes. Will you go on your date with him? Minato burst out his question with a completely red face. Huh? Kushina replies eloquently. Minato recomposes himself enough to not rush. Will you go on a date with me? Kushina looks dumbstruck. From their little perch, Tsunade comments something to Jiraiya. I don't think Kushina has ever been given positive attention from a male that wasn't her father. But still. Kushina is not anything close to a normal girl. Back on the ground, the silence in the wake of his question has made Minato ghostly pale. Fight me. Kushina demands, looking like she's holding down an embarrassed reaction. If you're strong enough to beat me, I'll go on a date with you. Minato looks stunned, but he clearly likes Kushina enough that being beaten up a bit is a calculated risk for this situation. All right. Kushina hands his ass to him. But she is not disparaging of him like she was with the bullies. You're not strong enough to date me. But I like your courage. Minato wipes blood off of his chin, looking up at her with unholy determination and fire in his eyes. I swear, I'll get strong enough. I'll get that date. Jiraiya slaps his forehead. Yep. He gets it from me. Some years later. Minato and Kushina, age 17. It was almost like a sporting event at this point. People would come to watch Minato vie for Kushina's affections. Jiraiya and Tsunade watched the most eagerly, putting bets on them and egging on their respective prospects. Tsunade has been betting safe for the first time in her life, something Jiraiya is rather sour about. He's losing a lot of money watching this freak of nature pulverize his apprentice. But today is different. Minato's dedication to his training has made him a formidable force, even elite Jounin cannot compare. Jiraiya thought it a little sad that Kushina had no other love interests. Not a single boy is brave enough to even attempt what Minato is. But Minato's bravery and valiant efforts are rubbing off on Kushina, she becomes more interested in him each spar and Minato gets closer to the end goal. Settle it brat. Go get her. Jiraiya mentally cheers. And they go hard at each other, fighting with such vicious power and strategy that they had never done so before. Jiraiya and Tsunade wait patiently over the course of the five-hour fight. At no point is it evident that either one of them is getting the upper hand over the other. But they persist, their unnatural stamina prolongs the match and some spectators are outright frightened by the sheer skill and power. Futan Ninjutsu blasts off the concrete walls of the exam stadium, Katan scorches the ground. Minato's Raten and precise wind leave scars everywhere in the arena. Kushina is fast. Minato is faster. The Abanero throws up a barrier through her chains and prepares a final Katan. Minato dashes at the barrier with his brand new jutsu, the Rasengan, and smashes the powerful barrier to pieces. 
And then, for the first time ever. Pashina lands on her back. Her clothes are caked in clumps of dirt. She is heaving for air desperately and her golden chakra chains lay around her slackly and form a glowing halo around her head and long hair. Minato has her at the point of one of his signature kunai, but he is still standing. His clothes are shredded and burnt, his face is bruised and his wounded body is on display. The stadium is in dead silence. He holds his hand out to her, in a gentlemanly gesture. Will you go on a date with me? Pushina takes it, looking more girly than she ever had since Jiraiya first set eyes on her. Minato helps Kushina to her feet and she buries her head to his chest, looking up at him with shy violet eyes. Why yes. Jiraiya is the first to spring up and cheer, and the entire stadium follows him. That's my boy. Karen has hearts in her eyes at Jiraiya's story. Wow. She looks entirely overwhelmed and has spreckles of tears at the corners of her eyes. That's the most romantic thing I've ever heard in my life. Must be an Uzumaki thing. Jiraiya thought dryly, but smiled at Karen's appreciation of his storytelling. Naruto sits cross-legged, palm in his chin and wearing a close-eyed smile. Minako is asleep near him, on a perch made from dining room chairs, blankets and pillows that they'd made while playing. No one's ever told me about what they were like. Thanks, old man. Jiraiya would normally puff up at being called old man, but reciting the story has him feeling nostalgic about his relationship with Minato and he comes to realize that he doesn't mind. He ruffles Naruto's spiky hair instead. A knock on the door draws Jiraiya's eyes to it, and he quickly notices how dark it has gotten. Ah, Minako's mother? Jiraiya comes to the right conclusion when Naruto nods. Yeah, we were just babysitting while she trained my teammate. Naruto confirms. I'll let her in on my way out. Jiraiya offers, giving Naruto's shoulder a light bump. Be ready tomorrow, I'm gonna put you through your paces if you wanna learn the Rasengan in time for the final stage. I will. And thanks again. Jiraiya slips on his getta and opens the door. Jiraiya Sama, a woman who'd only been a young girl the last time he saw her, is standing outside. Shizun? Jiraiya is surprised. That kid is yours? The woman stammers slightly. Why yes, Minako is mine and Kakashi's daughter. We live next door. Well I'll be damned. I had no idea. Jiraiya grins. A guy like Kakashi having a kid? Looks like you both really did grow up. Shizun looks sheepish but still proud. Well, I'll be on my way. Say hi to that Kakashi brat for me, won't you? Jiraiya steps down the walkway and makes his way out. Of course, Jiraiya-sama. Have a good night. Shizun bows politely in respect to him. Later. He waves over his shoulder. What a long day. He wishes all days were as simple as this. The blonde Jinchuriki is in bed after receiving orders from her sensei. You are to kill Uzumaki Naruto, no matter the cost or collateral damage. We cannot have another Uzumaki Kushina sweep the nations. Matatabi insists differently. Yugito. Please, listen to reason. You saw what that lunatic did to his fellow Konoha Shinobi. If that's what Konoha does to its own people in an exam, what do you think they're going to do to us in order to keep us working for them? Kumagakur has sinned, but at least we don't treat our own people like that. It will not be that way if you surrender voluntarily. Your home continues to drive itself towards destruction by angering the sons of the sage, you do not understand the nature of man as I do. I have seen over a millennia that peace is only a temporary stasis of conflict between factions. Kumagakur is as the phrase says, punching above its weight. Instead of guaranteeing its existence, they seek to greedily consume all around them, and it is hurting them they are manufacturing a conflict that they cannot walk away from. You defy even your father's teachings. Kumagakur has collected you and the tools of the sage in order to bring peace to the world, under one mighty rule. Hypocrisy. The Baiju thunders its accusation. I do not agree with father's teachings anymore, but what you say is the exact opposite of the purpose that his children and those tools were created for. We were created so that we could harmonize with humanity, and spread the word and religion of Ninshu to everyone in this world to bring peace through cooperation, not domination. Those tools are only a last resort to defeat those who would destroy humanity, and now you humans use them to do exactly the opposite. I am done listening to you. Yugito unintentionally says aloud, but unheard in her hotel room. Then this is goodbye, Yugito. You were my favorite Jinchuriki, but you have failed to acknowledge the world as it is instead of what you want it to be. I wanted you to grow but you will be another dead autumn leaf that feeds the ever-growing tree that is the Rikudo's bloodline. I warned you. Yugito is struck with chills, making it difficult to sleep. 
I wouldn't do that if I were you, kid. Dosu whirls around to face a giant of a man. He'd been planning to kill the guy from Suna who could control sand, that boy being instrumental in the upcoming plan to destroy Konoha. He is feeling rightfully bitter about him and his teammates being thrown at Uchiha Sasuke, freshly tagged with the strongest of the curse marks. Jiraiya looks down at the auto kid in the moonlight. If you want to get back at Orochimaru, I can think of a few things better. Dosu is eventually convinced that throwing his life away like this might not be a good idea. In the fight against Orochimaru, information would be a bigger player. Jiraiya is nice. Karen comments sleepily. Yeah, he seems alright. Naruto replies, but clearly in thought. She's resting her head against his shoulder while in her pajamas that he'd given her money to spend on. She seemed to like being given the agency of buying her own clothes instead of being forced to put up with tacky hand-me-downs like she's gotten in Kusa. Whatcha thinkin'? Karen rubs her eyes, glasses discarded for the moment on the arm of Naruto's old two-seater couch that was enough for them to sit on but not long enough for either to sleep on comfortably. I was fully prepared to betray Konoha to keep you. He seems a bit conflicted. There are good people here, like Jiraiya. My father, and my mother. The orphanage matron. I was ready to turn away from that in order to protect you. I don't regret saving you, not even a little. But I can't help but feel like I'm in the wrong somehow. I was. Taught to treat Konoha as disposable. But I guess I've grown to like the people here more than I thought. I've made bonds and haven't been betrayed. Don't be a worrywart. Karen flicks his nose. It's like the story with your Ka-chan and To-chan, you just need to prove yourself. The choices you make will be looked on better if they're for everyone's benefit. Isn't that why you need to learn this few injutsu scribble? Yeah. Naruto rests his head back and waits for Karen to conk out. Then don't worry. Zhu gets stronger. Her head slides into his lap. She's asleep by the time she stops moving. Naruto is reminded of the time he learned about how shinobi react to power. When he fought those chounin at the ramen stall. You're always treated better when you're powerful in the shinobi world. He can have what he wants, so long as he has the strength to affirm his might to anyone who might dare to oppose him. His Sharingan memorizes Karen's sleeping, delicate face. Family is wonderful. Naruto quotes his orphanage matron. Chapter 9, Uchiha. Uchiha now repets Tsunade's hair delicately. The ten-year-old Senju girl looks up at one of her role models. She spies one pale white eye hidden under a smooth curtain of purple hair. But why won't anyone tell me? Tsunade does not ask, she demands to know why everyone refuses to speak of Konoha's boogeyman. Madara-sama was an enigmatic man. But even as he grew distant from us, he always held purpose in his heart. Naori's smooth and calming voice is motherly towards the hot-headed girl. That doesn't mean anything. Tsunade is frustrated. Naori's lips twitch into a smile. Let me finish, dear. Tsunade pouts and sits up on the bench next to her. The other Senju say she's mad for speaking to an Uchiha but Naori has always been a nice lady. What I mean to say is that Madara-sama always had a reason to do something, Naori looks like she's reminiscing about the man in a fond way. He was always the devil's advocate, or voice of reason as he used to call himself. He had a mean reputation but everything he did was for a purpose that he found satisfactory for the benefit of the Uchiha clan or the village. Tsunade wisely chooses not to say anything at the weary drop that Naori's face takes. He tried to tell all of us that the Uchiha clan were going to be discarded, and that we needed to save ourselves by fleeing this cursed prototype of a village and look out for our clan. The Uchiha clan were too weary to listen and cast him away. Madara-sama left Konoha and us behind, and attacked Konoha at the cost of his life. But that raises the strongest question to anyone who knew what he was like. What possible reason could Madara-sama have to destroy Konoha? Perhaps he never wanted to destroy the village. Perhaps he attacked to send a message. To us, perhaps. That he would martyr his own life just to teach us a lesson. What lesson? Tsunade asks quietly and near fearfully. Naori places her hands in her lap and looks down at them. That perhaps. He was right. Tsunade gulps. Someone dying on purpose? To help their family? Naori tries to settle her with an uneasy smile. There is only one thing that I want you to learn from me, honorable granddaughter. It is the nature of man to seek out the most beneficial outcome for what they find important. People are willing to go far to secure what they want, through steady vigil in peace or the terrors of war. The bright flame of that ambition can be used to create an inferno, or be snuffed out quietly in the darkness. It is through understanding this reality that you can make the best of it. Tsunade takes this lesson to heart and carries it with her for decades. 
She sympathizes with the Uchiha clan when they finally explode after decades of segregation from the village they helped to create, but the damage of her forebears had been wrought. Their nature had been suppressed for years, they desired a secure fate for their blood and being increasingly separated from Konoha was slimming those chances. Eventually they'd have abandoned the village, which would have caused them to be hunted down as traitors. Or, they could try to take back control by force and risk civil war but have a slight chance that they'd have a few in their family survive. And those decisions unfortunately fell upon one boy, Uchiha Itachi. A boy whose burden was too great for anyone to bear. Sasuke and Itachi sit under a tree in the middle of the day. The shining sun sends streaks of light through the branches but they are shaded for the most part. Little Sasuke is ever curious, and the only person who gives him straight answers is his Nisan. Their dark eyes meet. Nisan? Yes, Sasuke? What is Uchiha? Sasuke knows that it's his name, the name that he and everyone in the clan share. But what makes their name so special? Tosan always speaks the name Uchiha like it's a word with many meanings. Like it's less of a bond that binds them all together, and more of a code or a promise. Like it's something they should always strive to live up to. What an interesting question. Itachi leans back against the tree trunk, looking relaxed for once instead having tense shoulders and dark bags under his eyes. He looks like he's asking himself that question too. But Itachi is smart, and he can come up with something from what he's seen. Being in Uchiha. Tosan says that the heart of a person never changes. That no matter what guise they wear, will always be drawn to act a certain way. He says that the Uchiha are all bound together, and that we have a disposition and personal duty to always put ourselves before everything else. To love the Uchiha to such a degree that we would rather see the world burn than have none of us left at all. Sasuke listens carefully. He knows that Itachi won't stop at quoting their father, especially when they often disagreed. That is what an Uchiha is. Someone who places their family above everything in this world, damn the consequences. But I believe that while our blood plays some factor in how we interact with the world, it is our decisions and personal responsibilities that truly define who we are. You and I are not the same person, despite being from the same clan. We have different perspectives on the world and the people who surround us. Some people are destined to be despised for the choices they make, and others are to be revered. And their blood plays no part who they are as human beings. Sasuke doesn't understand. He voices as much. Don't worry, Atoto. Itachi pokes Sasuke's forehead with an easy smile. It's not something little kids should be thinking about. I hope that my choices make sure that you get to make those self-defining decisions, instead of letting your blood or your creed warp your mind and make those choices for you. There is something about how Itachi speaks that sets his mind at ease. Make friends, work hard in the academy, find things that are worth something to you that don't involve just a fragile little pocket of the world like our little clan. Find something worth living for, so that when your clan and your family cannot be depended on, you'll already know for yourself just what kind of person you are in your heart. Sasuke doesn't like people. But since it's Itachi. Let your decisions define you, not your blood. Never let anyone force you to betray what you hold dearest. Uchiha is just a name, and it's up to you to determine if that name is good or bad. Naruto and Madara stand apart in their underground hideout. The only light in the darkness of the training area is coming from the sconces mounted to the support pillars, and they are lit ablaze from their cadden. Little Naruto knows that his G-san is the only person who will tell him the truth of how things are. Their Sharingan meet. G-san. Yes, my grandson. What does being in Uchiha mean? Naruto knows that it's his name. One that he can't use yet, but what makes that name special? G-san speaks as though the name itself has power in it and that the word itself is a defining statement. What a strange question. Madara sits down in his dusty throne, looking like a puppet that cut his own strings with how quickly he settled in relaxation. He looks like no one has ever asked him that question before. But he of all people knows what being an Uchiha means. To be an Uchiha. Is equal parts objective and spiritual. Our blood and ability define us, and the name Uchiha, represents that blood and legacy but that talent has been cursed since we first gained the ability to harness it. It creates a seeping darkness in the light of your heart. If we Uchiha define love as light, we would cast hate as dark. Uchiha have been ruled by this dichotomy, never in balance with it like normal humans are. That is what an Uchiha is, to be left ignorant by basking in light, or be left in despair by fear and hatred at the world. Naruto listens carefully. He knows that Madara wouldn't stop at a clinical analysis of his own blood. That is what an Uchiha is, but I believe there is a difference in being a Uchiha, and being the Uchiha. A Uchiha, is someone who fits the parameters of what I have just said. 
someone who is unable to find control in themselves, and to master the curse of hatred within them before it consumes them and everything they love. But to become the Uchiha. Is to meet that fear, and that hatred instead of burying it. It is to become one with your power and the legacy of your clan. To be one with reality and to change your circumstances in accordance with your own desires, instead of being controlled by your power and instinct as if you are some wild animal. He didn't really get it. He voices as much. Not to worry, my boy. Madara leans his head back in the throne, looking tired after training him. That is why I have high hopes for you. If you're lucky, you'll never experience that curse and any mistakes you make will be of your own accord, and they can be things that you learn from instead of being uncontrollable instances of the vile weakness in our Sharingan. Madara's voice is confident, which makes Naruto less nervous about this cursed fate that may await him. Talk to people. Do things, find out what you love in life so that when misery befalls you, you will be able to define yourself. So that you will know yourself when your body betrays you, and makes you believe that all you are is hatred. Naruto does like people. He agrees with this advice. Define yourself on your own terms. Never let anyone or anything force you to betray yourself. Uchiha is a state of existence, it's up to you to determine what kind of existence that is. It's the academy entry day. All of the students are lined up before Hokage-sama as she delivers her speech. The parents of the prospective shinobi are standing behind them all. Sasuke chances a look behind him and sees that most of the adults are looking at another boy. He is tall, and he has spikier hair than he's ever seen before, but it's the same color as his own. The adults are giving him weird looks, like they're confused or maybe even a little scared. But it's clear that they don't like him much. Young Naruto's dark gray eyes are openly distrustful to every one of them. But he meets their gazes, and his nerve seems to unsettle most of them and they all turn to their own children instead. Over the next few years, Sasuke receives endless support from the villagers of Konoha. Especially in his most trying times. But that has helped him learn that to be treated that way, you must earn Konoha's love through dedication to it. There are wonderful people who are nourished by Konoha and without Konoha they might not exist. Every mite of support he is given is repaid by his service to the village. And when someone puts themselves before the village, they are not treated with the same kindness. Naruto narrows his eyes at the adults who dare to stare him down. They've probably all heard the story about his mother. The woman who put her child before an entire village. Someone who was not enthralled under the spell that is the will of fire. It's his blood. They disdain him for his blood, and his innate power. He serves himself and his family. Ji San, Tsukimi Bakken, the nice lady who works for the Hokage, and the silver-haired guy who gives him shuriken jutsu tips whenever they happen across each other. These people are his, and he gains power for his and their sake. Konoha can't stand people who don't put it before their own personal desires. But there would be no Konoha without people that have ambition and power. He comes to understand that the only thing that they will tolerate is power for their sake. So long as his growing power is in service to the great tree, his selfish tendencies would be indulged. But because he would not openly declare his desire to protect Konoha over all others, he would continue to be treated as an outcast. He would always be the outlier that dares to want something for himself. When someone's being is not wholly dedicated to the system, then they are not treated with the same respect that everyone else receives. Unless their will and power are absolute, that is. Sasuke stares at Haku's body in horrified silence. This boy. He could have had so much more. If only he had dedicated himself to something greater than one man. He could have had an entire village at his back, and now his body is cooling in the misty winds of Nami's unfinished bridge. It's a grim confirmation. Those who put their selfish desires before a greater good are destined for defeat, heartbreak, and death. Naruto frowns at Haku's body. What a waste. He says, while Sasuke is seemingly stuck in thought. A strong shinobi, this boy was. But not strong enough to protect himself and his loved one. Perhaps if he'd have been smart enough to flee or train to become uncontested, then this disaster wouldn't have happened. It jiggles a puzzle piece in his mind that was set not long ago. Those who are weak are destined for death. Those who are strong can have all of their desires, regardless of what is put in their way to stop them. Sasuke clenches his fist while looking at Naruto and Karen from behind. The new redhead girl is clinging to Naruto, and she tosses her headband to the cold forest ground. You would betray your home. For one boy? One distant family member? Instead of earning the support of your home, you leave it behind for the easy solution? He looks at Naruto, and sees another Itachi in the making. Someone who will cause endless destruction and death for no reason other than their own selfishness. Naruto lets Karen hold his arm while they slowly trek to the forest tower. 
This is what he lives for. The reason that he is obsessed with power. To protect his family from all who would mistreat them. He will become strong enough to defy the entire world if he has to. It's within you too, Karen. Naruto thinks fondly while looking down at the redhead. You are willing to defy your village to be with your family. We're alike. Even Sasuke doesn't have that kind of fire in him. She is weak for now, but that can be rectified. Family stands the best chance together, and they'll decimate all who oppose them. It's the day of the final exam. Sasuke looks at himself in the mirror before leaving, and peers into his Sharingan. He's wearing a off-white, high-collared zip coat that is near typical of an Uchiha, complemented by a purple open front apron that is decorated with diamonds on the hem, not unlike his father's attire before the incident. His clan crest is displayed proudly on the back. He thinks about the wonderful people in his life who wouldn't be there if he weren't part of Konoha. Yuito and Himari, Kakashi, Sakura, the kind people that speak to him without condition in the streets. Tsunade, who is handled having people teach him to be on his own. Konoha is full of kind souls that put others before themselves. This place cannot be allowed to fall. I'll end you if you dare point your evil at my home, Naruto. Naruto looks in the mirror, and Karen cutely sticks her head out from behind his back. She sees something she's never seen before on him, the Sharingan. Whoa. Looking good. I know. Naruto gives her a smug look. She pokes her tongue out at him and goes to wait for him at the door. Naruto felt it only fitting that he wear his Uchiha pride on the outside too. His traditional black Uchiha coat that reaches his knees and with its characteristic high collar and clan emblem on its back, makes him truly feel like he is returning to normality. His dark grey pants stand out only slightly as contrast to the black upper wear, with the shins wrapped up in bandages. He throws on his new sandals, and black fabric headband that is nearly indistinguishable from his hair. He thinks about the people in his life that he needs to be strong for. So long as they are alive, then he could find or rebuild a home in the face of adversity. So long as he grows in power, Konoha is just a tool for the sake of protecting his loved ones. Yes, he would serve Konoha, but it's a means to an end. Naruto thinks he's reached a middle ground. His service to Konoha is just about the same as the next average Konoha shinobi. Konoha is the outcome of his desire, not the motivation. I will protect all that is precious to me. Even against the world. Konoha's arena stadium has never been more packed. Every available seat had been booked out as soon as the event had been announced. Foreign dignitaries which included daimyo scouting for capable young shinobi to take on various missions, were placed the most luxurious of boxes to spectate. The sky is cloudy and dark but the excitement for the most spectacular lineup of prospective Chonin ever made everyone forget about the ominous weather. But there is silence. In spite of it being the most looked forward to event in Konoha's history. Those with dojutsu can see it for themselves. There's a rudimentary camera set up to a big screen for spectators that are unequipped with enhanced vision, and everyone now sees the same thing. Naruto and Sasuke stand in opposition to each other. They are the only two in the arena and they are both wielding the Sharingan. Sasuke is shaking and nearly looking ready to break out in a cold sweat. Naruto looks as calm as can be in comparison. I hope you're not going to shake in your sandals for this whole match, Sasuke. Naruto addresses him smoothly. How is this possible? Sasuke demands wildly. Who is your father? It's not my father who I get my Uchiha blood from. Naruto admits, a faint smile ready to break out. My mother was half and half. Her mother was an Uzumaki and her father was an Uchiha who left this village a very long time ago. Sasuke glares, thinking it's a lie. Every Uchiha old enough to be your grandfather would have been hunted down by the village or the Uchiha clan for becoming a traitor. All but one. One too strong for the Uchiha clan, and one too cunning for even the Shodai Hokage to completely defeat. Sarutobi Hiruzen grips the arms of his chair. That's impossible. He looks at the close-up of Naruto's face on the screen and cannot deny the resemblance between him and the terror of a man that nearly brought all of Konoha to destruction on his own. He wouldn't rear a child. Hiruzen mutters. He's unable to see anything but the monster that frightened him as a boy. The man that made him believe that the Uchiha's curse of hatred was a tangible and real threat to the safety of the village. Hiruzen-sama? The former Hokage can't think of a reply to his young clanmate. She's clearly only asking if he's okay but... Naruto's oppressive and dense chakra is revealed. As if a veil over it has finally been released. Uchiha Madara. Faking your own death to get a chance to ruin us again. Your cursed blood plagues this village again. Tsunade shuts her eyes when the moment of clarity hits her. 
the other cage seated beside her leaned forward in interest. Madara truly was powerful and sly to fool even her grandfather. It's really no wonder that Ji-sama and Toburama were fearful of him. Naruto's behavior, appearance and power all converge into something that finally makes sense. Madara's teachings culminating into one boy. Now I know why you kept it secret. She thinks, knowing that Madara had rightfully instilled distrust for Konoha to Naruto. This boy has manipulated the public around him well and become near untouchable by factions in Konoha that would try to obtain his power. Openly making friends with civilians. Defending people against drunk vagrants. Defeating the combined killing intent of many foreign nations shinobi all at once. Proving himself as a trustworthy and dedicated agent of Konoha by being seen getting taught by Kakashi and Jiraiya. Most people are on this mysterious Shinan side, and if news gets out now that someone was trying to keep this power to themselves, a good part of Konoha would be up in arms to protect their new hero. And now the daimyo and neighboring nations are watching too. Good grief. I'll admit it, Sasuke. You weren't my first choice for opponents in this stage. The power I want to use would kill you, the Jinchuriki up there have a better chance of surviving. Naruto explains his discontent, and the matter-of-fact way he said it ground on Sasuke's nerves. I hope that this month has been kind to you. I still need to show off a little bit. Sasuke glares viciously. My resolve has become stronger, I won't let you win so easily. Knowing that Naruto is clearly superior in Taijutsu and the addition of the Sharingan would make things infinitely harder, Sasuke attempts to use his expanded repertoire of ninjutsu off the bat. He shoots through a number of signs. Katan, Hosenka no jutsu. A huge flurry of mini fireballs are spat from his mouth to cover a large area, creating a cone of effect that would ordinarily be hard to dodge. Simultaneously, Sasuke dashes with high speed to one of Naruto's sides and launches a storm of shuriken. He'd used this tactic before against Naruto, but it seems he'd put a Sharingan twist on it, along with strategically thinking that the typical cone of effect from Katan and Futan ninjutsu that Naruto uses wouldn't be enough to block from every side. Shuriken Cage Bunshine Naruto's Sharingan tracks the trajectory and movement of Sasuke's attack. He sees something off about the chakra creating the Shuriken but he opts for the simplest solution, with only one hand seal. Katan, Gokaku no Jutsu Naruto's fireball is fired at the approaching Hosenka, obliterating it and forging a path in which Naruto could move through safely and at speed. Sasuke doesn't remain idle. He runs up the arena wall and tries to gain a high ground advantage. He pulls out a folded Fuma Shuriken from his pouch and multiplies it. He throws them one after the other, using thin cables to control their path and keep a hazard between him and Naruto. The Fuma Shuriken sling back and forth with precision and skirt the arena walls and ground. The Uchiha on the ground looks up at Sasuke and sees that he has a movement advantage. At this distance with Shuriken being pelted around, Sasuke could dodge by running along the wall. Knocking the Shuriken off their path wouldn't be effective seeing as they're attached to cables that would bounce them back into life. And he didn't want to kill Sasuke, so he'd have to make some use of the tool he was here to show off. He looks Sasuke in the eyes. Sharingan, Fusikoi Malfeasance. Most Genjutsu were applied subtly, but not this one. Its singular function was to strip control of the victim's body instead of tricking them. Less subtlety, more power. The victim is fully aware that they aren't in control but being incapable of stopping it without extreme effort of the mind. The Sharingan can see external illusions in the environment, but something attacking them from the inside requires skill and will to defeat. Sasuke's chakra control slips up and he is struggling to stick to the wall. The shuriken all whack into a surface, the replicants of them dispelling. Naruto leaps deftly up the wall and attacks Sasuke with taijutsu. Sasuke manages to throw off the genjutsu, looking quite strained but reels back from Naruto's strikes instead of meeting them. Their Sharingan helps their coordination while fighting on a vertical surface significantly. Naruto chases Sasuke along the arena wall. To the spectators, their fighting styles are telegraphed clearly. Sasuke is intelligent and resourceful, while Naruto is an unstoppable force in motion. Suddenly, Sasuke whips out an exploding tag on a kunai and stabs it behind him to deter Naruto's pursuit. Naruto picks it up and rips the tag off of the kunai. He chases down Sasuke daringly and slaps the tag down on the side of Sasuke's open front apron. Sasuke's eyes widen, hearing the hissing tag. But he thinks quickly and throws off the article of clothing, and weaves some signs that he copied from Naruto in his fight with Lee. Sogo Kawarimi no Jutsu. Mutual Substitution Technique. The real Sasuke is replaced with a Mizu Bunshine. Naruto sees the deception, 
one of the Fuma Shuriken earlier transformed into a weak decoy in the ground to be used as efficient substitution material. Quite a range of ninjutsu. Naruto mentally approves of copying Zabuza's technique. Naruto raises his arms above his head. Futan, Shinku to Baikamu. Wind release, vacuum dive. He pushes down with the wind chakra accumulated on his arms, making a huge crack in the arena wall and sending the detached apron flying. It explodes, leaving another web of cracks further along the wall. The entire stadium is erupting in cheers. Kakashi watches with a wide eye as his students duke it out. Everyone in the stands can be heard speaking about the spectacular showdown. Forget Chonin. These kids fight like freaking Jounin. You can do it, Naruto. Go, Sasuke-kun. I never knew that Uchiha were so gifted. The power of Uchiha ninjutsu. Fufufu. Konoha has quite a few talented shinobi this year. I wonder where Tsunade Dono has been hiding them? He assesses Naruto, who is clearly no worse for wear. And Sasuke, looking frazzled but still in peak fighting condition. Those attacks from Sasuke had exemplified the precise nature of the Sharingan, as well as Naruto's seemingly insurmountable power by comparison with the way he smashes through his opposition's attacks. Kakashi? Shizune asks worriedly from the seat behind him, while Minako looks on with wide-eyed awe at Naruto's pretty new eyes. Kakashi senses the unspoken question. It'll be alright. Kakashi isn't entirely sure anymore but puts it on to ease her worry. The Sharingan. Shizune breaths out in shock. He was an Uchiha this whole time? He never gave us the slightest hint. Kakashi understands that Shizune may be upset at not knowing. Naruto had kept this secret for years. The only thing that could have been construed as a hint is his appearance, but everything else had been in the realm of possibility and somehow, a child had managed to keep a Keke Genkai hidden from everyone. That most likely meant that he was trained and taught how dangerous it would be to show off that power to the wrong people. It unsettles him that a young boy has the force of will to keep such a thing to himself, and it makes him question if he really knew Naruto all along. It's not a nice feeling. Sasuke recomposes himself. So long as he controls the distance between him and Naruto, he'd be able to slowly whittle him down with smart ranged attacks. Too slow. He hears right next to his ear. He whirls and swings a kunai at. Empty air? Sasuke looks back at the wall where Naruto had been perched and sees that he's still there. Genjutsu, Sasuke spat out. Using Genjutsu on a wielder of the Sharingan to prove their prowess with it is greater. Quite the kick in the teeth. He tries to make use of the distance he has and prepares another combination technique. Katen, Hosenka no Jutsu. The small fireballs travel slower, being created with a smaller amount of chakra and purposefully with less velocity. He keeps spitting them out until most of his field of view is covered in the small fireballs. He then whips out another Jutsu, one he'd copied from Naruto. Futan, Teifoika. Wind release, passing typhoon. A gust of wind whips around from his mouth. His control over Futon is weak in comparison to Naruto, but the tailwind he creates behind the fireballs infuses them with wind chakra and causes them to rapidly expand. In an instant, each of the tiny fireballs becomes the size of a Gokaku and create an area of effect that is impossible to escape from without feeling the arena, which Naruto would be disqualified for. With his Sharingan, Sasuke sees Naruto smile. You really are resourceful, Sasuke. Naruto thinks that Sasuke is wise for making use of a Sharingan gift. There's no point in being able to copy Jutsu if you aren't going to use them. He weaves a horse sign, and infuses a massive amount of chakra into his lungs. I hope you can avoid this one, Sasuke. Karen senses the upswing of chakra instantly. I guess he means business. She says, mostly to herself. It amazes her that Naruto's chakra could be so dense and powerful. It was like he is a monster in human skin and Naruto had been getting testy with himself. It figures that he'd want to express the efforts of his years of hard work instead of holding back. What's he doing? Shizun asks of her, knowing the story of her similar sensing ability to Naruto. Karen shrugs nonchalantly. Dunno. But whatever it is, it's gonna be huge. The fireballs are closing in. Naruto doesn't need to dodge. Katen, Goka Mekiaku. The stream of flames is a Katen to end all Katen. It launches from his mouth, the force of it making his hair and coat billow around. It expands rapidly to cover half of his vision and it completely swallows Sasuke's attack as if it never existed. From the spectator's point of view, it looks like imminent death. 
The jutsu is so massive that it would take at least 10 proficient Sutan users to block it. No one would be able to interfere. No time. Sasuke weaves signs and throws away any regard for chakra control, only pumping as much of it that he could into his next jutsu, one from Kakashi this time. Doten, Doryuki. A wall with earth and cat heads on it sprouts out of the ground. It is made by exchanging width for thickness, to try and prevent the concussive force of Naruto's inferno. The flames smash into it, and much of it crumbles. The terrifying blaze coming from either side of the wall is scorchingly hot but the flames do not touch him. It takes up a good quarter of his chakra, but Sasuke knows he saved himself when the wall falls only at the end of Naruto's jutsu. He could end it right now if he wanted to. Kaze Kage Raza comments with a praising tone. This Naruto boy is letting Sasuke show off his own power it seems. A bold move. Tsunade agrees with the assessment. To the trained eye, Naruto is making a statement on the gap in their abilities. If the person who is losing is this powerful, then what further depths are there to the power of the person controlling the fight? Two of the most powerful Janan Konoha has ever seen. Tsunade is nearly rubbing her hands together at the thought of the impending contracts from other nations. The rakage makes no comment, and the leader of Odogakur who is veiled in were similar to that of a cage also remains quiet. His face and body are covered but he has made too many clumsy mistakes for Tsunade to be fooled by who this man is. You'll get yours soon enough, Orochimaru. Tsunade clasps her hands together in a relaxed manner. Naruto contemplates the merits of just doing the same thing. It probably wouldn't look smart but it'd show off how much chakra he has to the sensory inept in the audience. Suddenly, he hears what sounds like chirping. It multiplies dozens of times, and a glow begins to emit from Sasuke's direction. In his palm is lightning. Is that the Chidori? Naruto has never actually seen it before. He only knows the stories of Kakashi's unique jutsu, he didn't witness it get used on Zabuza seeing as he'd been preoccupied. Sasuke walks slowly into the middle of the arena with the Chidori active in his hand. He claps his hands together, causing the Chidori to spread to the other hand. Naruto grins at the challenge and leaps down to the ground. Guy has something to say about that little jutsu. It's completely irresponsible to teach a Janan a jutsu of that level. Kakashi isn't having any of it. You're one to talk. The eight gates you taught to Lee could have killed Naruto, for no other reason that he was jealous of my talented Janan. At least Sasuke has proven thus far that he's a loyal and dedicated shinobi to Konoha and its people. He could very well kill Naruto with a Chidori. Kakashi doubts that. Sasuke may have been doing some unauthorized training to perfect the Chidori to the degree that he could walk around with it instead of requiring linear high speed, but Naruto clearly confident enough that he would be able to take it on. Seeing that Sasuke is controlling the Chidori without any wasted chakra is something of a shock to him though. If Sasuke can manage to master the Chidori in a mere month and is now using it as Taijutsu lethality multiplier, he has no doubt that the boy could eventually surpass him. Naruto better have something up his sleeve that can match it. Blocking palms full of lightning requires a different set of skills than conventional taijutsu. It may very well come down to the Sharingan being the deciding factor in this fight. Naruto thinks that this may be the most dangerous taijutsu battle he'd ever participate in. Sure, it may border on the line of being a nin taijutsu fight, but that's a technicality. It would be a dance to remember. He pulls up both hands and focuses his chakra. Two Rasengan the size of his head form in them, hovering slightly above his palms. Naruto and Sasuke begin to approach each other. It starts out as a walk, then a jog, and then a rush at high speed. Rasengan and Chidori slap off each other. Sparks become streaks of lightning chakra that whip into the ground and leave scars. Naruto's Rasengan does not waver, unless Sasuke hits it directly instead of clipping it then there would be no lock of chakra. Naruto swings his left arm out loosely, making Sasuke reel back at the wrecking ball of an attack. Sasuke makes rapid jabs in Naruto's direction to prevent him from pushing the offensive and it works long enough for Sasuke to ground himself. It didn't take a genius to realize that getting his by either of these jutsu would be very bad. Their wild and swinging attacks at each other looked clumsy on the surface but each action is a combination of Sharingan precision and raw battle instinct. Their footwork and ability to weave around, attack and defend while calculating the next best move is evident to high-ranked shinobi spectating. Naruto slides on the ground with futon-enhanced propulsion, making a double-handed slamming motion to Sasuke's core. Sasuke rolls over it and lands on his hand, creating a small storm that wrecks the ground. He deliberately decreases the chakra flow in order to not sink down by way of penetrating power. Chidori Nagashi 
Once Sasuke pushes his right lightning palm off the ground, a wave of lightning springs in Naruto's direction. Naruto makes a bowling sweep with his left hand and causes the Rasengan in it to collide with the ground. It creates a massive shockwave that rips the ground up and hurls an increasing wave of compressed chakra force that barrels through the lightning and comes to a standstill. It vanishes, but not before leaving a massive chasm in the ground. Cheers erupt at the display, but Naruto and Sasuke steady themselves for one final blow. The Rasengan in Naruto's right hand still glows brightly, and Sasuke's Chidori begins to chirp louder and grows in intensity. Naruto and Sasuke break into a sprint. Their jutsu slam together, causing a shriek to emanate and the chakra clashing between them to become increasingly unstable. A light blue shroud forms around them as the Rasengan and Chidori howl and demand victory over the other. The chakra shroud becomes increasingly dark before it's no longer see-through. The bubble of chakra explodes, causing a massive explosion of lightning chakra in the middle of the arena. Karen jumps in fright at the thundering crack. Naruto? She whispers to herself in concern. The arena is so polluted with dense chakra that she can't sense through the veil. The dust from the explosion had yet to clear. My god. Shizun san mutters at her side, and Minako in her lap is cowed into silence by the noise and is trying to sink into her mother's embrace. The dust begins to settle, and the dense blue lightning infused chakra begins to rise and dissipate into the sky. Dark clouds become stormy. Sasuke looks worse for wear. Naruto is uninjured again, but breathing deeper after the relentless assaults. I hope this is enough to end it. Sasuke says to Naruto, raising his left hand once more and a thin web of lightning that is nearly invisible reaches into the sky. That was the last of your chakra. Naruto recomposes himself and the breathlessness fades away. It would be wiser to surrender now than to attempt anything else. You know me better than that. Sasuke retorts, Sharingan fading into the featureless black of his normal eyes. I do. Naruto agrees. Despite their disagreements, Sasuke admires Naruto's strength and will. He looks up at the sky that looks ready to rain any moment. His unwavering training regime at controlling lightning has left him with the opportunity to test out his prototype ninjutsu. One that summons natural lightning where none is to be found within him. Sasuke has big dreams with this jutsu. A shame he didn't have time to complete it. Chidori Jinrei Thunderclap A massive bolt of lightning shoots down and hits Naruto. Naruto really admires Sasuke's talent and inability to give up. He can sense the storm but the density of chakra in the atmosphere is still deflectable. He could whip up a blast or tornado to defuse or at least deflect the incoming attack. But he respects Sasuke, to come this far without resorting to using that manipulative curse mark. To not demean his choices in front of an audience. To compose himself quickly and be willing to fight against a long-lost relative to the very end. To create and master these terrifying jutsu, and to make use of his gifts without restraint. He wills his eyes into their superior form. Sasuke deserves his defeat to be at the pinnacle of Uchiha power. Susano. The lightning bolt struck the dead center of the arena where Naruto had been standing. A slight drizzle followed the deafening crack and the dust that had once been the ground was still wisping around where Naruto should be. Everyone in the stadium watches with bated breath. Some of them are sure that Sasuke's attack would have killed Naruto. Naruto's voice booms throughout the stadium and an ominous chakra reverberates in the atmosphere. Susano. A pair of glowing golden eyes can be seen clearly through the dust. A light blue glow becomes increasingly visible around the eyes and forms into something humanoid, albeit massive. Yasaka no Magadama. Several blue blurs launch out of the dust cloud, leaving long streaks behind them. Sasuke tries his best to dodge but ends up being hit by one, sending him flying back into the arena wall. He coughs up a bit of blood from the impact and tries to right himself. He tries to reach to the sky again and call down another bolt, but the remainder of the chakra sputters in his hand and dies out instantly. An inhuman growl comes from the massive being. Grouf. Sasuke chokes back his fear as best he can. He pulls out a kunai with a wire and lines it with explosive tags. He throws it desperately at the shrouded figure. Subsequent explosions are loud but seemingly have no effect on the construct. The construct raises what appears to be an arm, and it sprouts a sword in its hand. It sweeps its arm down and causes an shockwave that dissipates the dust surrounding it and launches invisible force at Sasuke. Sasuke leaps with all his strength to get out of the way. He stumbles on the ground, and takes in the appearance of this being of chakra. This skeletal thing is somewhat humanoid, a torso that glowed with light blue chakra and stood several stories tall. 
Ominous yellow orbs peer out of a jagged toothed skull, adorned with two pointed horns from what would be its hairline. Nearly there. Naruto says to himself, clenching his fists while his hair flicked around wildly. The creature begins to form muscle and skin, the shroud of chakra emanating from its body and building more onto the Susano. The head of a dragon not dissimilar from his chains, swallows the horned head like a hood and further constructs its face. The Susano begins to look more alive, though its horns and two arms on each shoulder joint give away its demonic nature. Sasuke trembles with his back to the wall. He shakily stands while he takes in the terrifying monster. It lights up the dark arena, and the puddles created by the rain reflect the brightness of Naruto's fiendish creation. Mengeku Sharingan? Who did you murder to get this power? Sasuke asks fearfully. The mark on his shoulder shoots pain through his body. Not now. Naruto takes no note of his agony. I didn't murder anyone to obtain this power, Sasuke. My grandfather made the ascension for me. A black flame pattern emerges from Sasuke's curse mark. He tries his best to force it down, but with no chakra of his own to suppress it, it spreads with little restraint. Rage and hate fill his mind. He knows that it is not his, but the mark affects his mind too greatly for him to understand. It is a subtle thing that preys on his inner turmoil. He weaves his signs again. Chidori. Naruto frowns at him, his strangely patterned Sharingan copying Kakashi Jutsu. Sasuke uses all the strength and chakra that the mark has given him and launches a final assault. The darkened Chidori slams against Naruto's Susano. It does nothing. He looks Naruto in the eyes and fear overtakes him once more. You're my family, Sasuke. So let me help you out a bit. Tsukiyomi. Sasuke wakes in a realm of pure white. He is completely uninjured and his curse mark isn't affecting his mind, seemingly. Welcome to Tsukiyomi, Sasuke. This is a world of Genjutsu, in which I control everything that you can perceive. He turns more calmly than he expected to the voice behind him. I have been its victim once before. Sasuke spits out. My brother used this to show me how he brutally murdered everyone in the Uchiha clan. Then you may understand a piece of its potential. Naruto is unaffected by the vitriol, and keeps a cool manner despite it. It's not a torture jutsu, it's the most flexible genjutsu there is. With this, we have some time to speak privately. You have much to learn about the nature of the Sharingan, and how I came to be. The surrounding white turns into something more organic, and Sasuke sees a man nearly identical to Naruto shake hands with the Shodai Hokage. Like all Genjutsu, Tsukiyomi implants chakra into its victim. It's like a timer, once that chakra is used up, the Genjutsu will release. If I cancel this jutsu early however, some of my chakra will remain behind. Since it's not yours, it will be eaten up by your body very quickly. I'll finish this so that my chakra will overcome the curse mark. After that, it's back in your hands. In the real world, Sasuke collapses in a faint and the curse mark completely recedes back into its normal state. Naruto Susano dispels slowly into blue flecks, dissipating into the atmosphere. You are worthy of the Uchiha name. Naruto says to the unconscious boy. The proctor leaps down from his safe hiding spot and declares the victor. Winner, Uchiha Naruto. Tsunade watches the uninjured Naruto follow the medics who take Sasuke away to the stadium infirmary. Mengeku Sharingan. She thinks with a sense of foreboding. A very rare power that is not easy to control, and yet Naruto had flaunted it as if it were child's play. Hiding the Sharingan was a bit unnecessary. Hiding the Mengeku is a different kettle of fish altogether. Naruto has made a statement today. He has shown the world that the Uchiha clan is not so easily defeated, and that the cursed blood runs stronger than ever. She turns to the Kazekage. Well, that was quite the opening match. Tsunade keeps the smugness buried. Indeed. Raza says thoughtfully. I would hazard to say that those boys are well above what a Chonin would ordinarily be capable of. That Naruto won even more so. And you, Rakage? Tsunade questions the man who's been quite thus far. A frowns, not giving away anything other than annoyance at the prospect of conversation with Superior Cage. The day is young yet. Kumagakur has time to show its prospective Chonin off. Of course. It's not every exam that a Jinchuriki competes. Tsunade happily gives away the fact that she knows about Yugito's Jinchuriki status. The Rakage's brow twitches, but he says nothing more. In the arena, the examiner summons the next participants. Ni Yugito and Hayuga Neji, please come forward. Dosu makes a signal to the shadows behind him, unseen to the other exam participants. 
he subtly takes off his auto headband, and replaces it with one denoting allegiance to Konoha. His signal has made sure that his teammates do the same, and to let them ready up for the impending conflict. The three Suna siblings exit the same way that Yugudo did. Across the way in one of the spectator stands, Jiraiya taps Karen's shoulder. That's our cue. Time to go. Karen takes a shaky breath. Yugito bites her lip as she watches Naruto walk away with the medics. Her task is clear, but she doesn't know the stadium halls at all given the increased security in the facility. The signal is set to come any minute now. She can't afford to let the opportunity slip up to destroy the Uchiha. I surrender. Yugito shouts, and leaves through the contestants' box entrance. Hayate nods, and summons the next contestants despite the roaring boo. Aburame Shino and Haruno Sakura. Amaterasu. Black flames erupt on Kabuto's body, making him scream in agony. The other medics cringe at the volume but continue their work on converting as much of their chakra that they can into Sasuke's unconscious form. Jiraiya Sama was right. One of them tries to keep her cool over the fact that the leak had been in plain sight all along. Naruto doesn't let them ponder it for too long. Keep moving, unless you want to fight a Jinchuriki in this enclosed space. You know the plan? Sasuke and I are the bait. Once we're out in the open, you four will return to the medic station and prepare for more injured Konoha Shinobi. Right. The medic's chorus, getting back to work to heal Sasuke up back to full strength. If he'd paid closer attention, he would have noticed that the facial skin of Kabuto core had shed and revealed an already dead and pale Anbu. A genjutsu befalls the stadium, the clear source being the spectating Otto Jounin. Tsunade and Raza turn and give each other sly smiles. It seems that Orochimaru understands he doesn't have any time left to act. Ten Otto Chonin follow the Suna siblings. Their only order is to agitate the Aichibi enough to make it go on a rampage. They do not notice the bells nailed to the walls. All of them drop to their knees when their ears start bleeding from a horrible shrieking noise. Their senses are so rattled that they are rendered completely immobile. Zankua. Brutal airwaves shred the skin off their bodies, and they are left to die a quick and bloody death. The stadium quickly dissolves into a mess of skirmishes when the Genjutsu knocks out the civilian and daimyo populace. Sakura and Shino are accosted by the other two competing Kumo Jinan. Otto Shinobi moved to back them up, with so many skilled Jounin presented as become an impossible task. Kakashi and Guy are the first to defend them from a wave assault, holding everyone back with ease befitting their known abilities. Sakura, Shino. Get out and assist the evac teams. We'll hold things down here. Kakashi orders. Right. Sakura nods, taking Shino and running up the walls and out of the stadium. Orochimaru and Reikage deftly move to the main rooftop with Tsunade and Raza in pursuit. Kukaku, I see you're somewhat prepared for this, my dear teammate. Orochimaru sheds his disguise and stands before the cage in all his sickly looking self. And you haven't learned that mistakes against Konoha will always come back to bite you. Tsunade glares him down. You are going to die today, Orochimaru. All of your ambition will serve as fuel to show the world that Konoha is eternally unassailable. You will find that I have a few tricks up my sleeve, Tsunade. Orochimaru smiles, and a powerful purple barrier emerges on the rooftop. The roof is submerged further into darkness. Kushios, Edo Tensei. Three coffins rise up from the tiles. They read Sha Daim, Nai Daim, and Yondaime. The coffin lids open, and three perfect puppet copies of the deceased Hokage fall out. The Kaze Kage notes that the Yondaime's hair is just a mop dipped in yellow paint. Raza chuckles, gold dust leaking from the roof and swirling up around him. My boy has quite a talent with puppetry. Orochimaru is taken aback by the development. The wicked gleam in Tsunade's eyes intensifies. That's the problem with betraying your subordinates. Sometimes. They find a way to bite back. Naruto senses the squad of Kumo Jounin pursuing them through the streets. Sasuke is hobbling but conscious. He's not in fighting condition but they still need to rendezvous with Karen and Jiraiya. Sasuke's chakra has been restored to full on Naruto's orders, knowing that his ninjutsu would be more effective than his taijutsu. He has Sasuke guide the civilians through the evacuation routes while he keeps the jounin occupied. He's a dojutsu wielder. You know what to do. One of the five jounin makes the decision to go through one of their anti-dojutsu protocols. Keep going. Naruto barks at Sasuke. All five assailants weave their signs at once. Their skin begins to glow brightly. Raiden, Regan Reikachu. The bright flash forces him to close his eyes and rely on his sensing power, 
but he knows that the light will hinder the untrained civilian runners. He uses a jutsu that he just copied from Sasuke, slapping his palms down on the road. Doten, Doryuaki. A wall of earth emerges from the ground, adorned with various dragon heads similar to his chains and katan ninjutsu. It blocks the light in the street, but the Nibi Jinchuriki has arrived sooner than expected. Naruto leans back to avoid elongated claws and is forced to continue dodging them. His Sharingan allows him to see the strikes and move around them with precision. He notes that the Jinchuriki's eyes have changed color. Her right eye is yellow and the left is green. Naruto can feel the Nibi's chakra cycling through her quicker than before. Yugito's attacks are as vicious as one might expect. You're gonna die here, Uchiha boy. Yugito hisses, with red chakra bubbling out of her rapidly. At least he has the motive for the attack now. She's after him, meaning that he can take her away from evacuation pathways. Unfortunately, he still has to worry about the Jounin on the other side of the wall that will try and impede his sight. The earth wall begins to crumble rapidly, catching them both by surprise. It dissolves rapidly until it's nothing but sand. The sand moves with a will of its own and swallows up the Kumo Jounin. Sabaku Q. A malicious young voice calls out, and the Kumo squad becomes a shower of gore that drops out of a giant ball of sand. Aichibi Jinchuriki. Naruto counts himself lucky for the intervention. It would make getting to Karen that much quicker. He leaps deftly and dashes across the rooftops of Konoha at top speed. Yugito's demonic chakra has enhanced her enough that she can keep pace with him. Naruto is forced to dodge giant blue fireballs as he kites Yugito away. He wants to take the battle to her, but he has his task and can't afford to fail after he openly gave away that he would leave the village if Konoha didn't allow him to keep Karen. He must seal the Nibi, and with as few casualties as possible. Full squads of Otto and Kumo Joint's forces try to halt him, but he burns them away with liberal use of Katan and smacks them down with Susano fists. More fireballs are forcing him to strafe in order to avoid them, making him slow down. He's only at the halfway point between himself and Jiraiya, but so long as he avoids the claws and the flames, he'll get there eventually. Or would have, if a shinobi hadn't burst out of some roof tiles and started firing bone projectiles out of his fingers. Naruto's brow creases in anger. Karen senses Naruto's rage through his chakra, but she and Jiraiya are tangling with giant snakes. Old man. Karen starts to stress out. Jiraiya makes his own noise of annoyed exertion. Kushios, Yatai Kazushi no Jutsu. Karen is suddenly aware that she's several stories higher than the surrounding buildings, and a three-headed snake is suddenly underneath a gigantic toad. More snakes appear around them in clouds of white smoke. Karen spots groups of auto shinobi using combination summoning to churn out as many summons as possible. We're stuck. Karen is nearly hyperventilating, realizing that their part of the plan is in shambles. Jiraiya grabs Karen's smaller frame and slides down the back of the toad. They land on the ground, hidden in the shadow of the giant beast. The redhead feels Jiraiya's chakra swell enormously. Kushios no Jutsu. Jiraiya slams his hands down on the ground, and two more massive toads appear. I leave it to you. Jiraiya shouts to the toads, picking her up again and making a getaway. Tell me where he is. That way. Karen points to where Naruto's violent chakra is coming from. Naruto feels the Kaguya's chakra grow in power, nearly identically to the way Sasuke's did when using the curse mark. He assesses Yugito's seal with his Sharingan and sees that it's wrenching chakra forcefully from the Nibi. I can stop them from getting stronger if I negate those seals. Naruto sprouts light blue chains from his back and sends them directly at his opposition. Yugito's outright cat-like reflexes and agility cause her to dodge with little effort and she continues to rampage across the roof. He is about to leap away when he finds himself stuck. The Kaguya has pinned down a chain using bones and runs directly at him. Naruto weaves some signs to get at least one of the immediate threats away from him. Futan, Daitapa. A shockwave hits Yugito head-on, but she digs her elongated claws down to stop herself from flying away. Naruto extends the end of the pin chain and has the dragon head pull out the bone. The chain tosses it back at Kimimaro, who deflects it with bone protrusions from his back without stopping. Naruto retracts his chains to preserve chakra and forms a Rasengan in each hand. He waves his Rasengan at Kimimaro, and the Kaguya's eyes widen when the jutsu smashes through the hard bone. He's forced to create more out of his ribs to put as much resistance between his body and the destructive jutsu. The Rasengan connects with the bone shield and sends the white-haired Otto Shinobi flying across the roof. Yugito pounces while his back is turned, but Naruto drops on his back and lets the claws fly over his lying self. 
his remaining Rasengan sweeps under Yugito's legs, who nimbly leaps over it and spins in the air, launching another set of claws down at his vulnerable position. Exactly how he'd planned. Naruto looks Yugito in the eyes and paralyzes her with a Sharingan. In the split second it takes for her to break out, a chain is already wrapped around her legs and chest and suppressing the Baijuu chakra. Kimimaro is running to hit Naruto while he's distracted, but it is cut off by Sasuke wielding his Chidori. Do it, Naruto! Sasuke shouts, keeping the Kaguya momentarily occupied. Burning kanji form on the tips of Naruto's fingers. Gagio Fun. He pushes his fingers on top of Yugito's seal and completely halts the flow of Baijuu chakra. Yugito keels over in agony and her eyes return to their normal dark state. She faints on the spot. Yugito. Her Jounin leader is on the scene, but Naruto has had enough of the interference. Uchiha Kenjin. A huge fiery barrier separates Naruto, Sasuke and Kimimaro from the rest of the village. Sasuke. Keep the Jinchuriki safe, I'll handle the Kaguya. Right. Sasuke nods, letting his Chidori sputter out to conserve his chakra. Pillars of bones are erupting out of the roof but Sasuke tracks the moving tiles with his Sharingan to determine where they spike out from. With Yugito on his shoulder, he finds a safe spot in the barrier to hide. Damn it. Sasuke hears the Kumo Jounin curse from outside the barrier. I knew we should have brought B. Everyone, work on taking down the barrier and kill Yugito so Konoha doesn't obtain the Nibi. Naruto runs straight at Kimimaro and foregoes any restraint. He overhears Daru and needs to act fast. Susano. Naruto's initial ribcage form with arms is summoned and whirls around with a blade in each hand, mowing down the field of bones. Bones are poking at his feet, causing him to jump and give Kimimaro a shot at him while he's airborne. Saarabi no Mai. Kimimaro's skin darkens when the curse mark fully overtakes his body. A huge lance of bone from his arm slams into the ribcage, causing it to crack. Understanding that this curse mark has clearly enhanced the Kaguya to an insane degree, Naruto realizes that conventional ninjutsu will not be effective. Amaterasu. Black flames burn away at the lance and spread to the main body. Kimimaro howls in anger and pain but doesn't cease. He sheds a layer of bone from his body, letting the unholy black flames drop off of him at the cost of a significant amount of chakra. He's not trying to catch me alive. Naruto thought, knowing that the boy wouldn't have intel from Orochimaru to capture him instead so he could get another Uchiha. You're persistent. Naruto praises, landing and forcing his Susano to repair and grow. And you are an obstacle. Kimimaro snarls with blood flying from his lips. Naruto manifests his half-body Susano and smashes his blades down at Kimimaro. The Kaguya blocks as best he can, but he's already low on chakra and the twin attack shreds the bone off of his body. The Kaguya makes one last stand. Come. Naruto beckons with respect. I will give you a worthy death. His battle cry would be remembered by Naruto, even as he bisects him horizontally with a bright blade. A is not an adept sensor, but even he feels when the Nibi chakra dissipates. Orochimaru, A is on his back foot from Tsunade's outright relentless punches. Drop the barrier. The snake Sanin sees Sarutobi Hiruzen waiting outside for it to drop. The old man is dressed in full battle regalia, and there is very little of a weary old man in that visage. He looks like a man with his heart and mind concluded. We are both dead if I do that. Orochimaru refuses, retching out a sword from his mouth. The Kusanagi extends toward Tsunade, who catches it between her hands. Her superior strength stops her from being moved. She whips her hands to the side and forces Orochimaru to swing around. The rakage launches as Tsunade, but a tornado of glimmering gold dust pummels him away. Orochimaru is forced to let go of the sword, and it clatters at Tsunade's feet. A huge plume of smoke emerges in the distance, and a loud natural trumpeting of a rare summon echoes across the village. Orochimaru smirks. Looks like Donzo has too much at stake not to act. On the outside, Sarutobi recognizes the creature immediately and abandons his watch of the barrier. Jiraiya and Karen are suddenly swept away by a massive wind vacuum. Ranjishigami no jutsu. Jiraiya's hair whips around and extends in different directions, grabbing hold on to anything he could while keeping Karen on his back. But the wind force is so great that the buildings themselves are dismantling and being pulled towards the source. The elephant creature eats everything and shoots out the dust through its trunk. Jiraiya realizes that if this thing moves, it will eat the surrounding Konoha shinobi that are trying to escort him to Naruto. He needs to immobilize the creature to protect them. Doten, Yomi Numa. 
Several buildings have their foundations turned to mud but the swamp created completely submerges the legs of the Baku. G. San. There's someone Karen tries to warn, but there's another old man behind them using hand signs. Futan, Shinku Rinpa. Colossal force slams into them, and Jiraiya's hair jutsu isn't enough to stop them from flying straight towards Baku's mouth. Enma. Hiruzen arrives on the scene, and he throws a staff into the Baku's teeth. The staff transforms into a cage, trapping Jiraiya and Karen inside of it but being too large to fit in the gaping maw. Jiraiya seizes the opportunity and uses Katan to great effect. The Baku can't stand the fire mixing with wind and dispels to fight another day. The staff cage lands in the mud. Saritobi pulls them out by using the mud for another jutsu. Doten, Doryu Dan. A mud dragon picks up the cage, dumping it behind Saritobi before launching in Danzo's direction. The staff transforms and lands back in Sarutobi's waiting arms. Jiraiya curses his luck. Shit, this is bad. Indeed, Sarutobi's eyes narrow at Donzo's Sharingan, seeing one in his right eye and another ten in a pasty white right arm. Kill the girl. Donzo orders, pleasantries forgotten. Jiraiya charges a Rasengan in his hand and throws Karen off of his back. Before he can hit her, Hiruzen uses Enma to send him flying behind some building debris. You ingrate. Hiruzen snarls at his oldest friend. The toad Sanin leaps back into the fray, to Karen's nervousness but he seems right of mind this time. As soon as I was out of his sight, I snapped out of it. Jiraiya assesses the power of Donzo's Sharingan. And he didn't use it on both of us at once, Hiruzen nods. And he's not using it now. There is a cooldown period in which he can't use it again, and he can only use it on one person. Get to Naruto. Jiraiya orders Karen, who nods and runs away immediately. As expected of you, Sandaime Hokage. Danzo's grizzled voice is bitter. After only seeing it once, you deduce the weakness of this Koto Amatsukami. But you will find that reality can be changed to suit me, and my reality is that I will be Hokage before this day is done. Hiruzen scoffs. Over my dead body. Naruto deactivated his Sharingan to conserve what chakra he has for the ceiling. The barrier he put up had taken a significant portion of his chakra, and consistent use of the Mangekyu Sharingan to create controlled black flames hadn't helped in the slightest. But as powerful as the barrier is, it is not invincible. It is primarily a katanjutsu after all, designed to burn away at physical attacks. Rantan, raises Akasu. Daru's blue lasers pelt the barrier and make it crack. Karen is so far away, they'll break through and kill the girl before I conceal. Naruto thought with increasing frustration. Those lasers would penetrate any physical object they put between them and the attacker, and letting the girl die before sealing the Nibi isn't an option. Options are becoming more and more limited the longer he has to wait. Trying to control the Nibi after releasing it would leave the risk of it being sealed again by the Kumo squad. Sharingan induced control did not grant immunity to sealing, Senju Hashirama proved as much. He doesn't have enough chakra left to counterbalance the Baijuu chakra. He would die if he sealed it in himself. The barrier will break soon. Think, think, think. Another crack. We're almost there. Daru inspires his men with his efforts, and they all ready up with a cheer. There is only one person in range that is suitable for the task. Only one with enough chakra to seal the Nibi in time to save themselves. Sasuke. Come up here. His Uchiha clan mate does so, dropping Yugito's unconscious body between them. This is bad. Sasuke observes the cracks in the barrier. Look at me. Naruto's voice is deadly serious, more serious than he'd ever been in his life. Sasuke straightens, and looks him in the eyes. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to protect Konoha? Out of my way. Karen's fighting ability is limited but she kicks away an assailant with surprising strength for her size. Hayuga Neji and his father by her side in an instant. Quickly, young Uzumaki. Hizashi pushes the air itself and makes a shockwave that annihilates Kumo and Otto Shinobi alike. Right. Karen is already running as fast as she can. What is that? Neji points out a chakra mass in front of them. Karen's eyes widen. Hiruzen and Jiraiya manage to exhaust Danzo's supply of reality-bending Sharingan at the cost of many injuries and nearly all of their combined chakra. Having to constantly push each other out of the way and block Danzo's line of sight has exemplified their student-teacher bond and teamwork. I am putting an end to this, once and for all. Hiruzen sneers in disgust at the massive Makutan tree that was once Donzo's arm. As am I. Donzo pulls one kunai out and calls up razor-sharp wind. 
The Baiju chakra is becoming an oppressive heat in the atmosphere, but the veterans do not falter for a second. They charge each other and in an instant, they are both disarmed of their weapons. Hiruzen stabs him through the heart with Donzo's own discarded kunai, picked up with the little chakra he had left using his foot. Ura Shishu. Donzo's final act is one of mutually assured death. Gagio Fun. Jiraiya stops the ceiling, but Donzo pulls out the kunai as with one final roar, cut straight into Hiruzen's side. The old Hokage keels over, looking at the body of his old friend. Sensei. Jiraiya rushes to his side. My boy. Sarutobi coughs up blood. Protect. I will. Jiraiya chokes up, and moves to rejoin Karen. Sarutobi smiles in content. He fades from the world of the living, knowing that he has died lucky and knowing that he has protected the great tree. Yugido is strung up by thin chains behind Naruto. In one great pull, the entirety of the Nibi emerges from her body and gives a howl. Sasuke stands at the ready, but his eyes are wide in fear at the monster. The chains expand and wrap around the Nibi, halting its movement for a mere second. Naruto is rushing through all the signs before the Nibi is even out. The barrier shatters. Kill them. The Kumo Shinobi charge. Do it now, Naruto. Sasuke screams at him. Haki no Funshiki. There is a pause, and a blast of Baiju Chakra whips around and stops the Kumo Shinobi's movement. Fun. Naruto is completely spent from the ceiling, but the Nibi shrinks and becomes one with Sasuke. He collapses and looks at Sasuke, trying to see if he would be in any condition to protect them. Sasuke's red Sharingan is active, but his clear eye matched the heterochromia of the Nibi. The seal on his shoulder tries to spread, but it burns from vicious blue flames and vanishes from his skin. Sasuke weaves the signs for the Gokaku and howls. Katan, Kasha Gokaku. A massive blue fireball is the answer the Kumo squad receives for their efforts. Naruto leaps away as soon as giant blue fireballs and flamethrowers start cooking the Kumo Nin alive. The one with the rant in Keke Genkai has fled, clearly understanding that an Uchiha Jinchuriki may be too much to handle at present. He is in top physical condition, just without any chakra. He'd be able to fend off incoming enemies but it always helps to be able to use ninjutsu. Naruto. Karen has finally arrived, with two Hyuga and a battered Jiraiya. You're too late. Naruto shakes his head. I had to act. You didn't Jiraiya realizes what's happened when he spots Sasuke ripping enemy Nin to shreds with long claws. Naruto nods stoically. Sasuke was the only one nearby. He could die, Naruto. No. He is strong enough. Jiraiya and Karen watch as Sasuke uses the Baiju Chakra to great effect. The seal is only partially open. Enough to put him into an initial Jinchuriki form but not enough to be possessed by the Nibi. I need to find a medic right now to restore my chakra, so I can repair the seal remotely if things get out of hand. What happens now? Karen asks Naruto, clinging to Naruto now that they're reunited. With you? Nothing. Konoha has its Jinchuriki. What we need to focus on right now repelling this invasion. Karen rolls up her sleeve and offers her arm to him. Naruto gives her a look that makes her feel guilty for trying. I sent my medic team to one of the evacuation exits, we'll head there and convert some of your chakra to me. Medics can do it more efficiently than through a bite. The group of five watch Sasuke use Chidori Nagashi in every direction, making it known just how much the Nibi is increasing his power. And besides, you don't have enough chakra to fully restore me to the point that I can defend everyone against that. Let him have his fun for now. I'm gonna check on Tsunade. Jiraiya goes his own way instead. Naruto thinks he must have been a bit rattled by something on his way to the designated ceiling area. Naruto and the remaining squad members do not falter on their way to the medics. If I may ask Naruto-san, why are you so low on chakra? My understanding is that you normally have as much as Hokage-sama. Neji quizzes him, not understanding how that chakra could simply vanish. Now is not the time, my boy. Hizashi reprimands lightly. It's fine. Naruto would have waved it off if you weren't running. Baiju are entities of chakra. You probably didn't see the four-story flaming cat just now, but it takes a heavy toll to control chakra with chakra. Sealing one of the most powerful beings in the world has drained me dry. I had to fight some powerful shinobi to even get that to the point that I could safely extract the nibi from its previous jinchuriki. A creature of that power, Hizashi mutters. Now in the hands of Uchiha Sasuke. He will be a formidable shinobi. The four soon arrive at an exit near the Hokage Tower that leads through the mountain, 
only to find a large number of dead Konoha shinobi and civilians. What happened here? Neji looks angered at the innocent casualties. They see a squad of ten Anbu in unidentifiable masks, showing no allegiance to any village. They are all outfitted in similar black gear, sporting short tip Tanto. And an uninjured Yakushi Kabuto. I killed you. Naruto narrows his eyes. Kabuto smiles slyly. Even your legendary senses can be fooled. And now, you're quite vulnerable. The Hyuga parent activates his Byakugan. Unfortunate that he is under my protection then. The worst nightmare of any medical ninjutsu specialist is someone who can take their chakra away from them. And you will find that I am not so easily defeated. Orochimaru sama taught me personally. Then more valuable will my victory be. Naruto wants to jump in. He knows that his superior taijutsu ability will be of use but he also has to be mindful and defend Karen, whose combat capability is lacking. He instead waits for them to come to him. I really think that you should bite now. Karen insists fearfully. A conflicted scowl crosses his face. He knows that despite this Hyuga man's skill, he and his son will eventually be overwhelmed by the numbers. Naru, Karen's voice is softer now. This is the first time I've ever done this of my own choice. For your sake and mine, please save us. Anger is bubbling up in him. These invaders have forced him to do something that he didn't want to. They have robbed his family of agency. I will find a way to get rid of these damn scars. Naruto promises, eyes flaring with a signature crimson glow before fading to grey. I know. Karen offers her arm. Don't let him heal. Kabuto orders the Anbu. Naruto bites into Karen's arm. She reels in pain, but forces as much chakra into the wound that she can manage. The Sharingan comes back in Mangekyu form. Light blue chakra flares up around him and begins to form as Susano. Karen's chakra is drained and Naruto is back at quarter strength. A wide sweep of his ethereal sword demolishes the Anbu with ease, and he begins a pursuit of pure hatred against the man that dared to put Karen at risk. His Susano begins to grow taller, and it soon becomes dramatically more mobile with the addition of legs. The rakage does not heal from his wounds like Tsunade does. What little advantage they might have had instantly vanishes when Tsunade unleashes the seal on her forehead. It heals her wounds in seconds, and it does not matter how many times that Orochimaru cuts into her with that telekinetically controlled sword, she is back at them tirelessly. Raza is playing support instead of engaging them. He lets Tsunade take them both on while intervening when it matters the most. The heavy gold dust is far harder to burst through than A expected and it never fails to stop him in his tracks. His linear fighting style is ordinarily too powerful to counter, but Tsunade is far stronger than he expected. This whole invasion was meant to be easy. The fact that Tsunade is nearly taking on two cage-level shinobi nearly on her own is infuriating to A, and he refuses to take responsibility for Orochimaru's failures. He sees now that the Sanin has used his efforts for a more subtle and small time and instead of a grand conflict to finally bring down the giant that is Konoha. So he needs to get out of here before Tsunade kills him. At least then he can fight another day. Kumagakur can't afford to lose another rakage to this cursed village. Even Jiraiya is circling the barrier, though he's seemingly reserving his strength for when it drops and is hiding from everyone else on the outside. Once I get out of this barrier, I can take some trophies on my way back. At least Tsunade won't be able to stop me once I'm out. Collecting some Hyuga or Uchiha on his way out of the village would be beneficial at least. They could be broken into servitude to Kumo. He could speedily collect some of them and order the retreat while Konoha is occupied with Orochimaru's forces. Hopefully Yugito has left one of them alive. It seems that I've overestimated our chances of success, Orochimaru has not worn his sickly smile since his failure to reanimate his trump cards. No matter. I will still have what I want. I have eternity to achieve it, after all. Running when the going gets tough? I should have expected as much from your kind of filth. Orochimaru forms a snake sign in response to Tsunade's vitriolic words, and the four shinobi maintaining the barrier begin to undergo a transformation. Tsunade sprints at him and punches him in the chest and the sheer force rips his upper body off of his legs. There is not a drop of blood. Orochimaru's body puts itself back together with snakes. Disgusting creature. Raza's lips curl in a mild sneer. On the outside, Daru stops his rant and jutsu when the auto spy arrives on the scene. Yakushi? Why are you here? Kabuto doesn't look confident when he points in the direction of Naruto's full body Susano, taking casual steps over the buildings and generally giving off the air of him being a predator that's playing with his food. You let it here? Daru demands an answer from who he perceives to be an idiot. This whole invasion is a bust. 
it's time for our ship to set sail. The Susano arrives and stands in the middle of the stadium. Yakushi. Naruto's voice booms, and the Susano raises its sword and gives a great hammering slash at him. A stream of blue follows the blade, smashing down into the barrier and causing it to gain an open scar. The Susano sword melts from the strong energy of the barrier, but Naruto simply wills another one in its place. The barrier heals, but the destructive power has been noted and Orochimaru agrees that it's time to cut their losses. Barrier down. Orochimaru orders, weaving signs and leaping to the side of the purple haze that would give him the fastest route away from the village. Kushios, Sanjuu Rashomon. Three gates are summoned between him and Tsunade, giving him and his squad the chance to flee. Naruto summons another sword into the left hand of his Susano and gives a double slice, making a crumbling blast of force. When the Rashomon have disappeared, it becomes clear that Orochimaru and his posse have fled through a large tunnel created by a snake that burrowed its way under the village. The Rakage and Daru follow immediately once they realize that there is no hope of completing any extra requisition plans they might have had. Damn it. Tsunade howls in fury. Naruto. Kill every Kumo shinobi you see. Naruto's righteous anger motivates his undying hatred of the invaders. He and Karen are nested in the stomach of his imperfect Susano, and many watch on worriedly as his rage grows. Tsunade summons Katsuyu to dispense aid across the village while Jiraiya delivers her the bad news. To the common shinobi, the repelling of the invasion was a massive success. Naruto and Tsunade disagree. Too much was lost and not enough was gained. There will be retribution. Chapter 10, Conspiracy. Are you ready, Karen? Naruto's voice summons her from elsewhere in the apartment. Yup. Karen chirps back at him, straightening the ponytail she'd put her hair in and tucking her bangs back neatly. Naruto had asked her a few weeks prior to get an eye test with a doctor that he seemingly trusts. The reason he gave her was straightforward, if your eyes are damaged, then I can fix them. An Uzumaki's body is meant to be free from the flaws that many normal people possess. He finds it hard to believe that someone with chakra as powerful as hers, civilian or otherwise, would have eyesight so bad that she is essentially crippled without her spectacles. His grandfather apparently taught him the delicate nature of healing damaged eyes, and for good reason. Naruto wouldn't be helpless without his sight, but he'd certainly be less capable. Ever since the conclusion of the Chonin exam invasion, Naruto had been getting sent out constantly on missions as a team leader. Their iteration of Team 7 hadn't officially been dissolved but they all had little time to spend with each other when their skills were required elsewhere. Not that they didn't spend time together, but Naruto and Sasuke have especially busy schedules. Two Jounin and two Chonin on one squad is a bit unnecessary. If Naruto's prediction of a retaliation war occurred, Skilled and confident ranked officers would be needed in the upcoming conflicts in order to replace the older and weary shinobi left over from the last war, QB attack, and most recent invasion. Plus, Naruto had been spending an excessive amount of time studying medical ninjutsu with the little free time he had. There is always a cage bunshine of him at home toiling over borrowed scrolls, and he would only tell her that it's going to be a surprise. He insisted on teaching her that jutsu as well, to accelerate his training of her in order to defend herself from undesirables. She has an unshaking admiration of Uzumaki Kushina from Jiraiya's stories of her, and who better to help live up to her role model than her son who'd inherited that burning ambition. Of course, her clanmate coaches her in the correct use of the cage bunshine no jutsu by providing a succinct and accurate answer as to why she shouldn't make hundreds of them when she clearly can. Cage bunshine get dumber with the more you make, Naruto says, not looking up from his book on flesh rejuvenation with Irio ninjutsu. They are composed entirely of chakra, and that chakra is required for their brain to function and return memories to the original user of the jutsu. If you make too many clones, you'll just spawn a bunch of idiot versions of yourself that can't actually comprehend what you're trying to learn. Can at most if you're not in a fight, Karen. Dogpiling Naruto with a bunch of her own self is still fun. Are you ready or not, woman? Karen rolls her eyes with a huff and smile. I'm coming, hold your horses. She hollers at him. She gives herself a cursory glance in the mirror to make sure she's living up to her own vanity. One quick tug on her pale yellow blouse to straighten out the Uzumaki swirl on its back, and she goes to put her sandals on. Naruto has already put his on, but he isn't afforded the opportunity to dress how he wants to with how often he gets called out to lead teams on missions. Even now, he's kitted out in a green officer flak jacket, with the tail of his black Uchiha coat sticking out underneath. His hair is really the wildest part of him being relatively unchanged aside from length, but the dark bangs seem to make his perpetually active Sharingan stand out even more. It seems to make other people nervous, 
but Karen has yet to find a reason to be scared of the beautiful crimson eyes that had done nothing but protect her in the six months she'd known Naruto. Tsunade-sama wants her jounin to set good examples for each other. Naruto is just waiting to grow strong enough to not be considered just a jounin and be given more leeway with how he operates as a shinobi in Konoha's military system, including wearing whatever the hell he wants. Karen bounds down the short hallway to put her sandals on at the door, and finds Naruto sitting there waiting, impatiently for her. I'm still surprised that you managed to book a doctor, aren't they like, super busy right now? Karen asks idly, sitting down next to him. It's a miracle she herself had managed to get a day off, given her new status as the Hokaye's office assistant. One of them, at least. I used to be a pretty regular patient to the doctor I booked with, Naruto reveals, blowing a spiky bang back into place. Plus, I gave him a tip to bet on me in the Chonin exam finals. He was willing to slip you in to return the favor. She grins at the blatant example of Naruto's strength giving them privileges. It had been six months since the exams, but the damages caused by the summons rampaging through the village had caused significant changes to infrastructure, including doctor's surgeries. It isn't easy to get an appointment when the backlog has intensified due to needing to share space with other important services. One more tug and her sandals are on. She bounces to her feet and gives Naruto a hurried order. Let's go. New glasses await. You don't know where we're going yet. Hurry up. Bossy woman. Kakashi and Sasuke stand before their Hokage and her advisors, in addition to Jiraiya. The topic of their discussion being one Uchiha Naruto, de facto leader of the Uchiha clan. It is an unspoken acknowledgement from all of Konoha's populace that the grandson of Uchiha Madara is essentially the crown prince of the village. But the Hokage must look at him objectively and see that Naruto has been singularly selfish, and save for a few interactions with people close to him. He appears to be disconnected from Konoha itself and therefore presents a flight risk if he's not reeled in. If Naruto wants more than Konoha can provide, Tsunade's advisors believe that he may end up following his grandfather's footsteps too closely and abandon the village, robbing Konoha of the most potent bloodline seen in a century. Jiraiya vehemently disagrees. Naruto has already willfully surrendered the key to Sasuke's seal, without it being requested of him, I might add. He did so to absolve himself of responsibility of Sasuke if he loses control of the Nibi. Koharu argues, mild in tone. Homura pushes up his glasses and continues on for Koharu. And as I recall, he refused to sign the Toad contract despite the significant advantages it would provide. The only reason he gave, of which he refused to elaborate on, was they don't suit me. We find it hard to believe that a boy who is single-mindedly obsessed with power, would refuse the opportunity to gain more. To that end, we conclude that Naruto didn't want to sign the contract because he believes that Konoha could use it against him, as in the case of reverse summoning. Jiraiya is having none of it, and Sasuke finds himself surprised that the normally goofy old man is so stern and methodical when he provides his own counterpoint. And something you don't know as a seal master, is that a summoning contract doesn't just allow the ability to call forth summons. It's a contract seal that links the person who signed it to the realm that the animals come from. That kind of bond creates changes in the chakra of the person who signed it to acclimate their bodies to the kinds of chakra that these summons use. With how powerful Naruto's chakra is and his aptitude for the Sharingan, it may very well weaken him instead of helping. It's a Keke Genkai for a reason. You both clearly need to think long term. If Naruto is going to sign a contract, then it's going to be a summon that he can synchronize to with little long-lasting effects on him as a whole. Sasuke is surprised that a summoning contract actually has that kind of effect on the summoner. A distinctly feminine voice echoes in his mind. This contract that Jiraiya Dono speaks of would make it far easier to learn Sinjutsu. For those with the capacity for it. The faded look in his eyes when Nibi speaks to him makes the others in the room look at him. Sasuke? Are you well? Tsunade asks him, but her eyes are all business. The Nibi spoke to me. It does that sometimes. Everyone in the room straightens up. Is it communicating with you? Homer a question sharply. Yeah, Sasuke doesn't see the problem. It's mostly idle comments from time to time. It said something about the contract making it easier to learn Sinjutsu. All eyes turn to Jiraiya, who maintains his stern look. I can't tell you anything about the methods of learning Sinjutsu. If word got around on how to do it, you'd have a whole bunch of dead shinobi who weren't capable of handling that kind of power. Just learning it poses a significant risk. Jiraiya refuses to elaborate on the learning method. But the Nibi is correct. The contract transforms the user's body and chakra into something more capable of handling natural energy, but only if they already have the natural capability to do so. 
It took me 10 years to even start learning and I still can't do it perfectly. Minato was probably the only actual sage in the past 100 years. That alone should tell you just how dangerous it is, and just how much a contract with Senjutsu users changes your chakra. Regardless. Koharu starts, knowing that this particular argument is a lost point. Naruto hasn't actually done anything wrong, has he? Sasuke speaks up this time. Yes, he is at odds with Naruto more often than not regarding certain things but maybe Jiraiya-sama is right, and the old coots just need to look at the whole thing more objectively. With the half-truth stripped away, Naruto has proven himself to be a pretty reliable person. Not just as a man and friend, but as a shinobi to Konoha. With the incident regarding Karen during the Chonin exams notwithstanding, but still reasonably within the bounds of Konoha's agreement with Uzushio, Naruto continues to strive as a jounin of Konoha. Every mission he is sent on is successful. Every subordinate sings praises about him to the friends and families they return safely to. Why even promote Naruto to jounin if he is considered to be a flight risk? Giving control over lower rank subordinates would be dangerous if they didn't trust him. If they could give the rank of Janan to the trio of Otto Janan that Jiraiya had recruited, then they could spare some trust for Naruto who'd been a Konoha citizen for all his life. Unless. The truth of the matter ran deeper than trust. Sasuke thinks that some investigation of his own is warranted. Naruto is indeed a capable shinobi and leader, Tsunade acquiesces. But there is one problem. He has openly admitted to being raised by Uchiha Madara, who is most famously known for trying to destroy Konoha. He has also yet to display any tendencies that can be construed as wanting the destruction of Konoha. Jiraiya responds evenly. He gets along well with the majority of the shinobi and civilian populace. He may be selfish, but just look at every other person in this village. Everyone is out to gain something for themselves, that is the nature of people who are ambitious. What is the problem with Naruto gaining power and the acknowledgement of his fellow citizens? I recall that all three of us were the same once Sarutobi sensei was able to motivate us. The problem is Jiraiya, that if he continues to do so under the circumstances of another ruse in order to rise through Konoha's ranks with no opposition, that he could destroy Konoha's established hierarchy from the inside out. Tsunade communicates Homura and Koharu's argument to him. And I know you don't believe that for a second. Sasuke thinks that Jiraiya is catching on to something that he and Kakashi aren't aware of. I can't believe this. Jiraiya shakes his head in disbelief. You old biddies are still dogmatically following Sarutobi and Donzo's ridiculous fears. He turns and allows himself out of the meeting room. Jiraiya. Tsunade tries to get him to come back. No. Sarutobi was wrong in his unjust fear and hatred of an unfortunate people. You two better hope that you're dead before I find out that you did something to make Naruto betray this village. A self-fulfilling prophecy is a one-way ticket to undo everything that you ever thought you did right in the name of Konoha. Homura and Koharu look forward stonily, not daring to glance at Jiraiya. The Hokage gives a deep and weary sigh. This is what I get for listening to the two of you. She gripes pettily. Definitely something to look into, Sasuke thinks. He supposes it must be hard to mediate rather than take an obvious side. If he were someone less level-headed, he might be angry that Tsunade isn't standing up for one of her jounin. But as she said, she's required to look at things objectively and see if there's some truth in what they're saying, no matter how absurd. For the sake of all of Konoha. I had hoped that Jiraiya would listen to reason. Homura pushes his glasses up the bridge of his nose. That brings us to the reason that you two are here, Koharu follows up. We want the pair of you to observe Naruto when possible in order to determine if he will be a risk to the future of Kanahagakur. Assess his compliance with orders, his relationships with the general population as well as members of esteemed clans. Kakashi speaks up for the first time after listening attentively to one spiel after the other. Naruto is a jounin, as promoted and approved of by Hokage-sama and a number of other experienced jounin. The only orders he needs to listen to are direct orders from Tsunade-sama unless specified otherwise. And you should know well already that the only people Naruto regularly interacts with are Uzumaki Karen, Uchiha Sasuke, Haruno Sakura, my own family and Jiraiya. He is loosely associated with them for missions, but he doesn't get along with them like he does normal people and clanless shinobi. Good point. Sasuke thinks. How would Naruto be placed in a position of power in the village hierarchy if he doesn't gain the support of the clans as a neutral party? He has made it clear since the start that he hasn't been interested in village politics, instead opting for the pursuit of more personal power. And that in itself is also a problem. Koharu retorts. It is said that Uchiha Madara was capable of controlling a Baijuu with his potent Sharingan. Naruto is the sole inheritor of that man's genes and more importantly, 
one of only two people in the world with the Mangekyu Sharingan. He could easily overpower Sasuke's own ability and take control of the Nibi within. One of the only people he interacts with happens to be the container of Konoha's only by Juu as a present. Because we're friends? Sasuke answers with a rhetorical but obvious question. We were on the same team. Yeah, we fight and argue but we're friends and you seem to have let that slip by your notice. Sasuke. Kakashi warns him quietly. Homura continues. As a Jinchuriki, you have been placed in a position of responsibility that no other Uchiha has ever been in before. For the sake of all of Konoha, especially that little family that you've been getting close with, you will be required to reign in your clanmate and ensure that he is as loyal to the village as you are. Sasuke narrows his eyes at the mention of Yuido and Himari. Do you understand, Sasuke-kun? Koharu evidently goes for the kindly old lady facade. What would Naruto do in this situation? I understand, Sasuke answers calmly. Honorable elders, I respectfully say go fuck yourselves. Three pairs of jaws drop in the room. Tsunade hides her grin behind clasped hands. Sakura. Your friends are here to see you. Sakura straightens her red forehead protector in the mirror, making sure her bangs won't flop into her face, and checks the pockets of her chonin flak jacket for many stimulants that might help while performing medical ninjutsu in the field. Her pink hair reaches her thighs now, like Naruto's although significantly tame by comparison to her wild teammate. She honestly doesn't know how he can see right through it. Even a single strand in front of her eyes is distracting enough. That'll do. Sakura says to herself, and makes her way downstairs and to the front door. She's caught off guard by who's waiting for her. Sakura thought that it would be Naruto and Sasuke, her actual friends. Not. Her classmates. Ino, Shikamaru, and Choji. What in the hell? She hadn't spoken to any of them in months. Not since she demolished Ino in the exams. Sakura. Ino bounds up to her immediately. Let's hang out. Sakura blinks confusedly at the out of the blue offer before giving a quick refusal. No. Eh? Look, I don't know what you're up to but I'm busy today. We barely know each other anyway, I'd say no even if I had nothing to do. Sakura. That's no way to talk to your friends. Mebuki scolds. Sakura pays it no mind. She's not the one being suspicious, after all. Come on Sakura, Choji disgustingly speaks with his mouth full of chips, and Sakura cringes at the thought of the messy spittle that might come out. We haven't all been together since the academy. Wouldn't it be cool to get everyone together again? It's been a year since we were all in one place. We can go and get lunch or something. Shikamaru chips in too, but there is a sharpness to his lazy eyes that makes Sakura's suspicions grow. It makes her carefully consider how to draw out more information from them. And you came to me first? Why don't you go ask Sasuke or Naruto? She knows that Naruto would immediately refuse as well. Probably even laugh in their faces. Maybe try and make them cry. Both he and Sasuke would rather beat the crap out of each other than hang around a bunch of weaklings. Sasuke-kun has an important meeting with Hokage-sama. Ino reveals glibly, blushing at the mere mention of his name. And Naruto. Sama is always busy. Sakura notes the hesitation in which Ino added the suffix that the general populace gave to Naruto when speaking to or about him. She also knows that normal people, especially lower rank Shinan, wouldn't know that Tsunade has a meeting with Sasuke today. She only knew that Tsunade was busy, which is why her current order is to report to the hospital and receive normal tutelage from some of the medics. So how could Ino know that Sasuke would be present with the Hokage? Sasuke sure as hell wouldn't tell anyone. What about the others? Kiba, Shino and Hinata? Kurenai-sensei is taking them out on missions a whole lot. Shikamaru deflects. Not an admission that they hadn't asked, but not confirmation that Team 8 has been asked and said no either. I'm out on missions all the time too, Sakura starts to get impatient. And I'm apprenticed under the Hokage. I don't have the time to hang out when Konoha needs me now more than ever, as a Chonin and a medical shinobi. Come now Sakura, Mebuki tries to soothe the impending rage outburst. It wouldn't hurt for one day, would it? Ino bobs her head eagerly. Yeah. I'm not going to disrespect the time that Tsunade-sama has put aside to teach me. Sakura says flatly. And frankly, I already have friends that I don't get to talk to often enough. You've changed, Sakura. Ino's expression transforms into a scowl. Ever since you got put on a team with that damn Naruto, you've become a complete bitch. Ino. Mebuki sounds appalled and looks equally furious. Sakura loves and appreciates her mother. 
she probably let them in so that they could rope her into loosening up a bit. It made sense seeing as Mebuki had expressed concern that Sakura would eventually run herself dry if she kept up the relentless regimen of missions and training, but one thing that Ka-san would not stand is disrespecting her daughter. I think you three have outstayed your welcome. Mebuki's voice conveys her displeasure. Come on Ino, this is a bust. Shikamaru's droning voice asks her to leave with him. The three turn on their heels and slowly leave through the front door without so much as an apology. Bye Ka-san. Sakura turns to her mother. I'm sorry honey, I really thought. Mebuki frowns at her misplaced effort to help her daughter. Don't worry about it. I wouldn't be doing all this stuff if I didn't really want it. And besides, Naruto and Sasuke are the best friends I could ask for. They can even make time for me. Mebuki shakes her head fondly. Those two boys have been a good influence on you. You should invite them over for dinner sometime. Kakashi-sensei too. I'll try. Is all Sakura can promise. She leaves through the front door and closes it behind her. Her eyes narrow at the Ino Shikacho trio, who are still loitering around a few meters from her house. Next time, I hope you three don't bother me at all with whatever scheme you tried today. She says to them spitefully. Ino becomes visibly aggressive, and naturally Shikamaru and Choji stand at her back steadfast. It's a laughably pathetic display. Sakura has no doubt that she could mince all three of them on her own. You're missing out on a pretty important opportunity, Sakura. Shikamaru explains and Sakura withholds a roll of her eyes. Look, we're the heirs of some of the most important clans in Konoha, why wouldn't you want to be friends with us? Our clans have connections that could help you get higher up in Konoha's support chain. I'm apprenticed under the fucking Hokage. Sakura shouts in frustration, making them reel back. I literally cannot get any better tutelage. What the hell is wrong with you, you morons? As if summoned by the spirit of coincidence, two of her favorite people pass through the street. Naruto and Karen. Yo, Sakura. Karen greets her joyfully. Healing wench. Naruto's greeting is significantly ruder. Karen, perverted hedgehog. Sakura barely withholds a smirk at the nicknames they've given each other. Naruto's Sharingan immediately hones in on the trio of weaklings. As expected, they cower instantly and take off without a word. Naruto has quite the scary visage. What's the story there? Sakura gives him the rundown objectively, without adding her own suspicions. Hmm. Naruto hums in thought. Ino Shikacho? I'll keep an eye out going forward. By what you said, they were unusually overt about getting your attention. They're definitely out to get something. Maybe not of their own accord. She's glad that Naruto came to the same conclusion that she did. Anyway. Sakura drags the conversation away from the trio, ensuring that Naruto didn't chase them down and demand answers. How are you going with your medical ninjutsu? Not well. I can heal myself without using a jutsu, but my chakra is too corrosive to heal other people. Naruto's brow furrows over his red eyes. I need to find a way to make my chakra have more healing properties without weakening it. That's probably possible. Sakura concedes, walking with Naruto and Karen toward the hospital. Sakura has heard that it's possible to develop more than one chakra nature. With enough rigorous effort, one could transform their chakra over a long period of time to take on the qualities of another nature. Some people like Naruto and Sasuke are already gifted with more than one, but she predicts that it won't be exactly easy for Naruto to adapt his chakra to the delicate nature of healing another person. Whenever his chakra comes out of his body, it's usually to set fire to, blast away, cut, or force someone under a paralyzing genjutsu. I think that it is too. I've discovered at least that healing properties are not bound to elemental chakra natures. I thought that maybe mastering Sutan would give me some inclination, but it seems that it's some kind of physical and mental threshold that I can't get a grasp on yet. Naruto's frown deepens slightly. I'll keep trying anyway. Last two times that I tried to heal fishes, one exploded and the other kind of. Disintegrated. Wow. Sakura is amazed at his ineptitude. I will never let you try and heal me. That would be for the best. And he didn't even clean it up before he left to find another one. Karen points a finger accusingly at Naruto, who smirks in response. I thought someone freaking died in our living room. The pursuit of power is often messy. Naruto nods sagely. Sakura rolls her eyes this time. Anyway, I'm off to the hospital for my lesson. We're heading there too for Karen's eye test. Naruto decides that they should just walk together. Karen does not look so eager. Um. Hospital? She saw through it right away. Shikamaru explains to his father. I expected as much, but the seed is planted. 
Sakura will relay it to Naruto and Sasuke, who are more likely to look into it. You plan for us to fail? Shikamaru is mystified. His father had seemed so serious about sassing Sakura into being their friend. I didn't tell you my plan so that you would seem more genuine. Shikaku admits readily. So what is your plan? Shikaku carefully considers how to answer. Shikamaru is still just a child, and normal children don't have the aptitude for keeping secrets. Uchiha Naruto is hardly a normal child. I was merely giving a subtle push toward Naruto and Sasuke to take some consideration in how the clans and political factions of Konoha look upon the Uchiha. You're giving out favors now? Shikamaru asks with lazy dubiousness. No, it's definitely for the purpose of making sure that Konoha isn't shaken from the inside out. Shikaku denies having the motivation to help people who are essentially strangers. The Uchiha weren't well liked by certain clans, and the higher-ups seem to have some kind of grudge against them. Generally, some vagrant behavior is overlooked in Konoha if the shinobi or clan member doing a crime is valuable enough to the network, but the Uchiha were very good at their jobs while in total control of the law enforcement. It didn't matter to them how high up a criminal was, only that they were a criminal. Civilians looked on them kinder than most, but even Shikaku had been fed up with constantly having to bail out some of his clanmates after the Uchiha police force had caught them doing something disruptive or generally idiotic. But the Sarutobi clan under Sandaime Sama's rule had always been prime pickings for the Uchiha. The third was always willing to look the other way, but the tension growing toward the Uchiha on the side of the Sarutobi had been palpable. Police sent in to clean up their messes would often find themselves victims of assault, and harming just one of the Uchiha brought the wrath of all of them upon whoever dared to attack their family. Sarutobi would often find themselves in a jail cell for a night before having their charges waived by the Sandaime. That, and being forced to move to an outskirts estate after the Kyuubi attack, was highly suspicious on behalf of the elders. In the outer areas of the village, they could be more easily monitored without other shinobi catching on and spreading rumors that the Uchiha might be being spied on. Sarutobi Hiruzen's greatest supporters had always been the elders that he'd fought with. Their input had been valuable in wartime, but they are human and still suffer from prejudices that could segregate a whole clan of the most skilled shinobi in the village. Shikaku doesn't consider himself to be a particularly cynical person, but there were some lines to be drawn between incidents involving the Uchiha and the political structure of Konoha that were difficult to ignore. And it feels as though there are some missing pieces of the puzzle that is the Uchiha incident. These unusual happenings were part of the reason that he'd initially been hesitant to continue the tradition of having a Sarutobi clan member train the next generation of Ino Shika Cho. Sarutobi Asumo was quite the menace when he'd been younger, but Shikaku had given him the benefit of the doubt and entrusted his child to a sensei who he'd come to find out wasn't, and still isn't much of a sensei. Yuhi Kurenai learned her lesson from the interperformance of her team. Asuma did not. And despite Tsunade being quite a hardliner when it comes to the correct management of training young shinobi, Asuma is still somehow in charge of an important generation of clan children. It's raising questions, and Shikaku wants answers. Answers that he wouldn't be able to obtain unless a few clans band together in an effort to find out what the hell is going on with the higher-ups. Just don't get in the way of the Uchiha's. Shikaku sighs. If I'm right, they'll be hounding our clans for information in the next few months if they get a lead on something that might affect their agency in Konoha. Shikamaru's brow twitches. You're the one who told us to chase down Sakura. They'll be more motivated if someone they care about is a point of interest. Shikaku shrugs shamelessly. But regardless, it seems like I've been neglecting my own training of you and our clan specialties. It's time to fix that mistake. His son droops and feigns sleep on the floor. I'm too tired. It isn't a request. Karen hates hospitals. The bad memories are at the forefront of her mind as she sat down next to Naruto in front of the eye specialist's room. The smell, the miserable patients and families, the occasional crying and... Mama? Young Karen watched a white sheet be placed over her mother. Mama looked so cold. She tried to see Mama, she really did, but the creepy old man grabbed her by the arm and started dragging her down the hallway. Mama! She screams and cries. Silence, child! You have a duty to Kusagakur. You will serve it just as she did. Be proud that she died saving the lives of our shinobi. The grip on her arm is so tight that it hurts. Tears are in her eyes. Mama. Help me. She is pulled into a room full of shinobi. Her sleeve is pulled up and her arm is offered to a man with bandages around his head. The first bite on her skin is something unreal. The excruciating pain shoots through her whole body as her chakra is forcibly wrenched out of her control. AF. Mama. Karen jolts and shoots up to her feet, hyperventilating. 
she's sweating and picking at her arms. Naruto looks up in alarm from his seat. She starts pacing back and forth, torn between wanting to bolt and staying with Naruto like he asked. Nurse. Naruto addresses a woman delivering results to the box at the front of Dr. Iyashi's door. Naruto-sama? Please tell the Iyashi-san that we'll be on the roof getting some fresh air. Oh oh, the nurse takes in Karen's state and nods without staring. Of course. We'll send someone to fetch you when it's time to get the results. Thank you. Naruto puts his hand lightly on Karen's back and gently nudges her. Karen immediately dissolves into a babbling mess and lunges into Naruto's arms. I need to go I need to go I need to go I need to go. We're going. Naruto soothes, but looks exceedingly uncomfortable. He gives her light nudges toward the fire escape. Is she having a panic attack? Naruto hops up the stairs several at a time when Karen starts bounding for the last door. Karen bursts out the door, breathing the fresh air as if every breath is going to be her last. She drops to her hands and knees and starts dry retching. Naruto has no idea what to do. Iyashi comes to the roof personally, about an hour after Karen's escape. He's witness to an unusually nervous Naruto hovering over a seated Karen, examining her and trying to get her to talk to him. I'm fine, Naruto. Really? That did not look fine to me. Iyashi thinks that Naruto is too blunt for his own good, and Karen's expression twists in something like frustration and annoyance before she deflates. It's unusual that Naruto is this overt about his concern, but he probably has a different outlook on people that he cares about. But of course, Naruto has never met a problem that couldn't be solved by violence, so he's probably new to helping or at least trying to help people who don't have the same mental fortitude that he does. He gives a polite cough to grab their attention. Uchiha-sama, Uzumaki-san. Naruto and Karen look up and they're somewhat surprised to see him up here, he supposes. But he felt that Karen may be more receptive to the news if she's not stuck inside the hospital. He sits down on one of the chairs that the long-term patients use for relaxation and begins the recount of his findings. It is as you expected Uchiha-sama. It's just Naruto. Karen's eyesight has indeed been impaired without a degenerative condition. He holds up a picture of the scans. You can see here that her pupil is hidden under some balloon-like growths coming from her irides. To be quite frank, it's a miracle that she can see at all. She's going to need a new prescription, but my main concern lies in what could have caused this in the first place. Uzumaki-san, do you have any recollection of eye injuries in the past? Karen shifts uncomfortably but provides a small story to go with it. Unnecessary for him to know, but if it helps her remember what happened then it could lead it to potential solutions. My family lived in a little settlement in the land of grass, but when Kusigakar was recruiting Shinobi, they found out that me and my Ka-chan were Uzumaki and tried to take us to their village. My Otosan. He didn't like that very much. He kept shouting at them that they have no right to take people against their will, and they got fed up with him and Karen's lips curl in and she looks about ready to burst into tears. She manages to hold on for a bit longer. He was just a civilian. I was really young, but I remember they had a rogue shinobi who could spit poison smoke and trap people in giant bubbles. My Otosan tried to shield me, but that guy just breathed on him and killed him with pink smoke. I was really hurt too, but mama made me bite her. That's how Kuza found out that people can heal by biting us. Iyashi keeps his composure during her story. He's heard many tragic tales before, but the depravity of other nations truly disgusts him. He finds himself privileged to be born in Konoha. Naruto's eyes change to a strange pattern, and the veins on the back of his hand bulge as he clenches them furiously. I see. You may be able to receive help from a skilled enough medical shinobi to repair that damage, but conventional eye surgery won't be enough to heal damage caused by a shinobi's poison. But that's enough for today. I'll prepare the fees for today's consultation and prescription and send them to your home. Iyashi concludes, knowing that Naruto will handle it from here. Thank you, Iyashi-sensei. Naruto puts a hand on Karen's shoulder, and they both vanish in a poof of smoke. Poor girl. Iyashi looks up at the sky before getting back to work. I'm sorry. Naruto says sincerely to Karen, putting the emotionally exhausted girl down in her bed. I got that after the first three times, Naru. Karen smiles weakly. Naruto breaths a frustrated sigh, most definitely aimed at himself. I really thought that I was helping. You are helping. I didn't think I'd have a freaking panic attack in the middle of a packed hospital. Naruto now understands that maybe he's being a bit too pushy and getting what he wants. Sure, he wants Karen to be in good health, but sometimes things just take time to move on from, and he doesn't want her to feel like she doesn't have any choice in the matter. Patience is something he'd never really contended with. 
he'd hid his power for so long and for a distinct and explosive purpose, so he'd been able to put up with it and keep himself busy in the meantime. It wasn't something that Madara taught him, and the old man had been all too willing to put him through an extremely accelerated training regime due to the predicted time he had left on this earth. Naruto is used to getting his way by being purposely obtuse with people or through raw power. This is a conflict of the mind and the soul. Something he has never had to encounter before in a healing, living person. He is caught off guard when Karen grabs his nose. Anyone home? Karen asks cheekily with tired eyes. Just thinking about how little I understand people. Naruto honks helplessly with his nose closed. Karen pulls him by his nose into her bed and suddenly they're facing each other on their sides. Right now Naru, Karen whispers. I don't need new glasses, or fancy jutsu, or these scars to go away. Then what do you need? Naruto asks, wanting to know how to help her. All I need in my life right now is you. She smiles, and in his not so humble opinion it is beautiful. You saved me from that torture. You're my hero, and that's already more than I could have imagined. Just Naruto, not Uchiha or Uzumaki. You're already what I need. There is a moment of silence while Naruto digests the only time that someone has actually said they wanted him for more than his power. You kind of do need new glasses. Naruto says awkwardly, which makes her smile. Maybe. She takes hers off to keep her head on the pillow more comfortably. Naruto thinks that maybe remembering the good parts of her life will be therapeutic. What was your Ka-chan like? Karen spends the next few hours telling him about her mother and what a wonderful person she was. She talks about how she remembers how much she loved her father, what she could remember of him. Naruto is pleased when she falls asleep after he patiently listens through everything she has to say, and with a relaxed and unguarded posture. He tucks her properly and returns to his studies hesitantly. My father was a sage? Naruto asks confusedly. You didn't know? Jiraiya said that the Yondaime was the only sage since the Shodai Hokage. Sasuke comes knocking just before the sun sets and gives him the rundown of his talk with the higher-ups of Konoha. Strangely, Naruto doesn't seem surprised to know that he's being targeted and that the elders are attempting to use any resource they can in order to keep him under their control. He's more interested in the not-so-little detail about Namikaze Minato being a Senjutsu adept. I wonder why? Naruto's thought trails, internally questioning how Minato could have been given hassle by Obito if he's a master of Senjutsu. Well, I suppose if he wasn't actually that good at it, then it wouldn't exactly be publicized to the common folk. Maybe there's some kind of condition that needs to be fulfilled in order to use Sage Chakra, and that Minato couldn't fulfill it while busy with the QB in space-time wielding baby Madara. Obito had ultimately been defeated at his father's hands, and the QB nearly sealed away. Taking out Obito could be considered an impossible task without an army, and Minato had done so alone. The Nibi said that taking on a summoning contract could make learning Senjutsu easier, but Jiraiya said that you refused on the grounds that a contract can warp your chakra. I did. I'm not comfortable doing anything that might change my chakra when I myself don't know its full potential. I suppose I'll just need to do some more research into myself and see if it's possible for me to use Senjutsu without being taught by summoned creatures. Naruto replies, unconcerned about Nibi talking to him. But this asking me to spy on you? Aren't you worried that you're at risk right now? Who knows who else they're asking? Sasuke seems genuinely concerned about the current situation. Sakura was approached earlier today the current Inoshikacho trio, but I suspect that if their parents actually wanted Sakura to spy on me then they would have been more subtle about it. I think that they're probably not happy about being approached and having their kids do dirty work. That is to say, if they were approached by the same people you spoke with today. Naruto turns to the small hall in his apartment and gives Karen a shout. Karen. I'm going out for a bit, I'll bring dinner back. Get. Me. The. Usual. Sasuke sees Karen doing pull-ups on a rack attached to the door. He sees sweat roll down her face and her exposed stomach with the training outfit she's wearing. Sasuke swallows at the sight. He feels a cold shiver down his spine as Naruto's always on Sharingan turn to him. I'll forgive you this once for your stray eyes, Naruto's voice is deceptively cordial. But she is mine. Sasuke nods without hesitation. Best not to anger the most possessive person in Konoha. Good. Let's go to a little hidey hole for us Uchiha to speak safely. Sasuke is surprised when Naruto leads them to Naka Shrine in the abandoned Uchiha district and opens the seal under the correct tatami mat with practiced ease. Naruto seals the entrance behind them and ignites the braziers in front of the stone tablet. I debated with myself whether or not I should apologize to you, but I'm not sorry that I hid the fact that I was an Uchiha. 
keeping that secret until the right moment served its purpose of putting me on a podium in front of the world, and now Konoha will be safer if everyone knows that the spawn of Madara is in the light. Naruto is very pragmatic about that particular issue. Yes, Sasuke had been conflicted, but his friend and clan mate has an indomitable will and wouldn't cave to the thought of it being nice to be with his fellow Uchiha. But I will say that going forward, I want to help you become more than what the Uchiha were in the past. I did show you the circumstances of how I came to be, but there are aspects of your biology that you won't be able to run away from. Something that will hang over your head until you either find true light in yourself, or remove the darkness that is the Sharingan. What do you mean? My biology? Sasuke asks, puzzled. The curse of hatred, Naruto states, Sharingan whirling into a different pattern. It is equal parts spiritual and biological. The curse is a manifestation that makes the Sharingan stronger at a steep cost. The Sharingan releases unique enzymes through the body when its user is willingly or otherwise exposed to circumstances that cause negative emotions. The Mengekyu Sharingan, as your brother likely told you already, is the ultimate form of the curse that can only be brought about by the most searing of emotions. Betrayal. Loss. Death. The more your hatred grows, the more potent this dojutsu becomes, and the more you lose yourself to the curse. Then we're cursed to that fate if we chase more power through the Sharingan? Sasuke does not like the thought of unwillingly turning out like Itachi. That is the case for you. My Mengekyu Sharingan awoke because my body and chakra became strong enough to wield it. The potency of my Sharingan is directly related to the strength of my chakra, I don't need to fear losing myself to anything other than my own stupidity. How can I learn to do this? You can't. Naruto states bluntly. The Mengekyu Sharingan steadily makes its wielder blind, but by taking the Mengekyu eyes of a close relative, you can permanently mitigate that damage. Madara had several younger brothers before the founding of Konoha. Only one of them lived long enough to feel grief at having his people slaughtered by the Senju. The Naidaim Hokage was the one that killed him, and Madara ended up transplanting those eyes into himself, becoming the first person to wield the eternal Mengekyu Sharingan. And because of that you don't have to deal with the consequences of that power? Sasuke believes he's correct in assuming that the path to power is bloody for an Uchiha. That's possibly the reason, but there could be more to it than that. Which is why we're here. Naruto motions to the stone tablet at the end of the room. Naruto looks at it with the Sharingan and quotes one of the lines. Seeking stability, one god was divided into yin and yang, these opposing two acting together obtain all things in creation. The god in question is the god of the Ninshu religion, the Rikidu Senen. He divided his power between his two sons, the elder son inherited his eyes and chakra, while the younger son inherited his body. The sage wanted his religion to be continued in the name of peace, and chose his younger son to be the leader that guided the world to it. The older son, fraught with rage at his birthright being taken from him, plunged the sons into eternal war. The older brother became the first wielder of the Sharingan and the Uchiha clan are his descendants. And the younger brother became the first Senju? The curse of hatred dates that far back? Indeed. To the very first of us. But that raises the question, is the Sharingan incomplete without the body of the sage? The answer. Is yes. Madara divined this truth from the tablet, stealing a piece of Hashirama's power and implanting it within his own flesh. It took decades, but in the end Madara obtained the eyes, chakra and body, and he awoke the dujutsu of the Rikudo Senen. The Rinnegan. Sasuke has never so much as heard the legend of the Rinnegan. He only knows pieces of myth, that the Rikudo Senen defeated a rampaging and powerful beast, and divided that power to the world in order to defeat it. But now, knowing that he'd done so using a unique dojutsu that the Sharingan had been derived from. It doesn't make sense. Sasuke shakes his head. Why would the Rikudo Senen divide his power between his sons? Because of Ninshu. He evidently believed that cooperation is the key to peace, and probably thought something stupid like forcing his two broken halves of a whole two children to work together would end up facilitating that goal. Or at least, that's my belief. That makes an unfortunate amount of sense, and I am inclined to believe that Naruto Dono is correct. Sasuke files that away for later. Then why don't you have the Rinnegan? The sage had one thing that no other person in history has ever acquired. The Juubi. From which the nine Baijuu are split from. You hold a piece of that inside of you. It's likely that the Baijuu together have overwhelmingly powerful chakra, unmatched by anything in this world. Judging by the progression of my Sharingan, my chakra will need to grow far, far more powerful in order to awaken it. Either that, or grow to be more. Universal. The Rinnegan grants its wielder the ability to use any jutsu, regardless of chakra nature of difficulty, 
as well as many other powers exclusive to that dojutsu. Please let me speak with him. Nibi asks politely. How? Sasuke asks back to his mind, never having tried to speak back to the Nibi before. Trust in me, your body. Do not be afraid, Sasuke-kun. Even if I wanted to harm you, Naruto Dono would soon put me back in the confines of this seal. Will I still be able to listen? As I do. Nibi confirms. Sasuke's clear eye bleed into the heterochromia of the Nibi, and Naruto is alarmed. Please do not fret. Nibi pleads, holding Sasuke's arms up non-threateningly. Sasuke-kun is still here, listening. I wanted to speak with you about the stone tablet. Speak. Naruto demands, none too pleased about the eavesdropper by Juu. I was never aware of this stone tablet. Nibi Sasuke admits. But I believe it was left behind by Hagoromo to Indra's descendants, in the hopes that they would self-correct and return to peace with Asura's descendants. At Naruto's blank look, she explains further. Otsutsuki Hagoromo, the Rikidu Senen's true name. Indra being his eldest son, and Asura being the youngest. Hagoromo raised me and taught me his religion. He was obsessive about cooperation, and it would not surprise me if he deliberately split his power in order to force his sons to see the best in each other in order to gain more power and influence over their own reality. But that is hindsight, and he was very devout about his desire for peace. He did not understand the nature of a human, for he in all his power could not truly be called human. You are correct, Naruto Dono. His belief clouded his judgment, and therein lies the origin of your people's curse. The Rinnegan should never have been separated, only diluted. Naruto's Mangekyu eyes stay locked on the Nibi, still waiting for the reveal of deception but not willing to let an opportunity pass him by. Am I correct about my own development too? Quite so, you will need to reach deeper within yourself to awaken the Rinnegan. Powerful chakra alone will not be the catalyst for a dojutsu that can create and destroy in equal amounts. You are an Uchiha, defined by your destructive power. You must first learn to create. Your grandfather already had the answer. The Makutan that he stole from Hashirama. Naruto realizes. There may be a sliver of that within me. Perhaps that would be your best starting point. Nibi Sasuke sways on the spot. I do not wish to see more people helplessly consumed by the curse of your people. I want to see this problem that my father created to be corrected. Nibi Sasuke looks down at his hers? Body. Sasuke-kun cannot handle the influence of my mind in his body for long, so I will be returning to the seal. I am pleased to meet you and to see that you are ambitious enough to look into yours and your clan's future. Good luck. Sasuke jolts, and it's made obvious by his body language that he's back in control. What now? The dizzy Uchiha asks. Madara ensured that I would have the tools to chase my dreams. Naruto waved a hand out extravagantly. He built this village so that all Uchiha would have that. He instilled fear into all living at that time, making it known that the Uchiha clan is made from resilient and protective people. His guile allowed him to cheat death and return even stronger from it, permanently fixing in himself a disease that has plagued the Uchiha clan since the very first of us. It would be remiss of me not to take advantage of everything he lived and died for. I have my own goal Sasuke, and now you must find your own way to bring yourself into the light. Naruto looks back at the stone tablet. Amaterasu. The tablet ignites in black flames and slowly disintegrates. I won't let this stone poison our descendants with whispered promises of power. The Uchiha Make Our Own Fate. Chapter 11, Memoir of a Mad Man. Between the years of Konoha's foundation and Naruto's birth, Madara feels his age when his Sharingan sees graying strands over his right eye. After a failed attempt to convince the Uchiha to abandon Konoha, he explodes in fury. Open your eyes. Madara thunders to the Uchiha, and he sees them flinch at his chakra cracking the floor of the shrine. His Sharingan whirls into its Mangekyu pattern in response to his hatred. I have witnessed the absolute tyranny that the Senju will impose on you, if you refuse to learn. I see now that I have shouldered your burdens for too long, and you have stagnated without conflict to strengthen you. Do you think that it's a coincidence that all of a sudden it is no longer the Hokage who picks the heir of his position? Just when a few gifted newcomers begin to show signs that they are capable of leading? You pathetic, miserable children. Madara paces at the forefront of the shrine. Adult Uchiha are seated before him, sweating in the presence of his wrath. None offer so much as a rebuke. Weak. In spirit, and in body. There is not a single senju like Hashirama. There are no other senju willing to see past their history with us. They would take us by the hand so that their other would sneak into our pockets. Madara's voice drops in volume. I see now that this is not the village of the Uchiha and senju, 
and I foresee that this clan will wither away like embers in the cold. Still, not a single protest. Not one person is willing to entertain the thought that they are truly at risk. They grow fat in complacency. One Uchiha female steps down into the shrine. Madara-sama. Hashirama-sama is here as you requested. He nods stoically to Nauri, not letting a woman experience the brutality of his simmering rage. All of you leave. I will be giving you one last warning. One that may even cost me my life. And then you will see. That without the tools of fear and power, you will whittle away until it's too late. Now go. And suffer. They scamper away like mice from a cat. Hashirama enters the shrine, clad in robes befitting a Hokage. He looks around with something akin to wonder. Madara? What's this about? Madara turns to the stone tablet. Have you ever heard the history of the Rikudo Senen? Madara is starting to get used to seeing through one eye. It had been a few months now since he'd used Izanagi to revive himself, and just as long since he'd taken a piece of Hashirama's flesh and implanted it on his heart, through the gaping wound on his chest. It took weeks before he could eat without vomiting up some of it. Maybe that was a side effect of actually being dead. His little hideout had been stocked with salted meats, just in case he couldn't find the strength to hunt. Madara puts on a cloak, hiding his sickly pale skin that seemed to take a slight green tinge in certain light. It would come and go like a bad rash, but he learned not to be too vain about it as soon as he realized just how much sustenance that tiny piece of flesh really offered him. He could go significantly longer without water or food. He also cuts his hair down for the first time, leaving only short spikes of salt and pepper hair. A mask with a single hole over his functioning eye is to keep his face hidden. He hides his chakra with the years of practice he'd gotten in while scheming to fake his death, and moves out into the world to see how every other nation is coping with the new shinobi system, a new era of the hidden village. It turns out, they are not coping at all. Madara's death and Hashirama's condition has evidently made waves across the world, and now everyone seems to think that Konoha will be easy pickings. There is a war on the horizon. Now, instead of a few children dying in conflict against an enemy, it's an entire village's children being led to slaughter. The village system hadn't been a cure, it had been an escalation. The land of rain has become a crucible. Previously ungifted and humble tradesmen and farmers have established their own home and become extremely hardy and resilient. Madara admires that they do not hide their hatred of the world that causes them to suffer behind useless platitudes of peace. Step in their borders and you are free game to them. He travels around under many disguises, but the last place he visits is a coastal city where he meets a woman unlike any other. There's about ten of these Uzumaki, all armed and ready to prevent any intrusion into their home. Ohio. Madara cheers in a high-pitched voice, also in his stupid guise inspired by Hashirama, he likes to think. State your business. The woman orders, short red hair flickering in the wind. She looks quite beautiful with the sun at her back, making her hair appear lighter. I got lost. Madara lies shamelessly. He's barely got chakra at all. A censor among them. How intriguing. I do too have lots of chat aura. This is wartime, stranger. The woman does not indulge his childish persona. Trespassers bring trouble. I won't let you or this idiot persona of yours bring trouble to my clan. Leave or die. How about? You die. Madara picks up some dirt and throws it in her face. She looks apoplectic while she menacingly draws her sword. My name is Uzumaki Haruka. And you have chosen. Death. Madara deftly cartwheels back to avoid a flurry of swipes from her blade. Immediately, Uzumaki men surround him with swords poised to strike. Whoa whoa whoa. This isn't fair at all. Madara's head flails around, looking at every possible person to see who would attack first. He ducks to avoid a swipe from behind, with sensory prowess that isn't possible for someone of his projected strength. Kidding. Madara punts him, sending him flying a dozen yards. Their little dance continues, Madara doesn't kill any of them but he doesn't let himself take a hit. It's all too fun just to humiliate them for trying. It's time for the secret art of the counter-attack. Madara leaps and hangs upside down on a tree branch. The battered Uzumaki stiffen in fear. Ninpa, Aramaka Tokage ninja art, frilled neck lizard. His cloak falls behind his back while he gives an awkward pose. Madara's fun is ended when an aged voice interrupts before the Uzumaki can try and kill him again. Enough. Of all the people to notice his presence. Uzumaki Ashin orders his kin to stand down. None of you can defeat this man. I cannot defeat this man. He hobbles forward with a cane in hand, beckoning Madara to come down from the tree. Madara does so, 
wondering if he needs to kill the man to preserve his hidden identity. You are a long way from home, and it seems you've picked up an interesting talent. But you cannot fool my senses. So it would seem. Madara's voice returns to normal, startling the surrounding shinobi at his baritone. Ashina continues without pause. I imagine your travels have not led you to a warm bed. They have not thus far. But I have greater things on my mind than hearth and home. Madara removes his hood, leaving the top of his graying hair exposed. Come and dine with me. I have lost enough sons to this war, I do not wish to lose any more. Least of all to someone who should be dead. You come as well, my daughter. Yes, Ato-sama. Haruka dips her head. Madara doesn't have any children, but he supposes he gets it. He lost five brothers after all. And the rest of the traitors will be dead sooner or later, the Senju will see to that. They walk into their village, built from stone with swirling patterns with the smell and taste of sea water permeating the air. Madara gets curious looks, but no more than a passing gaze while under his mask. Ashina leads them to his very own home where they are greeted by his wife, who Madara sees where Mito and Haruka get their looks from. She is worn from the loss of her children, and it is something that visibly weighs on her. Please, take a seat. My wife will prepare tea. As you wish. Madara remembers his manners for once, and takes off his mask. His Sharangan and pale eyes seem to fascinate the Uzumaki girl Haruka was it? We will not say a word about your being here, Madara. Ashina says, unprompted. But you appear like an omen. You threw the world into chaos when you fought Hashirama once more. I have not come to cause trouble. Madara replies, despite his antics. You could say that I'm on a pilgrimage, to find meaning in this world that has forsaken my clan. I'm looking for a reason not to turn it on its head once more. This is surprising coming from you. I never took you as a man to stay at his feet and look around. I was younger then. Madara reminisces. Driven singularly by fear and hatred. Fear that my family would be extinguished. Hatred at the Senju for facilitating that fear. I tied my existence heavily to that of the Uchiha clan. Never once did I think of what I could be without them. I guess I'm looking for my own meaning. Trying to find out why I struggled to achieve peace. Ashina takes a sip of his tea. I cannot say that I understand your desire to separate from your clan. Perhaps that is a fundamental difference between the Uzumaki and Uchiha. The Uzumaki and Senju, even. Tied to our blood, not our hearts. You are closer than you realize. Madara does not reveal the truth he'd divined from the stone tablet, but he does acknowledge that the elderly clan head is exceptionally wise for someone lacking actual evidence in the form of a message from the Rikudo. I admit to you Madara, your appearance here has given me something to consider. A proposal to you. Ashina seems to appreciate his time and would rather get to business. You must have an interesting proposal. What will it offer me? Madara's plan has already been set in motion, he wants for little as it is. Train the young of my clan, and you will be given a home for as long as you need it. We have been far removed from the rest of the world and I'd have liked to have kept it that way, but this era of the hidden village has spurned into motion a great many evil deeds that will consume us as well. My clan have not been warriors for a very long time, and that is something that must change or else we will cease to exist entirely. Madara toils over the offer for weeks before eventually accepting on several conditions. Chiefly among them is absolute control over the students he trains, in addition to secrecy regarding his identity. There is to be no mention of his existence at all to Konoha or the rest of the world by letter correspondence. If anyone asks, the Uzumaki were becoming strong through trial, not teaching. The students and the rest of Uzushio know him only as Izuna. Training young people helps keep his body moving. He could be wasting away in a cave right now, waiting for his eyes to undergo a transformation that may or may not actually happen. Again. He orders an Uzumaki boy, demanding nothing but perfection from this new generation. Sweat cakes down the red hair the boy's face. Other Uzumaki boys are similarly battered, but each one has a will of iron. There was no giving up for them. From Madara's lectures, they understand that everything they know is at risk. Their clan is facing extinction if they do not find their strength. They already have resolve, perhaps that's a blood trait of this clan. The boy is weighed down by sand after Madara had ordered them to swim, then roll around on the beach. He is clearly exhausted but still he persists. The boy unleashes a roar and stomps his feet into the sand. Water molecules begin to whirl around from this sealless jutsu. An upright typhoon forms around him rapidly with more water drawn from the sea. Madara vanishes before their eyes and delivers a hard punch to the boy's stomach. It sends him flying, but still he persists and finishes the jutsu. Sutan, Daibakufu no jutsu great waterfall technique. 
spurned into violent motion by strong Uzumaki chakra, a veritable tidal wave erupts and swamps the beach. Madara smiles and knows that there are no better students to him than talented people who refuse to give up. Three years pass. Against his will, Madara finds himself growing fond of these fiery people. And in turn, many of them grow fond of him too. Ashina's daughter Haruka, is one person who seems to use all of her spare time to use him and further her own strength. She corners him again while he's stargazing and lays next to him, undoubtedly plotting to ruin his night with another 30 demands to teach her personally. He has his hands full with the boys as it is, and it's not like a woman could compete with them. Why do you want strength? Madara asks after having not done so for the time they'd known each other. To be of service to my clan. Haruka answers, almost in a questioning tone as if to say isn't it obvious? Most women your age are rearing children and yet, you have no husband nor suitors. Why is a female so resolute about being a warrior? I I. Haruka looks down shamefully. I have nothing else to offer. I do not understand, Madara goes on tactlessly. A woman of your ability, beauty and status would be considered a rare and sought after spouse anywhere else in the world, why not here? I cannot bear children. That snaps Madara's jaw shut. Or rather, if I have a child then. I will most likely die. Haruka remains seated next to him, looking down at her hands. Before these villages started forming, we were attacked by mercenary clans who were paid to clear us out so that the daimyo who hired them may harvest from our bountiful lands and sea. Father returned the favor, naturally. But it was not without cost to us. I was but a baby when our home was gassed with poison from clans that come from Iwagakur. But you survived. Madara states the obvious, given her being here. Haruka nods slowly at the corner of his eye. You already know that we have strong chakra. But there is only so much that we can heal with something unrefined as generic healing. When I was old enough to understand, mother and father told me that my chakra was holding my body together, and should the day come that I have to give it to someone else, I would likely perish to keep them alive. I see. Madara nods thoughtfully. It makes sense now, the dedication to feel that she is needed by her people. Her chakra strength is weaker than other females in the clan, but her explanation makes it clear that most of her chakra is being converted into pure life force. In a dream world, this fiery but earnest woman could have her husband and child. But this is not a dream world. Not. Yet. His mind also whirls with questions. Is it possible to sustain the life force of another by using one's own? What part did the preservation and facilitation of life hold in the growth of a shinobi, whose trait is death? You do not have children? Haruka asks, dragging him from his thoughts. I never thought about it. Madara replies honestly. Never once did I even entertain the thought. Most women, even in my own clan were terrified of me anyway. You're not that scary. Madara doesn't reply, and thinks only of how with her persistence, he has fallen under her spell. Madara and Haruka often find excuses to be in the same place at the same time. It is treated with exasperation by the local populace. Two emotionally stunted people not understanding why exactly they enjoy each other's company. He doesn't understand it until Ashina's passing. The man's last words to him are a revelation. Take care of her, Madara. Once red hair is now a stark white. Ashina's croak is weak. You are the best decision I've made a long wheezy breath. For this village. Madara knows that the man is happy to pass peacefully in his sleep. If only Ashina's sons had been afforded that luxury. I will. Madara promises. Haruka's tear-filled eyes find their way to his chest, and he wraps his arms around her. As someone who loves wood. Hashirama's death from mysterious illness marks the beginning of the First Shinobi World War. It is a short war of only a year, but it costs the life of the freshly appointed Naidaim Hokage. Madara laughs at the news, wishing he'd gutted the fool himself. She is shaking fearfully. Not at him, but. I am with child. Haruka is in his arms again. She is afraid of death. Afraid that she will not be the mother she'd dreamed of being. I will find a way. I always do. Uchiha Madara's will is absolute, after all. Haruka is screaming and crying in agony and her body refuses the command to stay alive. Madara is getting desperate. He places his hands over her heart. In an instant, his salt and pepper hair becomes bone white and he appears to age many years. He pushes as much of his life force into her as he can. Studying the changes to his body with the inclusion of Hashirama's power has led him to believe that it's possible to exchange life force. If it can be taken, then it can be given. And give, he does. Uzumaki Kushina comes into the world kicking and screaming, 
to proud and very much alive parents, Uzumaki Izuna and Uzumaki Haruka. Her hair is black as midnight, but Madara is quick to seal away any remnant of Uchiha power in her. No one says a word about his now eerie, ringed purple gaze. Kushina, or his little light, turns three quicker than Madara believed was possible. She slams her chubby hands on the table. Baka Hashirama. Haruka rolls her eyes as Madara grins. His wife sways whilst cooking dinner, and Madara catches her before she can stumble. He moves to place his hand over her heart to impart his life force unto her. Don't. Haruka catches it, looking him in the eyes. You can only give me so much time. She's going to need you, Madara. I don't know how I can do that. Madara sighs, knowing that overt displays of protectiveness from him would immediately paint a target on his daughter's back. From the shadows, love. As you have for a great many years now. Mito spends her last days as peacefully as she can, toiling over the fact that she is submitting another person to become an engine of war. The practice of Jinchuriki defies what Hashirama stood for, but survival of the village trumps idealism. The Second World Shinobi War is on the horizon. Punches can no longer be pulled. Tsunade is an unusually curious girl, always looking for answers. The story Mito is telling her in this moment is what inspired Tsunade to become a medical ninjutsu expert of unparalleled ability. If not for the fact that Senju were bred for war, Mito believed that Tsunade could have been another great mind of the ages. Hashirama refused to allow anyone to come with him to fight Madara. It is easy to romanticize the idea that comrades standing together will overcome any foe, but Madara. Mito gives a weak and weary sigh through cracked, aging lips. Even Toburama refused to go anywhere near that battle until it was over. Probably to pick apart Madara's body like a carrion bird. Mito seemed disgusted by the concept and Toburama's strange propensity for artificially making stronger shinobi, or discovering weakness in those who killed his kin. But still, I went to the battle. The landscape was completely unrecognizable. Shattered pieces of Hashirama's strongest jutsu littered the battlefield. The Kyubi was in a deep trance, as if it were asleep. I had no idea such a vile beast could look peaceful. What happened then? A younger Tsunade asks curiously. Hashirama and Madara were still fighting. After four days, without sleep and without food or water, nothing but the sheer power of their chakra kept them walking. Hashirama was using Senjutsu and yet still Madara matched him blow for blow. They were so absorbed in their fight, I doubt they even noticed I was there. I took my chance and sealed the Kyubi within myself in case Madara figured out how to break Hashirama's hold over it. Mito put a hand over where the seal lie. You were just a baby, our granddaughter who'd been born just one week before. I couldn't find it in me to give you this burden. Mito smiles at her so slightly. I was quite young when I was wed to Hashirama, and your parents were quite young when you were born. Your grandfather saw this as something so immensely beautiful that he was willing to cut down his closest friend, so that others besides the Senju would experience the joy of creating life without fear, to revel at the gift of parenthood instead of detaching in case our children die. But if Ji-sama won, why did he die? Because he didn't win. He tied with Madara. I stumbled back to the fight with my body heavy with chakra that didn't belong to me. Hashirama killed Madara through trickery, but you can't outfox the fox. Madara used all his strength while dying in the cold river to pull his chain blade into Hashirama's back. Tsunade wisely stays silent at her grandmother's tears and shaky voice. There weren't any jutsu that could heal him, back then at least. Only. Delay the inevitable. That scythe that nearly took his arm off and had gone right through his lungs. Toburama tried his best, but in the end Hashirama had not but a few years left. He let Konoha democratically select Toburama as their new leader, and spent his last years with his family and mentoring the new generation. I wish he'd lived long enough to meet Nawaki. He has a similar soul to his grandfather. Mito sniffles, but Tsunade admires how dignified her grandmother still looks. I was too old to seal the Kyubi within myself. Toburama figured it out. The best way to seal this beast is within an Uzumaki, but one whose chakra system hasn't fully grown and developed yet. Any other by Juu and I would have been fine, but this one is an entity in its own class. And now, it eats away at me from the inside, always clawing and scratching to get out. Uzumaki Kushina will be here soon. I've heard she's something of a little monster herself. Maybe this creature will find its home in her. Tsunade chooses not to broach that topic. Nauri san never mentioned that about Madara. She says instead. Of course not. Mito's lips twist in a grimace. Uchiha are all the same. It seems there is still quite a bit of bitterness toward them about the death of her husband. Before becoming the vessel of the Kyubi, 
you must be filled with love. Yeah, yeah. So when do I get the QB? The wicked, power-hungry smile on Kushina's face does not ease Mito's heart. I had hoped that Uzushio would send someone more understanding of this burden. Should have thought about that before demanding something like a replacement human being from your former clan, send you bitch. The elderly Mito is struck by the vitriol of her niece. Haruka sends a letter to her beloved daughter that her father had passed when in truth, he was by her bedside as she left the mortal plane. A grand funeral is held for both he and his wife. Uzumaki Izuna and Uzumaki Haruka, to find their peace in the next life. The death of his wife and use of his daughter by Konoha have reawakened a darkness in him that he had thought buried. Madara takes periodic trips throughout the world, testing his Rinnegan in secrecy. The Ghetto Mazo is proven as a real entity when he summons it from the moon. The strange white organic goblins spawned from the statue are sent to recover any spare Sharingan from the battlefields. While returning from one such trip, he discovers that Uzushio Gakur has been massacred by three of the great nations. There are few survivors. Most Uzumaki war joie that would destroy their bodies before letting them be used by enemies. The Uzumaki were still a small clan and despite their near overwhelming strength, they could still fall to numbers. The bodies of men that he'd taught since they were boys are scorched and unrecognizable skeletons filling the streets of his proud and cultured home. The few survivors flee to every corner of the world, using the tricks he taught them to stay hidden in the shadows. Madara, even with his lack of mobility in his age, calls upon the power of his legendary eyes to slaughter every last scavenger like the vile pigs they are. Izuna-sama. An Uzumaki woman sobs in relief at his presence, a red-haired babe in her arms as her outsider husband supports them both. This cursed and evil world has decimated these beautiful people. I have a favor to ask of you, dear Fuso. Anything. I am too old for these eyes to be of any use to me now. I want your son to bear them for the sake of our clan. Until I walk the earth again to reclaim them. Madara's cunning smile is hidden as the broken Uchiha boy returns to the graveyard hideout. Tell me about your plan. Obito demands, his bloody visage determined. The eye of the moon plan is set into motion once more and the name Uchiha Madara is passed down to someone young and capable. Black Zetsu is spawned from his will, but only given the absolute critical memories required for the plan to succeed. A sentient clone of himself that could gain self-awareness at any point with his memories would be very bad for Kushina's ongoing existence. He uses his scavenged Sharingan and brings himself back to live out his final days in observation of his daughter. Or at least he had hoped. Kushina's death is his own fault. He caused this. He caused the death of his own daughter to chase a dream instead of fixing reality. He may very well have doomed the world. There is only one hope left. How about we make a deal? If you can master this new exercise before the day is up, I'll come back and teach you a ninjutsu tomorrow. Naruto visibly shakes in excitement. Chapter 12, Misfortune and Goodbyes Two figures clad in black and red cloaks look upon Kanahagakor from under their straw hats. Feeling homesick? The larger of the two asks with a distinct grin. Red eyes savor the view of their owner's home. Not at all. They slowly make their way through the village. Suspicious glances are a bounty. Most likely the result of having been attacked not six months ago by enemy nations. For two people to stand out as much as they are right now would be idiotic, least of all for people who are meant to be gathering information in enemy territory. But the Akatsuki is broadcasting a message to the people that they interact with in any capacity. Those who fight them, those who attempt to interrogate, and those who see from the sidelines what they're up to know to spread word of unnaturally powerful shinobi wearing black cloaks decorated with red clouds. We are here. We are strong. Do not defy us. It is a simple message to a world governed by power. Together, the Akatsuki can topple nations. If people like Uchiha Itachi and Hoshigaki Kisame are the ones taking orders, then what does that say of the monsters with the strength to control them? This organization works in the light and dark simultaneously. The goal is the capture and containment of the Baijuu, but for what purpose Itachi knows not. Akatsuki has been established as a mercenary faction, operating as hired muscle for esteemed and rich clients in secrecy. Some consist of daimyo, others being the greater shinobi villages. Guaranteed success is hiring the Akatsuki, and therein lies the beauty of the manipulation. All they are to the world are mercenaries, hiding their true purpose while gathering intel on the whereabouts of their true goals. This secrecy is a strength of the Akatsuki, but Madara is a fool if he thinks Itachi won't exploit this. Once they are inevitably confronted, Itachi will drop the hints about scouting for Jinchuriki and Baijuu. Capturing multiple Jinchuriki and Baijuu and containing them long enough to seal them one by one is simply not possible, 
not even for the strongest shinobi in the world. Senju Hashirama may have been able to accomplish such a feat, but if Uchiha Madara himself and a man with a legendary Rinnegan still need days, maybe weeks at a time to seal the Baijuu into the ghetto vessel, then it speaks quite clearly that the process is arduously difficult and requires a large number of powerful shinobi to assist them. Itachi had questioned why Madara didn't just capture them in one fell swoop and keep them contained on his own. My battle with Hashirama left me broken and a shadow of my former ability. The masked man speaks factually and clinically. The sealing will require a great deal of time. Only an incredibly powerful wielder of the Rinnegan or the Makutan can control that many by Juu and Jinchuriki at once, and that time invites the nations that those beasts belong to stop our plans in motion. We do not know where all of the beasts are, nor have we sown enough chaos to make it easier to capture them. The Baijuu must be sealed in order to prevent the vessel from being damaged. Another weakness of the Ghetto Mazo that Madara confirmed carelessly. The Baijuu must be sealed in order. And that is part of why he and Kisame had been sent to Konoha, to confirm who the Nibi and Kyubi Jinchuriki are. Word spreading throughout the nation says that Konoha is in control of the Nibi once more, but the Jinchuriki is unknown. Madara suspects that the Kyubi is sealed in the son of Uzumaki Kushina and Namikaze Minato, and that the cover was that it had been sent away by Kushina-sama's powerful Fuenjutsu. It is refreshingly naive that you think your Yondaime defeated me. Madara's voice conveys a smile, even if it is hidden. He may have injured me and caused me to flee to recover, and I suppose that is a testament to his ability. But who walked away from that battle alive, Itachi-kun? The masked man left the battle early, so even he doesn't know where the Kyubi is but still. Not Namikaze Naruto. Not Uzumaki Naruto. Uchiha Naruto. How could anyone have missed this? How could Madara attack his own daughter? Although thinking about it, Madara also slaughtered Uchiha children in their sleep a few years prior. That alone speaks of his depravity. Of his own depravity. That he would volunteer to cut down his mother and father. How about some sweet buns, Itachi? Kisame asks as they near a shop, dragging him from his thoughts. Itachi says nothing but enters the quaint little restaurant, the low flaps dragging on his hat. Although he'd like a hearty meal for a change, stores like this are full of people mingling and talking about happenings in their vicinity. A waitress approaches them with a pen and pad in hand, held up above a heavily pregnant belly. May I get you anything, gentlemen? The waitress gives them a practiced smile. Kisame spouts off an order on both of their behalves, knowing that Itachi isn't fussy. He throws in some tea for good measure. Your village seems to be in high spirits, young lady. Kisame puts on his best friendly voice. We were worried when we heard that Konoha had been attacked. We didn't think outsiders would be allowed in at all. Ignoring the fact that they hadn't just been let in. They snuck in like rats in the walls. It was a terrible day, she sighs sadly. Many lost their lives but our shinobi are the strongest in the world. Tsunade-sama is working very hard to make sure everything gets back to normal. We've had some bad luck over the last couple of decades. Oh, that's right. A terrible incident with the QB happened right? Kisame keeps it up. For such a brutish man, Itachi had never suspected he could be so sly. Yes, apparently the QB was sealed in a woman before that day, and when it came time for her to give birth, it escaped and tore up our village. I was scared for my life, but apparently Yondaime-sama tried to seal it in his son. Tried? Was it too strong? More like Yondame-sama's wife was too strong. She didn't like what her husband was going to do so she kind of. Hoofed it away? Like a shinobi trick. It hasn't come back to haunt us so I guess whatever she did worked. That's a relief, Kisame sighs with a fake, unconcerned shrug. At least I know I'm not gonna be eaten by some giant fox monster today. Himari. Have the gentleman ordered? A voice from behind the bakery register calls out. Himari rolls her eyes in exasperation. Yes dear. They were just asking about the recent happenings in the village. She turns to them both sheepishly. I'm sorry, I'll get your order ready right away. Kisame gives her a dismissive wave. Not a problem my dear, thank you. The two Akatsuki share a discreet nod, knowing that nothing of actual value was gained from that conversation. It could still be a ploy, the QB may still be sealed in Uchiha Naruto but unless they get close to him, they won't be able to tell from his chakra if he's a Jinchuriki or not. Itachi and Kisame sit and eat patiently, silently hoping that the woman will come back with some more recent updates from the village. Sasuke makes his way to see Yuido and Himari before going home. Jiraiya had been instructing him to never train in the use of the Nibi's chakra unless supervised by him, Naruto, 
were the strange Anbu that could apparently suppress Baiju Chakra with the rare Makutan Keke Genkai. Naruto had been badgering him to let him know whenever Tenzo was watching him, most likely to observe the Makutan in action to unwittingly help him train in it. Sasuke is the only one that knows what Naruto is up to, seeing as he's the only one that knows that Naruto is trying to see if he can build a Makutan Chakra nature using remnants of what is inside of him already. He thinks that Karen might suspect what's going on, although it could just be passed off as another of Naruto's eccentricities that he's suddenly bringing home pots with soil and bulk sachets of plant seeds. He walks under the flaps of the bakery to let his. Well, he doesn't know what to call them yet. But he trusts them, and maybe even loves them a little bit. Yuido, Himari. I'm home. He pretends not to notice the two strangely dressed, silent customers at their own table for two. Sasuke. Himari waddles over to him immediately and snags him in a hug. Out of the corner of his eye, he sees the shorter one stiffen ever so slightly. How was training? Come, sit down. It was fine. Naruto thinks that my training is going by pretty quick because I'm compatible with Nibi. And besides, he made the seal so I guess he knows what he's talking about. He hears a rattle and his eyes are drawn to the mysterious duo in the bakery. He sees a blue hand holding a wobbly cup of tea, under a pale and shaky hand that dropped it. Himari seems not to notice it with civilian senses. I suppose. Himari is ever fretful, not understanding shinobi techniques and culture but always puts first what she can conceivably understand, and that is the safety of those she considers her own. And besides, putting up with the nine lives and pussy jokes is harder than the training. Nibi is nicer than Naruto is. Himari narrows her eyes when she hears Yuido cough to hide a laugh. Her head cranes around mechanically and Yuido hides his grin quickly. Sasuke-kun, those men. Sasuke's eyes return to the cloaked strangers, only to find that they aren't there at all. There's a small wad of cash to pay for their meal on the table. Strange folk. Yuido comments idly. Get help. Now. Naruto grins wickedly. Karen is unimpressed. That's it? In a little pot is a bonsai about the size of her pinky finger. I grew this today. Naruto's Sharingan gleams in pure excitement. It's tiny. Karen shoots him down or tries to. It's progress. Naruto jumps to his feet. Can't you see? I have the Makutan. Onii Chan grew a plant. The only person whose opinion matters leaps to his defense. Naruto smirks. Damn right I did. Naruto turns to face his adorable, sweet baby sister. Only to see Kakashi and Shizun standing behind her, gawping. There's an uncomfortable pause while Naruto thinks of some bullshit to wheedle his way out of admitting that he has the Makutan. Minako ignores this and inspects her Onii chan's plant. I actually bought it like that. Naruto tries ineffectually. Kakashi's deadpan expression is outlined on his worn mask. I saw you grow it. Just now. And you said that you have the Makutan. You were all under my genjutsu from the moment you set your eyes on me. No we aren't. I also heard your careless language in front of my daughter. Shizun gives an equally monotone response. Naruto's eyes narrow. Name your price. Babysitting duty. Two months. Done. Loud, rushed knocking on the door interrupts their little playful spat. One of Naruto's cage bunshine that had been hiding in another room, studying medical ninjutsu, goes to answer it. I still think breathing fire and making a huge skeleton monster is cooler than growing weeds. Karen provides her unfiltered opinion. What if I grew you some flowers? Naruto asks with what he hopes is a convincing, innocent smile. All right. Show me. Kakashi feels like what he's seeing is an eerie recreation of another time. A younger Kakashi watches his recent mentor confront the brutal redhead from Uzu. I've mastered a jutsu that will be instrumental in defeating you. Minato-sensei looks increasingly crazy as each day passes. Kushina-san is unimpressed. Show me. A kunai whizzes past her head at a speed that little Kakashi couldn't even comprehend. Sensei suddenly appears behind her, sweeping her up in a bridal carry. She looks surprised. Her mouth is hanging open ever so slightly, with the tiniest tinge of pink on her cheeks. Before she clobbers him in what outsiders would call a deathmatch. To the people that know them. It's courting. Kakashi snaps out of the memory and observes Naruto. He watches as Naruto places his hands together in a tight cup shape with his fingers pointed forward. Naruto takes a deep breath, looking unusually calm and at peace. His Sharingan rove over everyone in the room, particularly at Karen and Minako. Life. Naruto whispers to himself, 
finding some meaning in the single word to drive his spiritual chakra forward. Nothing happens at first. But then they watch as tiny roots form between the gaps in his hands and inordinately larger, green stems with buds on the ends sprout at the top. The buds begin to bloom, and Kakashi will admit that he finds himself a little struck to be the witness of something delicately beautiful coming from such a violent person. But even when creating life, death is ever present in Naruto's heart and mind. They seem to be balanced. Never was there an Uchiha that could do something like this. Black Roses. The symbolism is not lost on him. Karen doesn't seem to understand it, but this time she's actually impressed with the romantic gift and takes them from his giving hands with a stunning smile. Naruto is delightfully embarrassed. They're so stupid and oblivious. Shizun sighs fondly. Yep. Kakashi smiles. Naruto. Sasuke barges in from the door after apparently being roadblocked by Naruto's clone, which dispels. Kakashi too. Kakashi and Naruto both straighten at Sasuke's serious tone. The Nibi told me that these two foreign shinobi are really powerful. They're skulking around the village right now, we need to find them. Powerful foreign shinobi seems to be an ongoing issue with Konoha as a present. She says that one of them has as much chakra as you do, Naruto. That can't be right. Kakashi is not inexperienced with the unexpected, but Naruto has more chakra than anyone in Konoha. Naruto stands up with crimson eyes glimmering ominously. Maybe we should investigate. Itachi takes control of the administrator girl using a Sharingan. He forces her to use the intercom to speak directly with Tsunade. Tsunade-sama, Uchiha Itachi is here to see you. She speaks as if it's an everyday occurrence. Guard the door. I'll get information about the Jinchuriki myself. Itachi orders Kisame. Hey hey, you're pretty confident Itachi-san. Kisame chuckles. His rage is simmering. He can feel it in his eyes. Itachi doesn't let it show on his outside persona, and perhaps he's allowing his emotions to control him like so many in his clan before him. Sasuke is the Jinchuriki of the Nibi. He opens the door, coming face to face with Tsunade and her elderly advisors. There is clear and blatant fear on the faces of the advisors, and Tsunade is tense, knowing that if it truly came to it then she would not be able to defeat him alone. And then he slams the door shut behind him. Why is my brother a Jinchuriki? The terse demand that is hardly a question spurs Tsunade to provide a quick response. Sasuke willingly became the Jinchuriki after the Nibi was used to assault Konoha. Tsunade answers, and there is something very careful about her words that Itachi does not agree with. Do you understand how much this compromises my mission? Itachi narrows his burning eyes. I will do anything to protect him, but even I cannot protect him from the Akatsuki leaders. Both of which are stronger than I. At which point did you think it would be acceptable to make my brother a Jinchuriki when the most powerful criminal organization in history is hunting the Baiju? Tsunade's hands clenched tighter together. It was not by choice. Sasuke was the only person in the vicinity that could safely contain it during the invasion. The person that sealed it couldn't seal it in themselves so they took the next best option, which Sasuke volunteered to do. Regardless of your love for your brother, Konoha has not stopped moving forward in time since you left. The life of a shinobi is tumultuous, you know this better than anyone. Itachi takes note of the deliberate way she doesn't include the sealer's gender, but it matters little given what he learned at the bakery earlier. Uchiha Naruto Perhaps I should have a word with him. Her eyes narrow. You'll regret that wish. There is a bright flash of blue light outside the Hokaye's office window. A massive construct with glowing yellow eyes moves its arm and a punch is rapidly approaching the glass panes, making the light blue glow unbearable to look at. Kisame bursts through the door. Itachi-san. Itachi morphs his Sharingan into their Mangekyu state and yellow chakra rushes up around him. Tsunade grabs her two advisors by their robes and leaps out one of the windows, smashing her head through the glass without injury. There is only a second before collision. Naruto, Sasuke and Kakashi leap at incredible speed across the rooftops to the location of the powerful shinobi. The Nibi points Sasuke in the general direction, leading Naruto to sense more precisely where they are. The Hokage Tower, Naruto speaks aloud over the rushing wind. Nibi is right, one of them has a suit and affinity with enormous chakra the other. He cuts himself off with a clenched jaw. Naruto? Kakashi's tone is short and clipped, wanting to know about the other intruder. The other one is an Uchiha with a Mangekyu Sharingan. Sasuke falters, Sharingan whirling into life in response to negative emotions. Itachi. He breathes. They had been that close to his family? Both of you get close to me. 
Naruto orders, not giving Sasuke any time to think. His eyes transform into their Mangekyu state. Susano. They quickly become nestled in the stomach of the imperfect Susano. It tramples though the streets as everyone leaps out of the way. Shinobi quickly fall in line and follow Naruto's creation, knowing that this is too serious not to drop everything. Naruto makes his approach, sensing the precise location of his target in Tsunade's office and knows he needs to make a decisive move to protect the Hokage. The fist of his Susano launches through the windows and collides with something that doesn't budge an inch. His eyes widen. What in the hell could stop his Susano? Naruto focuses his Sharingan, seeing the bright yellow chakra blocking his punch with a massive shield. I see. He mutters aloud. Itachi's Susano ability must stop all frontal damage. He wonders how much it can withstand before breaking. The two rogue nin make several synchronized leaps to the Hokage mountain, running east on it to make a quick escape. Yasaka no Magadama. Naruto summons three Magadama in each palm of his Susano, sending them flying erratically at each side of Itachi to prevent all of them from being blocked. Sasuke's clear eye changed to the Nibis, creating his own jutsu with its chakra. Katan, Kasha Hosenka. Kasha Phoenix Sage Fire, Blue, almost decorative flames flurry out of the Susano in a combined assault. The blue shark man weaves his way through several signs before spitting out a veritable tsunami. Sutan, Dibakus Wishoha. Great exploding water colliding wave, the colossal tidal wave absorbs all of the force from Naruto's Magadama, stopping them in the waterfall that's now tipping into the village. Sasuke's fireballs fizzle out despite the Baijuu chakra. With the villagers now at risk to the rushing waters, Naruto is forced to abandon his pursuit of the criminals and join the efforts to contain the water. The water descends rapidly over the academy, and Naruto wills his Susano to drop Kakashi and Sasuke down. He rushes and stands over the academy and hears the panic screaming from the children. About a dozen of the shinobi that followed him to the Hokage Tower all slam their hands on the Hokage Mountain in unison. Doten, Doryuki. Earth-style wall. Walls sprout out of the mountain, forming a bowl of earth over the academy and the water crashes into it. Naruto knows that it won't hold long enough to save the students and teachers and makes his Susano squat under the bowl, holding it up with its back and arms. The pressure of the lake and stone strains him as he struggles to maintain form. The knees of his Susano buckle. He really only has one option left. Naruto has never tried before, but lives are on the line. Tsunade barks orders at the Doton Shinobi, telling them to make an aqueduct as soon as possible. She doesn't know how long Naruto can hold up a lake on his own so she seeks to drain the water to the border of the village and evacuate the academy and surrounding area. She watches as Naruto falters under the strain before a massive upswing of chakra hits the senses of every sensor type in the entire village. The light blue Susano glows even brighter. Plates move along its skin as it grows larger and larger. A hood shaped like a dragon swallows the head of the construct and transforms it into something distinctly different to before, menacing gold chakra in its fiery mouth under a long demonic nose. The bald being grows swaying hair with twin locks on either side clasped by bands. And then a pair of majestic wings unfurl, spreading wide and holding up the lake on their own. Naruto Susano settles into a kneel and is now unfazed by the immense weight on its back. In the jewel on its forehead, Naruto resides patiently. At first, then he becomes less enthused. If you don't mind, I have places to be fools. Get this damn lake off of me. A day passes from the utter chaos of another attack on Konoha. Naruto is present in the meeting room of the Hokage Tower while repairs are made to Tsunade's office. Jiraiya has returned after mingling with some of his sources one town over to see if Itachi and Kisame had been present at all. Kakashi, Sasuke, the Shinobi Council and Elder Advisors are all congregated in the same place. The god I'm brings everyone's attention to her. The Akatsuki is our discussion point today. We have managed to confirm that this criminal organization almost exclusively consists of S-rank shinobi, and that their goal is the capture of Jinchuriki and Baijuu. The two confirmed members are Hoshigaki Kisame, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, and Uchiha Itachi from our own village. We don't have an accurate time frame for when they actually start hunting the Baijuu. Shikaku speaks up, giving his opinion on the situation. All we know is that this was a scouting mission to confirm who the Jinchuriki of the Nibi is, and if we had any other Jinchuriki in our possession. Sasuke nearly sneers at the word possession. Naruto openly gives his own statement. We can no longer retaliate against Kumagakura and Orochimaru. The chaos of war will make it far easier for the Akatsuki to mobilize and capture the Jinchuriki. 
Current grudges need to be settled unless it provides a pathway to intel about the members of this organization. The more Baiju they capture, the more powerful they become. Theoretically. Sasuke is no longer safe in Konoha. Jiraiya states. He needs to be taken away in case more members of the Akatsuki come to capture him. He'll need to be on the move until we get an estimation of when they'll start their operation. Absolutely not. Koharu objects. Sasuke must stay in Konoha where he has the support of the village to defend him. Homura continues. Keeping Sasuke here is inviting more chaos. The ease at which they nearly killed the academy students is proof of that alone. If they bring even more members with destructive abilities, there won't be any shinobi that can defend him, least of all against Itachi who may be stronger than our Hokage. Naruto refutes stoically. The passphrase to the detection barrier around Konoha will also need to be updated. Tsunade sighs, rubbing her forehead before looking at Sasuke. What do you think of this? Sasuke doesn't want to leave. He doesn't want to go right before his honorary family has their first child but he doesn't want them to be used against him if he stays. I. Sasuke trails, unsure of what to say. I'll take him. Jiraiya offers. I can keep an eye on the seal and train him in the use of the Nibis chakra on the road while we gather information about the Akatsuki. Do you agree with this, Sasuke? Tsunade asks tiredly. There's a brief pause before his hesitant response. Yes. I agree. Jiraiya puts a hand on his shoulder. Come on kid. Say goodbye to everyone because we need to go as soon as possible. The sage ruffles Naruto's hair. Good luck kiddo, I'll see you when I see you. You too, old man. Naruto turns to Sasuke, putting out his arm. Sasuke clasps him by the forearm, looking disappointed at the result of this meeting. I'll see you, Naruto. Yeah Sasuke. I wish things hadn't turned out like this. You were starting to become bearable. Likeable even. Sasuke smiles wryly. I wish I could say that you're bearable. He says, to which Naruto smirks. I hope you kick yourself in the balls on the way out the village. Naruto bids him farewell. Kakashi gets his word in before they go. I'm proud of you Sasuke, more than you realize. I hope your journey is safe. Thanks, Kakashi-sensei. Sasuke grabs him by the arm as well, not knowing how to state just how important Kakashi has been to him over the past year. Sasuke and Jiraiya leave, and it's back to business in the meeting room. I'm going to request time away from the village as well. Naruto begins. My destructive power cannot be practiced or refined here. I need space to prevent anyone from being at risk. Because of your Susano? Tsunade cuts in before her advisors can shoot it down. That, but also because of this. Naruto weaves a snake seal. There is only a brief pause before a tiny tree with black leaves grows on the end of the round meeting desk. Gasps echo in the hall. Tsunade gapes, and not one person mentions her emotional visage. Sasuke's throat is tight when he visits Imari and Yuido. Sasuke? Himari asks softly. I've come to say goodbye. His voice gets hoarse. They're a group of powerful criminals who want the Nibi inside of me, and I need to leave the village for a while to keep everyone safe. Oh honey. He breaks down against his will. Sasuke spends the last of his time in Konoha with his family. Karen. We're going on vacation. Sweet. Let me pack my stuff. I need to say goodbye to my baby sister anyway. This is it, huh? Sakura tears up. Team 7 is assembled at the main gate of Konoha. Naruto is cuddling Minako but when she proves inconsolable, he manages to pass her back to her glistening-eyed mother. Don't worry Sakura. Naruto gives her that ever cocky smile. We'll be together again. This is just the life of a shinobi in our age. We do what we have to. I know. She wraps her arms around her beloved teammates. You two better not forget about me. Never, Sakura. Naruto and Sasuke speak in unison. See ya, Sakura. Karen bids her goodbye as well. Bye Karen, take care of this reckless dummy for me will you? Naruto rolls his eyes as Karen nods solemnly. They all turn and leave. Naruto and Karen split at the road, and give one last wave to Sasuke and Jiraiya. A week passes and Naruto uses the fist of his Susano to smash through an inconspicuous area in a vast field with tall grass. He and Karen drop down into a small stone lair. Naruto pushes open the crypt in the middle of the room and takes an object out of it. Uchiha Madara's gun by blasts the dust out of the tomb. Alright everyone, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it please consider leaving a like and subscribe.
Also I have already posted the entire story over on Patreon if anyone is interested in that. Anyways, until next time, peace.